Good evening and welcome to the Richmond Public Schools School Board meeting. I now call this meeting to order. It is Monday, March 15, 2021. We'll now have our roll call. Ms. Madam, Madam Chair, before the roll call, may I read the electronic meeting statement? Yes, please do, thank you. This meeting is being held as an electronic meeting pursuant to and in compliance with Richmond City Council's Ordinance 2020-093, adopted April 9, 2020, and extended by Ordinance Number 2020-183, adopted August 20, 2020, and by Ordinance Number 2020-232, adopted December 14, 2020, and the School Board's resolution approved on April 20, 2020. Simultaneous translation is being provided tonight in Spanish via Zoom, and, at the, and the meeting notice contained information on how individuals needing translation services could obtain the service. The meeting notice also stated that the meeting would be a virtual meeting and would be live streamed for the public on the school division's Facebook page, and the link was provided. The meeting notice indicated that the board would not receive public comments in person. However, public comments could be submitted to the school board clerk and the email address for comments was provided. The agenda of the meeting was posted to board docs. After roll call, we will state how many board members are participating at the time of roll call. Mrs. Doerr? Ms. White? Present. Ms. Gibson? Here. Mr. Young? Present. Ms. Rizzi? Here. Dr. Harris Muhammad? Present. Ms. Burke? Here. Ms. Page? Here. Ms. Jones. Here. Yeah. Madam Chair, you have eight members participating at this time. Thank you very much. And Ms. Lilly, thank you so very much for filling in while our interim clerk is, is out. We really appreciate that. And you've been most supportive and cooperative. So thank you so much. You're welcome. All right. We're now ready to move to 1.02, adoption of the agenda. Mr. Young, I see Four persons in the chat. Um, I don't know who the first one was. Um, yes, ma'am. Yes, Madam Chair. Uh, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, Miss Page and Dr. Harris Muhammad. Miss Page was first. I think we were typing at the same time, but she got hers in first. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Mrs. Page. Yes. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Um, board members. After being in constant contact with um, family members and our stakeholders, I recommend that we allow the administration two additional weeks to receive additional feedback and data before we make this important decision about the school year calendar 2021-22. So would you make a motion please to that? Yes. So my motion is I move to defer action item 5.01 school year 2021-22 calendar to a special meeting on Monday 329 at 6 p.m. Thank you, Mrs. Page. Is there a second? A second. Ooh. And I would love it if you all continue to use the chat. And yes, I think we have Ms. Jones is in the. Um... Yes, ma'am. That, that uh, Madam Chair, correct. My fault for not weighing in uh, more quickly. Uh, it's okay. Harris Muhammad. All right, Ms. Jones, and then Harris Muhammad. Is that what you said, or Ms. Harris Muhammad, Dr. Harris Muhammad first? Uh, Ms. Ms. Jones, and then Dr. Harris Muhammad. Uh, both okay. of them. Uh, motion just second. Thank you so much. Uh, Ms. Jones, would you state your second, please? Second. Thank you. It's been moved and properly second that we defer the discussion tonight for the 2021-22 school year calendar to Monday, the fifth Monday of the month on March the 29th at 6 p.m. Is there any discussion? Madam Chair. Yeah? Uh, Ms. Yes. Ms. Gibson. Ms. who? Gibson. All right, Ms. Gibson, the floor is yours. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I appreciate the additional time. I would like to request that uh, we revise the item as a uh, currently identified as an action item and continue to have the discussion as a, dis a discussion item. The, the public is waiting to hear some input from us, certainly as we've been telling them that the vote is today. Um, and so I, I do think it's important that we continue this discussion this evening. And so, um, so my request is that, um, well, a couple of things, uh, and. Ms. Gibson, you're muted. We can't hear you. My goodness. After you said a couple of things, we lost you. Okay. Um, so did you not hear any of it? We heard the first part, then you said a couple of things. So after that, we didn't hear anything. Oh, bizarre. Um, okay, so essentially, I'm, my point is, is that I think that the public is awaiting um, some type of, of discussion from us this evening. There were those community conversations that, that were held last week. Um, and I think it's critical that um, whether or not there is a vote this evening, that, that we do have a discussion. This is um, an important thing that we continue to, um, to deliberate on. And so my request is that, um, uh, that we revise the item to be a discussion item regarding the 21-22 calendar. And then I also would like to see that we move up the uh, reopening plan to, uh, to be the, the first discussion item um, on, on our agenda this evening and then revise the, the calendar to being a, um, a discussion item. I think it would be, uh, you know, like I said, the, the, the public is, is anticipating a vote. And so to, uh, to not have any discussion at all, I, I, think, um, I, I think would be a, a big mistake this evening. Thank you. All right, so Ms. Gibson, if I'm, I'm understanding correctly, pretty much either you would amend the amount, excuse me, amend the motion, or we will go ahead and receive Mrs. Page's motion. Then you can state yours to uh, make those changes as well. Is right. that correct, Ms. Lilly? Yes, I mean, are you amending Ms. Page's motion was simply to defer item 5.01? Yeah, so I will amend, I will, um, uh, uh, I seek to amend the motion to um, instead uh, revise item 5.01 to be a discussion item and to move up the spring 2021 reopening plan item um, as our first, as our first item. All right, those are two different, two things as well. So, so you've, you've amended the, you've made a motion to amend the motion and I see Dr. Harris Muhammad has responded. Would you please speak? Yes, sir. Can y'all hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. I second, yes. All right, so Mrs. Page's motion has been amended. We didn't say anything about the 29. So technically, Ms. Lilly, that's, that's two totally different motions. Ms. Gibson? So, so first we need to vote on, she amended the motion, but amended the motion did not, not unless Mrs. Gibson restates the motion to include the 29th, or either we just vote on that one first, then come back, because that's two different, two different. You're not, you are in favor from what I'm hearing, Ms. Gibson, the 29th, is not the concern. The concern is to put something on the agenda tonight to discuss it, correct? I, I well, I guess my motion would then be to, to redact the specific date in terms of the follow-up discussion from the motion so that, um, so my motion is to um, revise uh, Ms. Page's motion to, um, uh, to have a discussion item specific to the 2021 calendar, um, uh, agree that we defer the vote um, and to move up reopening to the first item in our discussion this evening. Thank you. All right, so we're clear now on that. And it was seconded by Dr. Harris Muhammad. Is there any discussion? Dr. Harris Muhammad? Yes, ma'am. Now I have a question. I may withdraw my second because there wasn't a timeline in the new motion. And so Ms. Gibson, are you open to adding a timeline to your, I think it's, important for us to have a date. I, I would like to do that and you know, I think we can discuss, I think that's worth discussing, right? Um, and so I think that, that the timeline can be discussed during, our, uh, during the discussion. The discussion. Mm -hmm. Yes. Ms. Lilly? 
Yes, so Ms. Gibson, your amendment, the motion as it stood was to defer item 5.01 to a special meeting on 329 at six o'clock PM. And your revision seeks to um, add 501 or revise 501 as a, as a um, discussion point tonight, but the rest of the motion would be intact that Ms. Page it wasn't, you know, her, the rest of her motion would be still intact to have the meeting on the special meeting on the 29th. Is that correct? Was that the intent, Ms. Gibson? I've just spoken. I, I, there, there's been a lot of back and forth on this, and I, I think I've provided clarity. So um, my, my suggestion is that we revise the motion so that we, instead of uh, uh, removing it entirely from discussion this evening, that we have it just as a discussion item, and that um, and that is in this agenda. We're talking about the agenda right now. So, in my opinion, talking about the date of a future meeting is not specific to the agenda. So, I I think that the discussion about the timing um, to me is a whole other can of beans. I think that that should be part of the discussion item that I am seeking to have this evening. We're working off of the motion that's on the floor. And right. so we have to deal with the motion that's on the floor, which included the date. And that was, Ms. I'm sorry, Young. Madam Chair. Um, Mr. I've, Young, is Ms. Page next or is it someone I see 10? It's uh, uh, Dr. Harris Muhammad um, is actually first, uh, but I believe she, I believe she addressed the group, but I'll let Dr. Harris Muhammad speak to if she's already, and then Ms. Page. I did. Thank you, Mr. Young. I did. All right, Ms. Page. Yes, because my um, my name has been in the chat for a minute, but um, just as Ms. Lily stated, um, I think we need to address the motion that's on the table as it stands. Ms. Lily. So at this point, uh, Ms. Gibson and Ms. Uh, Dr. Harris Muhammad motion to amend as Ms. Gibson has suggested is on the floor. So the board, the question before the board at this point in time is whether or not to amend Ms., the original motion as Ms. Gibson has, mo has motion to amend. All right, so the original motion by Ms. Page is to defer until um, two weeks from now on March 29th. Ms. Gibson's amendment is to move um, the reopening plan up to 5.01 and to change the calendar to discussion rather than board action. So we're now ready to vote. Are we, are, any more questions, any more discussion? Mr. Young? Madam Chair, I actually have a question. I just want to, <laughs> at the risk of belaboring uh, this point, I just wanted to confirm uh, the, uh, the motion uh, to amend is silent on the, uh, is silent on the subject of March 29. Is that correct? Miss Lilly, doesn't that still stand? Because what Miss Gibson has done is basically if if the, the um, amending the motion takes away terms, language from the original motion and adds oh, others, okay. right? So I'm not sure Miss Gibson hasn't does not wish to um, I guess, um, explain any further. So Ms. Gibson's item really is um, to change the, I'm, I'm not certain actually how, how the original motion is being, is, is seeking, is being, how she's seeking to amend the original motion other than to um, change the 501 to a discussion item. Okay, so right now it's our responsibility, choice of another word, um, to vote on the amended motion. But the amended motion does not have the date of March 29th. Correct, Ms. Gibson? She said That's that would correct. be a part of the discussion. That All right, are we ready to vote? Mr. Young, we have anyone else? Uh, Ms. Gibson? Um, yeah, actually, I believe uh, Ms. White is in the chat before before I am. Good evening, Mrs. Dewar. Please add Ms. Dewar um, is now present. Good evening. Thank you. Ms. White? 
Uh, good evening, Madam President. I just want to clarify to see what are we actually voting on? I'm seeing two things going back and forth. So are we voting on what Ms. Gibson said minus the actual date? Or are we uh, voting on Mrs. Page? What are we voting on at this moment? At this moment, Ms. Lilly, correct me if I need to be corrected. My understanding is that we're voting on Mrs. Gibson's um, Suggestion, not suggestions, her motion to without a, without without a date. date. Yes. You're voting to amend the original motion. And okay. so this is a vote on whether or not you want to, uh, excuse me, amend the original motion, which if it passes, then you would have to vote on the original motion as amended. And okay. so right now it's do you want to change the original motion? And as Mrs. Gibson decided, got it. Dated. Excellent. Who was next, Mr. Young? Ms. Gibson. All right, Ms. Gibson, the floor is yours. Yes. So just to, to clarify, I mean, I think that the timing for the meeting um, or, you know, adding a meeting or, or, you know, is worth having a conversation. Um, you know, I personally think that we might benefit from, from more time. Um, I, I agree with uh, moving the, the date of our, of our vote. And so, um, so in, in my, you know, I'm, my hope is that we have the discussion this evening so that we have the space to have a conversation about process and, and timing. Thank you, Ms. Gibson. All right, let's get ready to vote. Mrs. Page, would you repeat your, your um, motion, please? And so then we'll have Ms. Gibson to do hers as well. Thank you. Okay, so my motion was to defer the action item 5.0 one school year 2021-22 calendar to a special meeting on Monday 3-29 at 6 p.m. And it would give us two additional weeks to receive more feedback from parents as well as data before we make this important decision. Thank you. And that motion was seconded by uh, Mrs. Nicole Jones. And Ms. Gibson, would you restate your amendment? So my amendment is, is to revise that motion so that the, um, the, the rather than eliminating the 21-22 uh, calendar item from the agenda, we revise that to be a discussion item rather than an action item. And that, um, uh, and that we uh, determine the date for subsequent meetings during that discussion. Um, and that we move up the spring 2021 reopening plan item to be our first item on the agenda after public information. Thank you. And that was seconded by Dr. Harris Muhammad. Correct. All right. Excuse me. I, I, I just said yes, ma'am. Correct. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Um, let's move forward. We're ready to vote, Mr. Young. Uh, I hope More so. comments? <laughs> All right, Ms. Lilly, would you be so kind? Thank you again so much. This is on the amendment as motioned by Ms. Gibson, seconded by Dr. Harris Muhammad, Ms. Doerr. Yes. Ms. White. Yes. Ms. Gibson. Yes. Mr. Young. Aye. Ms. Rizzi. Yes. Dr. Harris Muhammad. Yes. Ms. Burke. Yes. Ms. Page. No. Ms. Jones. Yes. I'm sorry, Ms. Jones. Yes. Okay. All right, it's been moved, properly second, seconded, and that we would make that change on our agenda. That let's get those numbers straight now. That 5.01 will be moved to a discussion item, which is which would be added to board business. The administration. Is that correct? I believe board actions. Would that not be board business? Excuse me. Uh, yes. Administration business. I'm sorry. That would be administration business. So that would be what number is that? Six point something. Um, board action. The administration items are at six. Six point something, yes. Yeah. So that'll be six point um, zero four. 
6.04 would be the discussion on the calendar for 21-22 discussion only. And now we're going to move up from that spot the year round. Oh, but that would fall under, we're not making any, um, that's not an action item, that's an update. May I, Ms. Ma Madam Chair, may I? Please. Um, based on the motion, um, and, and we do have to vote on the original motion as amended to adopt okay. the agenda, but if that goes through, item that is, the item that is currently 6.01, receive an update on spring 2021 reopening, Yes, would fall under public information and we will just rename it and re, re, we would renumber it something else. Is that the item, Ms. Gibson, that you were, okay. So um, we will call that something else, okay? As far as the numbering, all right? Okay, like that, that's fine. But, you know, you don't have to get wedded in the numbers. And then Thank you. we'll reorder um, section six to add the, the discussion of the school calendar for 21, 22 after the update on the special education advisory committee. Exactly, and that'll be 6.04. Yes, ma'am. Excellent, thank you, thank you so much. All right, now, can we vote on the adoption of the agenda with the changes that were just made? Are we ready for that? May I get a motion please to adopt that agenda as we've just decided, can someone be so, um, Time before we move forward, we do have a question. Ms. Page? Yes, Madam Chair. So do we still need to vote on the motion that I stated to have a special meeting on 329? From what I understand, Ms. Lily, correct me, that when we have our discussion, that will come up then, or shall we do that? That's right, because that's not an agenda item. May I? Is that correct? So the action that was just, the item that was just voted on amended the original motion that was on the floor. Right. right? And so now we all, as I indicated, we need to vote on the, um, the motion as amended to adopt the agenda with the change and the changes would read as Ms. Gibson presented. At this point, Ms. Page, the original motion has been amended. Right. as was suggested by, as was motioned and seconded and just voted on by the body. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Page. Mr. Young, is anyone else listed to speak? Madam Chair, I believe we had a couple of persons move, Dr. Harris Muhammad to uh, move adoption of the agenda as amended. Dr. Harris Muhammad, the floor is yours. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move that we accept the March 15th, 2021 agenda with the noted amendments. Thank you, is there a second? A second. Thank you, it's been moved by Dr. Harris Muhammad and seconded by Mrs. Gibson to adopt the agenda with the changes made. Thank you very much. All right, we're now ready to move forward to the recognition. We have to do the have roll call. A Madam Chair, excuse me, we have to do the roll call vote. But I did that the last meeting. It's I'm just okay. anxious to move on. I hear about this smart young lady from Armstrong High. So please go right ahead and take the roll. Ms. Dorr? Yes. Ms. White? Yes. Ms. Gibson? Yes. Mr. Young? Aye. Ms. Rizzi? Yes. Dr. Harris Muhammad? Yes. Ms. Burt? Yes. Ms. Page? Yes. Ms. Jones? Yes. Your motion to adopt the agenda as amended by the motion has passed. Thank you so much, Ms. Lilly. I appreciate that. So now, Mr. Cameras, we're ready to hear from our student representative. Would you be so kind to introduce her? Absolutely. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good evening, everyone. I am delighted to introduce to you Aries Cabrera, who is a senior at Armstrong High School. Aries attended Chimborazo Elementary School before moving to the Philippines, and then she returned to Armstrong for high school. She is a straight A student, president of the Armstrong Leadership Program, and is currently serving her fourth year on my student advisory council. 
In addition, she also works as an urban farmer with Church Hill activities and tutoring. Although she is currently waiting on more offers, Aries has been accepted to her first school of choice, Virginia Tech. She plans to major in biology with a minor in psychology. Ladies and gentlemen, I am proud to present to you Aries Cabrera. Good evening, Chairwoman Burke, Vice Chair Young, Board Members, and Superintendent Cameras. It is a pleasure to be here with you tonight, serving as the student representative. I look forward to learning more about the board process. I would like to take this opportunity to address the board on behalf of myself and many of my peers regarding the 2021-2022 equity calendar. As I was contemplating what I would like to address in my remarks, I decided to focus on the equity calendar given the impact it will have on students, staff, and the community. My position here tonight as student representative grants me the opportunity that many of my peers feel they do not have, and that's to advocate for themselves and have our voices heard. Student voice is important because it expresses values and beliefs that makes a difference within the context of learning and education. From the perspective of us, the students and the staff, there are both positives and negatives to the proposed equity calendar. At first glance, the proposed schedule was quite confusing. A lot of my peers were not in favor due to the fact that it is a year round schedule and it is something new with RPS. With an early start date, I believe it will rush the process of keeping ourselves safe, knowing that there are multiple possible strands of COVID that has been introduced to the public. The biggest challenge in our school system for 2020, 2021 school year are those students who had difficulty attending classes caused by their mental health and overall adjustments within the school protocols. Due to COVID-19, there was a significant drop in educational rates, including attendance, motivation, and overall student performance. The schedule could make up for the learning loss, but research is unclear about whether or not a schedule change is a silver bullet solution to education. There are a lot of unproven factors about these type of changes. However, the intention behind it is justifiable. Since numerous students are looking for resources, I think this proposal will help those students who are in need of educational support. A lot more hands-on learning will be involved, including the increased opportunities for extra help and studying. Besides improving student academics, it provides the opportunity to help discover different talents a student has yet to develop. I think that we have been through so much change. We, we just need to bring back the sense of normalcy. We have transitioned and adapted to multiple schedules, though not all students are fast learners and were able to adjust to the new normal. This new schedule could potentially benefit students in academics, but it will take a lot of readjustments. I think that we should use this as an opportunity to create more changes. However, it is not a choice I can stand by. We as a district have experienced enough change in the past year. To add another drastic change could add to an already growing uncertainty about our future. I say enough change for the time being. Thank you. Thank you, Aries. And we are so proud of you. You represent Richmond Public Schools well, and the best to you as you move on to Virginia Tech. And I look forward to looking at the garden where you are with, with Chet. And thank you so much for all that you continue to do. You spoke very well, very well. Congratulations to you. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. And we know you'll have to leave at some point, but stay with us as, as long as you possibly can. But thank you so very much again for being here. Any other questions or comments, Mr. Cameras? I just want to thank uh, Aries again for her uh, extremely uh, well thought out comments. Uh, Aries represents hundreds, if not thousands of her peers who have strong opinions about everything at RPS. And uh, it's one of the reasons I love having uh, the Student Advisory Council because I get to hear directly from the students, whether it's good, bad or ugly, uh, they tell it to us straight. So I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Thank you again and continued success, Aries. Well done. All right, 2.02, recognition of the 2021 winners of the REB Awards for Distinguished Educational Leadership. Hmm, <laughs> one of my favorite times of the year, Mr. Cameras. Thank you, Madam Chair. And if I could have uh, Principal Waller take her uh, camera and put it on. There she is. I am Ooh. thrilled to announce that our first winner 
of the REB Distinguished Award for Educational Excellence. It's Principal Latanya Waller from Bouchal Middle School. Can we all give it up for Ms. Waller? Uh, she has done an incredible job at Bouchal over the last several years. Um, I do want to note this is an award that is determined by uh, nominations, but then ultimately the superintendents of uh, Richmond, Chesterfield, Hanover, and Henrico get together to review all of the applications. Uh, and she was selected as the first winner uh, from Richmond Public Schools. Uh, not only does she get the distinction of uh, forever being known as an REB uh, distinguished uh, educator, but she is also going to receive uh, personally $10,000 and her school will receive $20,000 in recognition of her leadership. So I present to you, Principal Waller. How wonderful, Miss Waller, we're so proud of you. So proud of you. She was our Virginia Teacher of the Year as well, correct? She was, yes. Yes, yes, yes. And I think our RAB Award winner before, correct Miss Waller? Yes, ma'am. Well, you just keep on doing what you're doing. Miss Page has a comment she'd like to make. You're on, you're on um, mute, Miss Page. Let Miss Waller speak, and then I'll have my comment after hers. Um, okay. So I just right here, Miss Waller. Thank you. I just want to say I am beyond honored to be the recipient of the IB Award for Leadership. Um, None of this is possible without the, the, the awesome things that Bouchal staff, students, scholars, and families do every single day. They are amazing. So I just want to say thank you all to, to thank you all for the opportunity um, to be recognized in this way. But it is it is my my family, my true family at Bouchal Middle School that makes me do everything that I that I like to do. Um, the, the actual monies will be used to fund our next century learning lab and next century learning classroom, which is, is going to go very well with the Amazon engineering grant that we also won today. So it's just great, great news all the way around. Congratulations again. We're so proud of you. And I've known Ms. Walla for years and just to see her to continue to excel. We thank you so much. We thank you so much. Keep on keeping on and continue to represent Richmond Public Schools well. We thank you for your service. And um, I hope you treat yourself to something well as well. <laughs> just a little something, okay, all right. You deserve that and then some. And uh, Mr. Cameras, is there more? There is, but I believe a few board members wanted to say a few words. Okay, all board. right, Mr. Young. Dr. Harris Muhammad. Thank you, Dr. Harris Muhammad, the floor is yours. I believe Ms. Page, it's it's her, it's a school in her division. I, I'm in her division, in her in her area. <laughs> I will go after Ms. Page. All right, Ms. Thank Ms. you, um, Dr. Harris Muhammad. Are you all not seeing my? I mean, I have a question or comment come up in the chat. Mr. Young. Mr. Young. No, I haven't forgotten about you, Ms. Page. I got you here. Yes, ma'am. Oh, I was just wondering if you all weren't seeing it. But anyway, Ms. Waller, kudos, kudos, kudos. Um, I have known you for many years as well. And your leadership, your vision, your hard work that I have seen that you have displayed you know, to our students, your collaboration with your team, your staff at Bouchard Middle School. I'm just at a loss for words, but I just want to thank you. Thank you for everything that you've done, everything that you will continue to do. And I am expecting great things from the Bouchard Middle School in the 8th District, you make us very proud. Thank you, thank you, thank you again. So hopefully, um, maybe I can get 
lunch or something. <laughs> I'm just joking. But um, this recognition is well deserved. And again, congratulations for being the recipient of the REB Award for Distinguished Educational Leadership. So deserving. Excellent, excellent. Thank you, Ms. Page. Dr. Harris Muhammad. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Madam Chair. Ms. Waller, I just wanted to say congratulations to you as well. My daughter sends her congratulations. She has heard that you won and you were, if you remember so many years ago, telling that age a little bit, um, you taught my daughter in middle school science. And so she was very appreciative um, and adored you, as a matter of fact, as her teacher. So I just wanted you to know that she said um, congratulations also. Well, please Excellent. tell her <laughs> thank you. I will. I will do that. Excellent. Anyone else, Mr. Young? No, ma'am. All right. Well, Ms. Waller, take the weekend off. You deserve a break. <laughs> I'll take and no Saturday and Sunday. Yourself. Yeah, you you work seven days a week, so I know what I'm talking about. I know what you're I know what you're doing, and we appreciate your representing Richmond Public Schools well. And do take some time for yourself, but thank you and thank your students, your faculty, and staff members as well, because we're only as great as those persons who are working along with us allow us to be. So I know that you're very appreciative of the team which you have. So keep on doing well. Thank you so much, Mr. Cameras. Thank you, Madam Chair, and congratulations again, Principal Waller. And I'm thrilled to announce that this year, the REB Foundation is giving a second REB Award for Outstanding Leadership. Uh, and I am delighted to announce that the second award uh, goes to Principal Tiwana Giles from Carver Elementary School, who is joining us this evening. Congratulations, Principal Giles. Thank you, thank you. Where is she? There she is. Dr. Giles, congratulations. Thank you. She sends out the best, what is it? They cover Nation Chronicles every week, every week. And I so appreciate, it's, it's evident that you're working so hard and so well. Congratulations. I'm not surprised at all. May you continue to soar and make great things happen at Carver and for our children in Richmond Public Schools. Would you like to speak? Sure. Um, first of all, thank you for having me and congratulations to Principal Waller, who's a great friend of mine. I'm so honored to be here with her, but I'm honored and humbled to receive this award on behalf of all of Carver Nation. That is the only way that this award is possible. We have some amazing, amazing teachers and RPS, and they truly reside at George Washington Carver Elementary School. And we have an, an amazing community that is so supportive and they made sure that this award happened. So I thank you all Carver Nation for everything that you do. And of course, our leadership team that has been so supportive, I would be remiss if I did not mention our chief of schools, Mr. Harry Hughes, who has been in my corner from the beginning, um, but really, really pushing me. My principal director, Principal Quarles, of course, um, I appreciate all that you do, even, even just, just pushing me a, a little extra. I definitely appreciate it. And I know that I am here and I'm successful because of the community that we serve. So thank you, Carver Nation. And I'm so honored to have won this award. Congratulations again. And Mr. Young, who do we have that would like to speak? Dr. Harris Muhammad, then Ms. White, then Ms. Page. All right, Dr. Harris Muhammad. Please allow Ms. White to go before me because Carver <laughs> is in her district. Her thank district, you. yes. Woohoo! Yes. Thank you. Ms. White. <laughs> Congratulations, Dr. Giles. Keep on making it happen for Carver Scholars. You have my support 100%. The parents, the community, of course, Carver Nation. Uh, we support you and we want you to continue doing those great things for Second District and Dr. Giles, always forward. Yes. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you, Ms. White. May I, Dr. Harris Muhammad, then Ms. Page? 
Dr. Giles, thank you, Madam Chair. Dr. Giles, congratulations. I am so very proud of you. Um, and I know there was a moment in time when we were trying to figure out who was going to finish their doctorate first. And I'm just so very proud of you. And you have remained the course. And I, I am just elated that you have won this award and just very grateful. Um, ever since I had the back to school rally at Carver Elementary School last summer, very still grateful for that. So thank you so very much. I'm not going to prolong prolong this, but congratulations, girl. You deserve it. So very proud of you. And as as Miss White said, always continue to move forward. Blessings to you. Thank you, Dr. Harris Muhammad. Miss Page. Yes, Dr. Giles. Congratulations again. Very well deserved um i have to say that i knew you i'm not surprised at this recognition because you started at on the other side of the river at oak grove bell mead and i saw so much in you even at that moment right. at that time so again i would like to congratulate you and continue to do what you do thank you Anyone else, Mr. Young? No, ma'am. Again, Ms. Dr. Giles, we are proud of you. This is one of the best parts about being on the board that we get to salute and to thank and show our appreciation and recognition for those that are working extra, extra hard and those that continue to do what is needed to be done on the side of our children in their best interests. So thank you again, as I stated to uh, Ms. Waller, take the weekend off, promise. Don't wanna see your card to school. And um, we thank you so very, very much. The best to you as you continue to make sure that every child every day has the opportunity to be successful, but take care of you as well. Thank you, thank you so much. All right, thank you. All right, we can move forward at this time. Public information. Um, what's the plan this evening, Ms. Lilly and Mrs. Hadasco? Ms. Hadasco is going to read and I'm going to time. And thank you all so very much again. Really appreciate you all just pitching in and making sure we continue to stay afloat. So, Ms. Hadasco, it's all yours. All right. Thank you so much. <clears throat> just for clarity, are we doing the two minutes? In yes, I'm sorry. Thank you for asking. Is everyone in agreement with the two minutes as we have and no more than two hours? I think we have about 58 pages. It's in the 50s, I believe. So we should be within that time frame. Any discussion? All right, please. I'm sorry, Mr. Young. Madam Chair. Mr. Young? Madam Chair, Dr. Harris Muhammad. Yes, please, Ms. Dr. Harris Muhammad. Yes, ma'am. And that also includes the second set of comments that was, I saw two blocks, just the, I, I'm, Ms. Hadusco, you went this, no? Yes. Uh, uh, there are 56 pages that are before 1 p.m. I'll read those. I got you. Others are, are posted for your review. Thank you so much. And I, I may be able to read fast enough to get all 56 in two hours. But I, I won't read too fast to our interpreters. <laughs> right, I think you will. All right, please proceed, thank you. All right, Jody Spraker. As the parent of a rising kindergartner, I support the newly proposed year-round school calendar. I appreciate that the administration and board are looking for multiple ways of improving student outcomes. For example, engaging curricula, competitive teacher pay, updated facilities, et cetera. And this seems like a promising opportunity to continue on the path forward. Personally, I like that the year-round calendar would allow my child to recharge during more frequent breaks and permit our family to travel to see relatives outside the summer months. We are already so out of routine due to COVID, I prefer starting the new schedule this year instead of the 22-23 year. James Pickren. The only thing that the administration should be focused on right now is safely reopening the schools no later than August 2021 trying to undertake a complicated logistical challenge of changing to a year-round school schedule will only distract from safely reopening the schools. 
The comments from the last school board meeting were overwhelmingly against changing to a year round schedule in fiscal year 22. There are lots of ways to address learning loss that doesn't involve such a distraction from the main objective of safely reopening. Use the power of your vote to keep the administration on the task of safely reopening the schools and addressing learning loss through means and methods that do not jeopardize a safe reopening. Sherry Conister. My name is Sherry Conister and I'm a teacher at Cardinal. I'm in support of the proposed year round school calendar. However, I have some reservations about using the intercessions to target struggling children. In my experience, I haven't seen where short interventions like this have shown a lot of benefit. I also am concerned with these students already with a low self-esteem feeling as though they are punished for having to do extra work. As a parent of a child who struggles through school, I experienced this firsthand. I would much rather see the money be put into additional resources to use during the regular school day for those students and let them have the break everyone else gets to enjoy. Barbara Kuto Sipe. I write in support of the proposed equity calendar. We hear directly from students every day that they are struggling academically and emotionally since the pandemic began. The more time we can give them for face-to-face -face learning and connecting with their peers, the more quickly they will recover. Now is the time for creating a plan that creates an even better RPS experience for students and families. Next up is ready to help in any way RPS needs. We are already talking with our provider network to assess what providers will need in order to return to the middle schools this fall during the after school hours. We're also talking with them about the fall, winter and spring intercessions to determine how they can serve RPS middle schoolers during those periods. Antonia Vassar. I'm the parent of a second grader at Fisher Elementary in the fourth district and a kindergartner starting next year, and I support the proposed calendar changes. I hope the new calendar will be implemented in time for this upcoming school year. A year round calendar will be easier for families with caregivers who work outside the home, especially if RPS is able to partner with organizations to provide camp and care opportunities during breaks. The consistency of a year-round calendar will also be better for children's learning and information retention, while the more frequent and shorter breaks will give their brains and bodies much needed rest from the longer stretches of the traditional calendar. Thank you for making these bold changes that our children deserve. Tamika Vincent. My name is Tamika Vincent and I'm currently the PTA president of John B. Carey Elementary and the parent of a second grader that attends this awesome RPS school. In reviewing year-round school data of nearby cities and states, I have come to believe that this is something that RPS should implement. There will be pros and cons with any change in process and year-round school is no different. However, in my opinion, the pros outweigh the cons. Year-round schools would be great for many families dealing with children that have begun to fall below various learning levels within our school system. Year-round school will afford students additional opportunities to retain what they have learned. It can provide more options for learning in areas where students may have shown some weaknesses during previous semesters. Finally, for teachers, year-round school would, re would create more instruction time and reduce the feeling of fresh schooling. The programs for the summer months could be more relaxed with limited testing, leaning more towards social improvement courses. However, major courses could still be offered, but not be mandatory. Nia. Okay, uh, no, I do not agree. I don't like the situation. I don't even know why you guys thought the kids were going to actually be cool with y'all making this decision for us. Virtual school is hard enough as it is and I do not accept, accept. y'all want us to look at a screen for eight hours a day for a whole year, heck no. Kim Gomez. My family and I can definitely get behind this adjusted calendar. I think the adjusted calendar option is strategic and thoughtful and is backed by research to show that collective implementation of this has the potential to provide a transformative education for kids. I didn't love it at first, probably because it's human nature not to like change, but then I looked at the proposal, saw the thought and the intentionality behind it, and now I'm 100% for the adjusted calendar. If we are staying virtual from now until June, I would ask that the administration consider how to put some more flexibility and fun into the day so teachers, staff, and parents can make it work in the best way possible. Also, the administration is working around the clock and listening to all sorts of feedback. 
This pandemic has impacted every family in so many different ways and some much harder than others because of systemic racism, which makes the decision-making process for our district all the more challenging. Let's extend some grace to one another. Genevieve Siegel Hallway, Hallwilly. I'm a parent of a Cary first grader. I support the proposed year round calendar option given the social science around the benefits of an extended school year. Ashley Wilkins. Hello, my son, uh, Jamil, pronounced Jamil, attends Cary Elementary. Thanks for all the support during this challenging time. I agree to bring kids with special needs into the class maybe once or twice throughout the week. There are still many challenges posed with society and the city isn't resourceful enough to catch families if they fall hard. With that said, let's play this safely and know if schools are already outdated, how fast can we equip them to be COVID safe? Altered schedules and extra days affect working parents and a teacher's work-life balance. Dr. Cameras, you are amazing with leading the pack, and I ask you to continue to use your wisdom to guide us along the journey. RPS has been doing phenomenal, and with resource differences between counties and cities, no way for everyone to return safely currently. Jessica Levy Lavelle. Next school year, I will have one child at Albert Hill Middle School and two at Mary Mumford Elementary School. Year-round school is a big change and I'm concerned that it will not adequately address the learning loss accumulated during the pandemic. I would like to see all efforts go into a safe in-person return at this time. Then I would like to see significant teacher and family engagement, as well as a review of studies done on the impact of year-round over how to address the learning loss. If year-round is the answer, I would recommend that it is implemented for the 22-23 school year once we have adequately planned and partnered with Parks and Rec to offer low to no cost child care for families that require that service. Regardless of the decision on year-round school, I support the addition of religious holidays to the calendar. Thank you for your consideration. Willis Weber. My name is Willis Weber. I'm a RPS parent of three students here in the East End of Richmond. It is also my honor to support students and families in my role as the after school director of Churchill activities and tutoring, CHAT. As an out of school time professional, the school calendar conversation is an important one for the families I serve, the educators I respect and the work of our organization. There are a variety of thoughts and opinions on what school calendar best serves RPS students and families. No matter what schedule is chosen, CHAT and the other out of school time programs who have tirelessly supported families and students in the pandemic landscape will remain committed to student success and family flourishing. Chelsea Rock Haynes. I'm an RPS parent and support the year round calendar as proposed. Seven additional weeks of instruction would be a wonderful tool for achieving greater equity in RPS. Megan Kennedy. I am an RPS parent in the third district and want to express my full support of the proposed calendar changes for the spring 21 through fall 2023 school years. This additional classroom time would be so beneficial for our kids that have lost so much valuable time with our amazing teachers. Bob Nichols. I would like to comment in support of the proposed school calendar for spring 2021 through fall 2023. When schools are open, children and families have access to important supports. I know this because my team and I provide some of those supports across the district. In addition to services from RPS school staff, such as speech therapists, school nurses, and school social workers, RPS families also enjoy a host of other opportunities in their neighborhood schools, access to healthcare providers, health screenings, case managers, literacy coaches, job training opportunities, mentors, and performing artists. By bringing these opportunities into our schools, RPS brings them into our children's neighborhoods, removing the barriers of transportation, schedule, childcare, and financial means that might otherwise prevent their families from accessing these services. When schools close for months at a time, all those barriers come back. Opening our schools more weeks out of the year allows us to work together in meaningful ways across each and every neighborhood in our city. RPS has emerged as a leader in the state in terms of school partnership and school-based services that uplift and strengthen our community. Let's not stop now. Chris Dovey, as a longtime partner to Richmond Public Schools and as a Virginia state-funded PD program in support of the Virginia Computer Science Standards of Learning, 
Code VA has provided no cost, high quality professional development to hundreds of RPS teachers over the past seven years. Code VA is and remains committed to supporting and to working with Richmond Public Schools administration. We take no position on year round schools as this is a policy decision that must be weighed and considered for the good of the community by those selected to represent the various cities and counties. While the traditional school year remains prevalent, the option to move to year-round learning is a policy gaining traction among Virginia school divisions, and it seems likely that more divisions will follow this route in the future. As such, Code VA is committed to working with divisions making this shift so that teachers receive equitable, high-quality professional support. LaVar Stoney, Mayor. Chair Burke, Vice Chair Young, and esteemed members of the Board of Richmond Public Schools. Thank you for your continued partnership and ongoing dedication to the children of our city. On behalf of the communities we collectively serve, I write today to express my support for the proposed equity calendar. I am compelled by the case made by Superintendent Cameras and his administration, who have shared ample evidence that this approach to an academic year will grant our children the most significant opportunity to recover, both academically and socioemotionally, from the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic and persistent virtual schooling. The city stands ready to support your efforts to adopt your academic calendar. Should you approve this proposal, I will direct my Office of Children and Families to coordinate city agencies and partners to ensure that all youth programming and services adjust to a new RPS calendar. A new academic calendar will have implications for the city's Department of Parks, Recreation, and Community Facilities, the Office of Community Wealth Building, and the Department of Social Services, as well as our partners at Richmond Behavioral Health Authority, Richmond Public Library, and Greater Richmond Transit Company. Of course, we will also maintain our collaborative efforts with the RPS administration, the Alliance for Out of School Time, and the Out of School Time Steering Committee to ensure that high quality, full service after school programming continues to be offered to every elementary and middle schooler in the division. I want to collaborate to ensure that all of these agencies and others that offer youth programming and services will be prepared to support your children and their families whenever the first day of school might be and whenever calendar breaks are offered. We will adjust as we have done over the past year so that we pose no obstacle to supporting RPS and the children and families that you serve. I look forward to hearing from you on next steps. Faith A. Alejandro. I'm in support of the year-round calendar because it appears to be a great way to help support students most in need of literacy assistance and to redress the harms to learning caused by COVID. It appears to be a way of supporting our teachers with more frequent breaks and financial incentives to work intercessions. I'm grateful for the creative way this also begins to ease us into year-round school, for which I'm a fan in general. This schedule still offers a significant summer break, and I'm glad for the adoption of additional religious holidays to include time off for our increasingly diverse district. I'm optimistic that as we demand, as we create a demand for childcare options, our community will step up both as providers and employers and meet that demand, especially with this much advance notice. Thank you for creating a calendar that prioritizes our students with the greatest needs. When they are supported, we all are all uplifted. Thank you for the town hall conversation this week. It has been incredibly informative and helpful. Rob and Catherine Rauschenberg. I understand that many students have fallen behind, but there are just as many students who have been able to master and even surpass grade level objectives during this pandemic. Changing the school calendar just presents another unexpected adjustment for our students. I'm not in favor of changing the traditional school calendar. The name may be different, but at the end of the day, this new proposal is for year round school. Very few districts throughout the United States adopt this model, only about 4% of all public schools. If it is so successful, why are so few schools adopting this method? Some districts have piloted this program in a few select schools, Virginia Beach, for example, only to resort back to the traditional calendar. In order to help those students who have fallen behind, I believe Virginia Beach is offering more comprehensive summer programming for 2021. They are not readopting the year round method, which was tried in the past. Students in Richmond who have mastered the required competency should not be penalized. 
Richmond should consider a summer boost program for those who need it, but keep the traditional calendar. A 2012 Joint Leg Legislative Audit and Review Commission study, BDOE website under construction, under instruction year round and extended year schools, concluded that overall SOL scores at year round schools were similar to scores in traditional calendar schools. The students in a year round model might catch up faster, but there is no significant difference in learning at the end of the year. That is reason enough to concentrate on the summer enrichment and leave the traditional calendar as is. Year-round school disqualifies students from certain summer jobs and internships, and it creates real childcare issues for parents. No other neighboring school districts are considering changing their school calendars in such a dramatic way so quickly. It would eliminate some students from participating in extracurricular activities in surrounding counties. The students have adjusted to so many changes. Why burden them with more? By all means, offer remediation during the summer, but quality education takes into consideration all Hi. students. Lauren Delaney. I am the parent of an eighth grade RPS student and we 100% support the proposed calendar. Year-round school will be beneficial for students, parents, teachers, and administrators, especially after a year of virtual learning. Thank you. Brianna Jimenez. I'm mostly in favor of RPS's proposed spring 2021 through fall 2023 calendar. One modification I would like to see is at least one teacher workday every month rather than sporadic teacher workdays, half or whole, here and there. I believe that giving teachers a workday each month can assist in catch up, planning, grading, and more. Thank you for your time and consideration. A. Van Devender Smedley. I regret that due to a standing commitment on Wednesday evenings, I am unable to participate in this evening's conversation, but I would like to share my input on the proposed schedule for next school year. Thank you for asking for our input. Number one, inclusive holidays. Bravo for including holidays that are celebrated in our community. Number two, yay for year round. From a teacher's perspective, I think year round will benefit students, teachers, and content retention. Fully on board. Number three, no break after marking period one. 13 consecutive instructional weeks with minimal breaks in a year round setting will be a challenge. The purpose of year round is to avoid burnout, both students and teachers, and gaps in learning. As the schedule stands, we will have 13 weeks of instruction, a two week break, 3.5 weeks of instruction, almost a two week break, and 2.5 weeks to wrap up first semester. Four by four is unforgiving with pacing, and my concern is that the timing of marking period two would set us further behind in content coverage. Also, please be mindful that our students will need to reacclimate to the classroom environment after 17 months away. A break between marking period one and two would bet better serve the pacing students and teachers. Number four, teacher work days. Please consider inverting the number of PD days, four, and teacher work days, two, prior to the start of the school year. We have had many opportunities to grow in our profession this year, and the new teachers we welcome this coming school year will have additional training prior to all staff pre-service. We will need ample time, maybe more so this year than previous years, to prepare our learning environments for our students' return after having not been in the building for at least 15 months. Our classroom environment sets the tone for learning. Two days is not sufficient for preparing our classrooms and planning opening activities Hi. and lessons. Bob Argabright. My name is Bob Argabright and I live in the fourth district. I have been an advocate, mentor, tutor, and a friend to the children and families of the Oak Grove Bellmead Elementary School and community for the past 17 years. Since 2011, when plans were announced to build a new Oak Grove Bellmead School, a group of volunteers have been creating an outdoor learning campus for the community on six acres adjoining the school. We also created the theme of the watershed for our new green school. All rooms of the school are named after flora or fauna found in the forest canopy, understory, and forest floor. Beginning in September 2013, I founded and coordinated a Saturday, Saturday literacy program from 9 to noon each Saturday of the school year. The program is regularly attended by approximately 50 students and 25 volunteers. Since the pandemic, we have conducted the program in the Bellmead Outdoor Learning Campus each Saturday from 1 to 4. Our students are from 4 to 17 years old. 
We have a disciplined one, one hour of reading, and then they enjoy our rain and pollination garden, beehive, bike shop, nature play area, tree walk, geology station, safe entry to the creek, and our youth food forest. I encourage the superintendent and school board to an adopt an extended week and year round school year for our students. I would love to encourage RPS to reach out and partner with my outdoor learning program in the fall. Together, we can create a love of learning and have an enthusiastic group of students looking forward to our Saturday school. Children do not miss Saturdays and often arrive early and stay late. I want to be part of the solution and look forward to supporting RPS and a modified education plan. If you would like to explore the idea further, my email address is then listed. Teresa Kennedy. Distinguished board members, my name is Teresa Kennedy and I am the parent of two RPS students. I'm reaching out to support the proposed calendar changes. I think the calendar changes give RPS teachers and administration the greatest chance of supporting lost academic time during the pandemic. Coming out of the pandemic, I believe we should make bold strides toward equity. And I think the proposed calendar changes is one of those opportunities. The system we had before the pandemic didn't work for everyone. And now that we are re-entering the world and have federal stimulus money, I think it would be a waste to spend it on just buildings. We need to spend it directly on kids. Please support the calendar updates. Rakia Cooper. I am R. Cooper, an RPS parent residing in Richmond's sixth district. I wanted to take a moment to weigh in on the 2021-22 school calendar. Upon initially hearing about the, quote, year-round school calendar, I was completely against the change. However, after taking a moment to actually review the calendar, I realized that for the great majority of RPS students, this calendar is not year-round at all. Families may be more accepting of this change if the calendar were explained more clearly. I support the extra help the identified students would receive, but I am unclear on how the proposed schedule would benefit the remaining 20,000 or so RPS students. I look forward to gaining more clarity from the board and RPS administration. Samantha Duthit. Uh, my name is Samantha Duthit and I am in my second year of being an RPS student. I would like to state that I'm not in favor of the year round school proposal. I think that the summer long break is important for students, teachers and staff alike. The summer break provides students, teachers and staff a much needed break from the demands of school and work. Year-round schooling would introduce unique struggles to students with anxiety, including social and school-induced anxiety. I think that the summer break is very important so that students can have a long period of time in which they don't have to stress about school or completing assignments. The summer also allows teachers a break from creating and grading assignments. Finally, staff also have a long-awaited break. Year-round school would simply not provide students, teachers, and staff with that same opportunity. Robin Keegan. My name is Robin Keegan and I am a parent, teacher, and resident of RPS. I am concerned about the year-long calendar proposal. We have had less than six months to discuss and vet this year-long calendar. We have not engaged the community. It's hard to during a pandemic. We are not listening to all teachers. Weeks of public comment demonstrate that not all teachers want to do this. Branding this as the equity calendar is manipulative. A year-round calendar is not the only way to achieve equity. I can think of a million things this administration needs to do to achieve equity in more meaningful ways than sending only 5,000 kids to school longer. This administration is spinning things to achieve the desired effect because they seem to think none of us know what's best for ourselves, our families, or our communities. If you think you're selling this to us, you're not. You will either lose teachers and families or you will have a staff that doesn't trust you and will not give you the buy-in you need for this for a happy, healthy school district. There is a compromise in this situation and this administration refuses to even look at those compromises. They continue to turn away from the people who are offering them. One proposal does not give us a voice in this situation. How is that equity? It is disheartening, frustrating, and soul crushing. This is not leadership. This discussion was supposed to happen in September and decided by December. Ms. Cosby didn't get the information requested until December. There are reasons this should have happened earlier. It takes a full year to plan. Maybe planning this risky systemic change is not the risk we wanna take during a pandemic. We have not engaged the community like we should. 
please consider taking a step back this year to plan and engage and pick the discussion up again for school year 22-23 when we are closer to the end of this pandemic. Gabe Walters and Rachel Dean. As RPS parents and third district residents, we support the proposed year round school calendar and ask the school board to adopt it immediately for, this, for the 21 through 23 school years. The boost sessions on the calendar are another step towards education equity in Richmond, and we believe the year round model will pay dividends in the future. Thank you for your work on behalf of our students. Amy Brown. It is with all due respect that I ask you to vote no to the proposed year round calendar. My 16 years of teaching experience and 20 years of parenting experience tell me with crystal clarity that what the students and community in Richmond need most beginning this summer is normalcy. Time to reach out to family they've missed, time to breathe. We paid for an SEL program to teach our students that all the negative emotions and frustrating situations they've encountered over the last year must be processed and that the way to do this is with mindfulness, breathing, relaxation, thought, compassion, and self-examination. Yet here we are voting on how quickly we can thrust them back into the buildings. Again, a rush decision that will become an obviously bad idea once it's too late. Do not risk losing the many seasoned teachers who will leave the district if this year round calendar is adopted this year. Plenty of us are ready and willing to teach the identified students and then some in the most robust summer school and perhaps slightly extended school year anyone has ever seen. Asking more than that of teachers and the kiddos this late in the year is nonsense. Vote no, demand the other options promised in September, do not settle. Corey Widmer, I'd like to express my enthusiastic support of the proposed school calendar that the school board is voting on this Monday. The word on the street is that many West End parents have been speaking against the proposal, but as a West End parent myself, I would like to go on the record stating how beneficial I believe the proposed calendar would be. I'm very concerned about the plight of our most vulnerable students in RPS, and I believe that this calendar will offer the needed extra support after such a difficult virtual year. Additionally, even for students like my own four daughters, who will likely not participate in the intervention sessions, I still think the proposed calendar would be better for them. Gregory Bauer. We need to rally behind our new president and open the schools for in-person instruction. We're the only school district in the Commonwealth that is not providing a widely available in-person option to all K-12 students this spring. There are still three months left in the school year and we should be focused on getting kids back in the classroom now. The best way to stop learning loss isn't through a new academic calendar next fall, it's to get kids back in the classroom to slow the learning loss that keeps building. We need to stop debating science, get the teachers vaccinated, and follow the guidance to open the schools. The proposed calendar will only further exacerbate the learning loss for most kids. It means more kids at home with no routine and long breaks. Does it not seem like deja vu? Two weeks at home in November, two more in December, another two weeks in March, and one more in April. Is this the ticket for success for the vast majority of RPS students, long breaks with no schooling? We can do better. Let's get the kids back in school now so we can build confidence in a safe reopening following the traditional academic calendar this coming fall. Paula Buckley. GRASP, Great Aspirations Scholarship Program Incorporated, advisors currently help RPS students and families during the academic year navigate the college financial aid system and access institutional, federal, state, and community resources for funding post-secondary education. Advisors are assigned to specific high schools where they provide individualized assistance to students and parents free of charge, primarily through private appointments. If RPS adopts a year-round calendar providing extra support for select students during a summer session, GRASP assistance would be available during the summer months on an as-needed basis through the GRASP office to continue to ensure college and career access opportunities are accessible to students and families. Demarcus Carlisle. I think we should not do year round school because people will be mentally stressed and distracted. So how are you going to fix that? Shanae Terrain. 
The idea of year-round school is going to cause mental exhaustion to students. Each student has an independent life apart from school that's not based around going to school. The dropout rate is going to increase for the simple reason that students are not going to have enough days or weeks of summer break and other breaks. Trying to force students to be in school longer than needed is unacceptable. Clayton Godbold. Personally, I do not think year-round school is a thing that should not happen. Students need breaks, but you guys are correct that some students need extra time at home just to relax and chill with family, but some students might also need extra time and help. So by using my skill set, I created a simple but effective solution to yours and my problem. Make it so the parents or guardians of the child can decide by seeing the child's grades and how they act, and they can decide the future of their own child by picking when they need. Jasmine Glenn, I honestly disagree with having year-round school. Students and teachers have to deal with around nine months of doing and grading schoolwork, so I believe that everyone is deserving of a three-month vacation. It also leaves them to spend time with and have fun with their friends and family. Tammy Fenster, I oppose the new calendar or any type of school calendar that subjects students to be identified as needing support and removed from their personal time developing interests and discovering themselves through friendships, family, and community. Consider the trauma and low self-esteem issues this would create when friends find out they had to attend school. Imagine the strain this will place on the parent-child relationships too. Additionally, teachers who have kids in different school districts will incur childcare costs for the difference in calendar schedules. There's a four week difference from August to September. Winter break is not the same and an additional week at the end of June. Kim Dean Anderson. University of Richmond Bonner Center for Civic Engagement, CCE, values its partnership with RPS. We look forward to continued connections, perhaps newly created and innovative ones, regardless of the calendar structure, and especially if a new year round model is approved. The CCE is honored to support a thriving RPS. Mary Kay Avula. I'm a RPS teacher and parent who lives and works in the seventh district. And like many teachers and parents, I have found virtual school to be extremely challenging, but it seems hardest on my young kindergarten students. We have done the best we can, but our little ones have lost a great deal of instructional time this year, and we will have lots of ground to cover when we return to in-person learning. We have not been able to provide the typical opportunities for reading and writing that we have traditionally provided in the classroom. I am writing to ask you to please vote in favor of the proposed calendar so that we can get to work supporting our students and helping them with foundational skills we've missed out on this year. Many families are suffering from job losses, deaths of loved ones, mental health difficulties, and financial instability, which makes it difficult for adults to support their little ones with virtual school. Our children have missed being in school and their parents ask me all the time when the school buildings will open back up. We are all eager to be back at school and the proposed calendar offers extra instructional time for those who need it most. I have heard some comments from people who feel this decision is rushed, but those of us who have been following the conversation know RPS has been discussing a year round calendar for quite some time. Implementing it now in response to this year of virtual schooling seems like the perfect time. Adopting the proposed calendar now, rather than putting it off to a later time, would demonstrate our district's commitment to equity. Ralph W. Stuckey. To find students who need it the most, are these students with poor attendance, not attending during the summer, did not attend during the school year, or low achieving students? What is the grade level of participating students? Do you think middle and high school students are less likely to attend? due to summer jobs, et cetera? Do you think that parents will attend after a three week break? How are you going to re-engage the parents and students, especially in lower income communities where parents may leave for work early? What social supports are you going to have in place or partners? I'm not suggesting money, but what is the incentive for the student to attend a three week summer session? After all, school may not have been an encouraging or supportive place. Are you going to roll this out citywide or pilot the program? 
My, uh, Kaisha King. My name is Kaisha King and I am a teacher at Woodville Elementary. The fact that the year round cal calendar was entitled equity calendar offended me as an educator who has worked and seen true inequities in RPS for the past 10 years. People who are against this calendar, not anti equity. I am against the year round calendar for this upcoming school year, mainly because we have no plans of how reopening and getting back into the building will look like. Will there be cleaning days or are we just going back to business as usual as if we are not still in a pandemic? I actually love the ideas of this administration, but the execution of the ideas are a struggle and frustrating because of rushed and poor planning. I show and teach my students every day that they matter. And honestly, this calendar says that only 5,000 students matter. What about the ones that don't make the cut? Intercessions will benefit the 5,000, but not the ones who don't make the cut. Those two weeks out will have an effect on the ones who don't make the cut. As a special education teacher, I know that there is more than one way to reach students and we have been only given one option. Teachers can never say ideas without detailed plans with data. How can you feel comfortable with just saying yes without the details? Vote no. Ansley Perkins. I appreciate the administration's efforts to begin the community engagement process regarding year-round school. I am unclear why the year-round option style is the only option being proposed. When I asked this question at one of the town halls, I was told it was because of the board. However, this past July, the board approved a motion to be presented with several options, which has not occurred. We have heard from teachers and staff about pressing pause next year. I feel strongly that we need to listen and support them right now. I hope the board will do so next year. We press pause for dreams for RPS. While doing so, I hope the board receives several calendar options, that we have engagement opportunities in many town halls over several months, and that we will utilize multi-modal formats to receive input from families and staff. This decision requires some real-time thorough engagement and intentionality. Andrea Impson. Hello, I am a teacher at RPS. This last year has been the hardest year mentally, emotionally, and in general for parents, teachers, and students alike. Teachers are completely drained and running on fumes. We all need a year of normalcy to readjust to entering back into the school environment. We have been alone for a year. The next year should be a year of getting back in a routine, readjusting to a normal schedule, and to figure out how things should be. We do not need a big change such as a year-round schedule this year. Many teachers and families have already paid for vacations. Teachers made these arrangements while they were not under contract for July or early August. To tell teachers that they must cancel their trips when they made the arrangements not knowing about a completely different contract schedule is unfair. We should implement the year-round schedule in another year. This is the best choice for everyone. I cannot in good conscience let the opportunity pass to voice my concerns about the amount of testing the students were made to endure at home during a pandemic and back to back. The testing schedule and calendar this year shows little evidence of reopening with love and showing grace. Asking students to test over and over again has created a new level of stress and burnout. I sincerely hope that the powers that be realize how skewed the testing data will be this year due to the pandemic and the abundance of assessments right after one another that the students have had. We have to do better, figure out a workable plan for assessments that will create reliable data. Jessica Bloomberg. For the following reasons, I strongly oppose the suggested RPS move to the new equity calendar. The proposed equity calendar is not only misnamed, but it has not been adequately vetted as any significant change in the calendar should. There must be a chance for the board to hear from a variety of experts who have adopted the recommended calendar and those who have not. There might be a valid reason why most school districts in Virginia have not adopted the recommended calendar. This is not the appropriate time to change the school schedule. We must first ensure that our children, teachers, and all school employees have a safe working environment. This may require COVID vaccination and a community representative committee to review the safety of our schools before they are completely reopened. Such committees are CDC recommended as essential before we reopen schools. The financial impact of an equity school calendar has not been documented and analyzed. 
If RPS is planning on relying on government funding this year, what happens when this funding is not renewed? Many RPS employees and parents of students have become accustomed to the current school calendar. The effects of the proposed calendar must be weighed and accurately documented. I strongly suggest that we get our children safely back to school and then take our time to analyze school year changes. This analysis must include calling on outside experts to volunteer their advice to the school board and administration. Thank you for your time and attention. F.A. Agamo. Hello, I'm a student and I know you're voting on year round school and I say no, do not. You guys may think you know what's best for us, but you don't know what it's like to put yourself in my predicament and you'll be on my side. You guys always make just big decisions you think benefit students and stuff, but I don't get an opinion. I mean, high schoolers do absolutely, I mean, high schoolers do, but absolutely no one else. And you all should ask yourself who you are benefiting, yourself or the students. Also, parents only want you to vote year round because their kids aren't at home and students probably don't wanna be in school forever. I need my break and your biggest mistake was not leaving off from last year, but getting back on point, you should vote no. Nora Fuller. As a child that has gone to Richmond Public Schools all my life, I don't think this is the right time. The 2021 school year has already been a hot mess and it's been so awful for a lot of us kids. Online school has been really difficult, so I don't think we need another factor. This may not mean a lot to you guys, but summer is also a getaway for everyone and cutting it short would be hard for us. I have siblings who aren't on the year round schedule, so it would be really difficult for them to work around everyone's schedules. This may seem like a good idea, but I don't think this is the right year to execute it. Thank you. Nicholas Hall. As an RVA school student, I am severely against all round schools. It is a change that will alter our schedules. It would strain the parents, especially mine, because they now have to find transportation throughout the whole year and not have a break from that. I would also not be able to commit to a summer job and other students wouldn't either. Next time, I'd like to have a survey for the students for a decision like this. This is something that primarily affects the students' lives. The fact that we weren't even a thought in who has a say in this decision is outlandish. Cynthia Green teacher at ED Red. I've sent emails and comments on this topics, topic. Tonight, I will just state my objection again to the proposed calendar for the 21-22 school year. Don't do this to us. Give us normal for at least a year. I say no to the calendar. Mayana, as an online school is already as draining and stressful as it is in RVA, Making school start in August and have two breaks will push it over the edge. Nobody wants this but adults who don't even know what it feels like to be doing this type of thing. Doing this is going to push us kids into depression and make the pressure harder. Just keep school the way it has been for years. Ruby Fryer. I'm against all year school for many reasons. Firstly, it is already hard for many families to find childcare in the summer but at least there are college students that are also on summer break who get jobs babysitting. They're not going to be college students on break and ready to babysit at random two week breaks in the year. Where do you expect these parents to get childcare? Secondly, it is really hard for students to adjust to coming back from breaks. I know that after winter break, my grades dropped and it was awful coming back to school. Having these random breaks instead of just one long summer break would throw off students' schedule, cycle, excuse me. Thirdly, school is important, but also we are kids. We deserve a summer break where we can go outside and get exercise rather than spend our whole year doing schoolwork. Mary Nunnally, I'm writing to you as a student at Open High School. I have investigated the idea of the proposed new school year and I do not think it should go through. I know some RPS officials have the idea that as students and teachers are already in such a developing, changing time, now is the perfect time to introduce a new schedule, but that is not the case. I have been working myself thin during this school year to secure straight A's, and the only thing keeping me sane in these moments is the potential for our long and appreciated summer break. 
The schedule we've maintained for a very long time is the one that I'm accustomed to and comfortable with, and now in such a miserable era is not the time to make large changes. Every day is a confusing and draining mess, and to add on to that mess would be ridiculous and ignorant to the suffering of RPS students. I do not believe that the general idea for a new school year is completely uncalled for. In fact, I feel it may be an interesting topic in the future, but to implement it now would be absolutely redundant. My mother has also expressed concerns about the proposed schedule, especially coming from a family whose access to transportation is limited. Even teachers I've been talking with find the proposition hard to consider as it would mean having to prepare begin preparing for the year much earlier while still being paid the same measly amount. This proposition looks to me like more work for people who are already at their limit. Now is not the time, RPS. Now, I do understand that this schedule could be beneficial to families who are less fortunate and in need of assistance when it comes to food. And I am immensely empathetic for these families, which is why I believe RPS should have their focus entirely set on helping them instead of bending the schedule to potentially help them. Call me a wishful thinker, but I believe there must be a better way. This city Bye. is Katina Harris. My name is Katina Harris, president of the Richmond Education Association. I want to first thank the RPS staff, students, and families who have shown us what resilience looks like during this time. My comments today are concerning the proposed school calendar for 21-22. We ask that you keep the current school calendar format for the 21-22 school year. We, we realize that major changes in schedules for families, students, and staff require great planning and detail. Therefore, we ask that you wait until we have further data, especially staff and family input, to make these tremendously important decisions for RPS. Carrie Treadway, please do not implement a calendar change next year. As an elementary teacher, not only are we surviving a pandemic, but we have also had to implement two new curricula in this virtual world. The amount of overtime hours put in this year and the burnout is real. Oftentimes it felt like we were building the plane while simultaneously flying it blindfolded. Don't get me wrong, we are doing amazing things, but the mental, physical, and emotional exhaustion has taken its toll. We should be focusing our time and energy on how we are going to safely reopen our schools in the fall and review that plan with a fine tooth comb. Please hit the pause button on the calendar change. Focus on the fall. Give your educators some time to breathe. The VDOE has planning grants available for districts to use for year round schools. Apply for that grant and use the money to create a concrete plan. Use the stimulus funds to create a more robust summer school and give us more intervention support in the fall. Thank you. Victoria Carl. My name is Victoria Carl and I'm a teacher in Richmond City Public Schools. I am against implementing a year round calendar for 21-22. I believe it is happening too quickly. Students and teachers need to get back to the normalcy and so much change hoisted upon us is overwhelming and difficult. Now is not the time to do this. Let's let teachers and students get back to work and build relationships. Let us reconsider next year. There is too much at once. I would also like to comment on the administration's decision to go to a four by four schedule for all high schools next year. When the district is also pushing for more AP courses, it is devastating for these AP classes on this schedule. The administration's decision to implement this without public comment feels like a slap in the face to many teachers. Renee Garnett, what is the status of the air quality system in the schools, especially the older schools? Emily Phillips, thank you for the hard work that went into creating this plan. I am in favor of the proposed extended school calendar beginning this year. Many students have fallen behind and are in need of the extra support that we can offer them. Not only does this plan provide additional academic support, but also facilitates opportunities for the development of caring relationships. Trusted relationships are hugely important for students who are struggling. Thank you in advance for your proactive planning to care for our children. Emily Fay. My name is Emily Fay and I am an RPS parent and employee. I'm writing to express my concern with the timeline for implementing a year-round calendar. 
My preference would be that we retain the traditional school calendar indefinitely for many reasons. But if we are moving to year-round school, I think it is necessary to give parents and staff adequate time to plan for this change. In discussing the year-round calendar with my husband, we realized just how complicated this would be for us. And to be honest, the idea of having to plan for this drastic change so quickly is very stressful. My household is a blended one and our custody and visitation order is based on a traditional school calendar. The necessary changes to the order cannot be made in the time frame proposed as it takes about nine months to get through the court system in our experience. The current proposal gives families only five months from the school board vote on Monday, March 15th to the beginning of the school year for most students on August 17th. That's nowhere enough time. In addition, my youngest will be going to a preschool that uses the traditional calendar, which will complicate childcare needs for us. Wait lists for childcare can be six months long or even longer. So again, five months lead time is inadequate for many families. I'm asking you to show consideration for families like mine and postpone the introduction of a year round calendar to the 22-23 school year. July of 21 would be a great time to make decisions for July of 22, in my opinion, giving us a full year to prepare. Perhaps RPS could use a more robust summer school or boost option for summer 2021 for students that need this and families that feel this would be beneficial to their child. I would also like to address the specific calendar being voted on, which I find far from ideal. If we are moving to year round school, can we please spend a little more time developing a calendar that would allow for more camps and activities for children that will not qualify for the boost? I think October and April would be better times to take advantage of the outdoors. Hi. Michael Abat Abatis, I apologize if I mispronounced that. I would like to express my opposition to changing the calendar for the Richmond Public Schools. We've had too much change and we need some normalcy. There has been no sense of urgency to get the children back to in-person learning, so I'm not sure why this is such a priority at this point in time. It would be far more sensible to get into a normal schedule and then reevaluate at a later time. Abigail and Drew Edwards. I'm a parent of students in RPS and I think it's a terrible idea to change the calendar. Adding more school isn't going to solve any problems, it's just going to add to them. My daughter and son despise online school, but I understand it's not forever and it's the best possible way to deal with the pandemic. Changing the school calendar and only offering two interim breaks is a terrible idea. It's already a struggle to keep them engaged in school. The thought of losing the summer and adding so many more days to the calendar is just draining. This seems to be about childcare. The entire American working system needs to change so parents have more flexibility and more time with their children. Yes, this is so true, but it's not the responsibility of the school system to care for children. It is their responsibility to teach the children. This can't be an issue to child care issues. Scientific studies prove without a doubt that test scores do not go up when the calendar moves to year round. Please don't do this. Thank you for your time. Vilma Jones. I am a high school student in RVA schools and I dislike the idea of year round school. Some of my friends have siblings who go to private schools and if we were to have year round school, their schedules would be different and vacations would not match up. And I know some teachers have made plans for their weddings and vacations, and by doing year-round school, you would mess up their plans. And RPS teachers have already done so much for their students this year. They don't deserve for their plans to be taken away. And I do not want to go back to school early this year. I want to have a full summer. Also, I would like to point out, has it ever occurred to you that some Richmond Public Schools air conditioning units don't even work? My high school has some air conditioning units that don't even work, so it is going to be very hot in August. Even with the windows open, it's going to be very hot. This year has already been so hard on all students and teachers. This is not the time to make a change. When it's time to go back to school, I want the schedule to be the same. I want it to be a normal year. Please take these things into consideration when casting your vote. Cynthia Green. As a teacher, I am exhausted from this year. We had to learn a whole new way to teach along with the new language arts curriculum. Too many changes were made all at once. We are tired. The students are tired. We all want normal. This calendar is not normal. It doesn't even resemble a normal year-round calendar. 
It is rushed and not thought through. It needs to be put on hold. Give us normal, hopefully with buildings that are ready for us. Ansley Plasted. My name is Ansley Plasted. I am a seventh grader at Benford Middle School and I am strongly against Richmond Public Schools proposed year round school schedule. First off, I think both the teachers and the students need their summer break. For several students, summer break is the only time they can see distant family members and participate in extracurricular activities. My parents plan and pay for vacations and camps several months ahead of time, and it will be a hassle for them to cancel on such short notice. Speaking of short notice, with the proposed schedule, there isn't enough time to get all the schools ready. Many schools in this district are currently in no condition to let a bunch of kids back in, and if year-round in-person school starts in the summer, they won't have time to fix all the schools up and many students will have to go to school in poor conditions. Furthermore, several schools have problems with their air conditioning and in the summer heat, that would make the classrooms hot and uncomfortable for everyone in them. Year-round school does have one benefit I can think of and that is it may help students who are behind catch up to the curriculum. However, that means students are who are caught up or ahead will have to sit around and do work on things they have already been taught and understand, which will make them bored and frustrated and it will not improve their academic performance. A better solution is an optional summer school or tutoring program students can take if they need it. That way those students can get the help they need and the other students won't have to do work that will not benefit them in any way. Thank you so much for reading my point of view and trying to do the best for me, my school and the district. Molly Brannon. Hello, I am a third district resident and parent of two children at Linwood Holton Elementary School. I support the proposed RPS calendar changes as I believe it will especially benefit those students who need extra support and care. Meredith Thompson. Let's recap. Last July, the school board voted 6-3 for the administration to present in September year-round calendar options with a quote S as in more than one option. September was seven months ago. Now here we are in March and the administration has brought one option for year round school and there are no alternative calendars to be considered. Public comment against the year round school to begin in four short months has been overwhelming. Yet to further the propaganda and under the guise of public outreach, this week Mr. Cameras and his PR department held short calendar conversations through social media rather than public hearings so that they can control the narrative, cherry pick questions, and limit public feedback. They have branded this calendar the equity calendar, implying if you do not support this calendar to begin in four short months, then you are not for equity. This is an effort to silence genu genuine engagement by parent teacher and students of RPS. The reopening dashboard that the school board and public have been requesting for months has been placed on the agenda tonight below the vote regarding the year-round school. Are you really going to vote for a year-round school to begin in four months before you see the dashboard that details what has and has not been completed in the school buildings that you have kept your children out of for an entire year? Imagine the egg on your face if all these buildings are not ready by July and by ready, I mean in accordance with CDC guidance to safely reopen schools. Please study the successes and many failures of year-round schools elsewhere. Apply for the grant for a year of planning and a year-round school calendar offered by VDOE that Dr. Lane mentioned at your meeting two weeks ago. In short, do not waste this money rushing into this expensive calendar without proper research and planning, as well as extensive community engagement and feedback. Stop playing politics with our children's futures in the hopes of a flashy headline. Samantha Green. My name is Samantha Green. I'm a sophomore at Tufts University studying psychology and urban planning and as a former student uh, and a former student of Richmond Public Schools. I feel compelled to write this email because I have heard about Superintendent Cameras' proposal for the switch to year-round schooling. I have a younger brother who is currently a freshman at Richmond Community High School as well as a strong appreciation for the city of Richmond. And this proposal makes me incredibly concerned for the well being of both of those. From what I've learned from beginning to study urban planning, I think this proposal is detrimental to the health of the city because it is inconsiderate of class differences and heavily lends itself to ableist and racist disparate impacts. 
Changing the school schedule this late into the calendar is insensitive and unfair to students, teachers, and faculty who have already committed to jobs during the summer. Additionally, it poses a real problem for parents who cannot afford to take time off work or pay for childcare during the proposed four two-week breaks. From what I understand about the accompanying boost program for students who need extra help, however, which includes an early extra early July start and a change in timing of intercessions for members of the program, it comes off as a way to physically and emotionally separate kids based on academic performance. I do not think that non-optional additional schooling for just some of the student body is a good look for our city school system. In fact, I think it is incredibly divisive to the sense of community within schools and detrimental to students' self-worth and mental health. More importantly, implementing year-round schooling this coming year is not a step that will provide students with the support they need right now at the end of a pandemic that has lasted a year, nor will it better equip them with the social and academic environment they need to become healthy, happy, involved members of the Richmond community in the future. I'm also writing with concerns for my brother, who has yeah. never seen Claire Respa. I doubt that a calendar thrown together in four months while simultaneously juggling pandemic preparedness will fare better than the eight schools in this paper. The link is provided. Emily Bauer. I oppose the year-round calendar for the 21-20 school year and any other school year. Here are my top three reasons. One, it is a disgrace that RPS has no plans on bringing more kids back this spring. 800 out of 21,000 is nothing. Every other should be made to bringing back the most vulnerable back to school now. I urge you to consider all learning disabilities, all English learners, and all K2. All discussions that aren't about bringing these kids back are a distraction. Two, your round calendar does nothing for 16,000 students or three and four. 16,000 students and their families will be impacted negatively. It will be very hard to establish a routine and learn anything, especially in November and March. Three, year-round calendar places more burden on working parents, especially working moms. People that don't have grandparents nearby will be expected to take off work at odd times. There are no camps or daycare set up since no other county follows this. Letitia Irby. My name is Letitia Irby, mother of four RPS students, hashtag Team Summerhill Preschool, Jail, Francis Elementary, and River City Middle School. As I was looking over the year-round calendar that you have shown at the 8th and 9th District Community Conversation and this past Sunday at the Southside Community Conversation, thank you for having that. Big shout out to my two board members, John Page and Nicole Jones, for hearing us out. And by the way, I am for the year-round calendar, but I do have some concerns. One, will preschool and kindergarten registration month change? Since the year-round calendar starts in August and not September, because for registration, you have to be three or four years old by September 30th, and for kindergarten registration, you have to be five years old by September 30th. So will it be the same or will it change? Two, what about the students who are ahead and will possibly be bored in class? How will year round feel for them? Will they get extra breaks or more challenging work? Three, last but not least, will the bell schedule change or will the bell schedule stay the same? Because as for virtual learning, my middle schooler's bell schedule is so long, so much screen time that I believe it affects their eyesight. And I'm not even gonna start with a 30 minute lunch break but let me start. Having five kids and making lunches for four students. It's a lot of work and that time goes by so fast. Most times they don't even finish their lunch. Some of my children eat lunch and some catch up on their work and that's their 30 minute break. So my children and I have to decide whether to eat lunch or catch up on schoolwork. That's a very touch, tough decision for either of us to make. An extra 30 minutes added to lunch will help alleviate that stress. Thank you. Nicole Glover. First, let me thank each of you for your time and service to the students and staff of Richmond Public Schools. As an educator for RPS, I am deeply offended that our social, emotion, social and emotional well-being has been brushed aside with little to no consideration. When the school year began, we were asked to teach with love and grace. However, that has not been reciprocated. Teachers are putting in more hours and personal time to ensure lessons are engaging and aligned 
all while continuing to build relationships and nurture the whole child. It is my belief that after being in a virtual setting for over a year, teachers and students need to be able to readjust slowly. A change to a form of a year-round calendar simply adds more stress and unknowns. As a governing body, you must consider how COVID-19 affected staffs and students with the same fidelity. Some of the unknowns include not knowing how we will be expected to teach next year with both virtual and in-person learning. Will it be simultaneously? How lunch will look with two different instructional models? Will the current synchronous and asynchronous model be used? And not to mention the increased or decreased class sizes. The study provided from JLARC regarding year-round schools is almost 10 years old. I would like to see Superintendent Cameras provide us with more recent data that includes which school districts in the 2012 study are still operating on a year-round calendar? Have those districts implemented year-round to all schools within their districts? What programs or curriculum are being used? Are the intercessions only available to select students? And are the intercessions optional or required? While participating in the town hall meeting on Sunday, March 14th, this was the first mention of changing the school start and end time for high schoolers. As we try to process the discussion on a year-round calendar, now we are being asked to digest that our work hours may change. It is my opinion that the leader, Stephanie, Saccone, and family. Hello, as a family in the Richmond public school system, we strongly support the extended calendar and feel that it will be very beneficial to our students. Thank you. Jeannie Bowker. July 2020, the board and superintendent agree Mr. Cameras will present a year-round calendar, YRC, among many options by September to have the calendar decided in December. December 2020, only one YRC option is presented based on findings cherry-picked from a JLARC study. January 2021, the same year-round calendar is presented with modifications during budget presentations and public panic over the superintendent's contract after a leak to the Richmond Free Press. February 16th, debut of a decidedly non-scientific and unreliable parent, caregiver, and teacher survey on the year-round calendar. March 8th through March 14th, hosting of four town halls to an audience of roughly 500 total, not unique, attendees. March 12th, Superintendent Cameras appears on NPR to promote the year-round school. RPS holds a press conference announcing expected donations to pay third parties, third parties to provide childcare services for the year-round calendar. March 15th, vote on the year-round calendar. This is not an equitable process to undergo a change of this magnitude. The calendar change must be grounded in robust community awareness and support, not last minute pro forma engagement in PR. From February 16th to the last board meeting, there were 147 <clears throat> public comments asking to delay implementing year round school or to not implement it at all. Many of these comments cite teacher and student mental health, the short notice of this change, and a desire that the administration focus on reopening schools in the fall first. Teachers, staff, and students have been superheroes and reinvented the education wheel a thousand times over since COVID. Please listen to them when they say they are tired and four months from now is not the time for shift to a new calendar. Even superheroes need to rest. I'm going to take a sip of water. Thank you. Robin Timmons, our family strongly urges you to vote against the proposed year-round schedule. The data does not support such a drastic change. Please see the below data. Our money would be better spent decreasing class size, hiring additional specialists for each school, and providing additional PD for our teachers. At the very least, please vote to delay a decision for or against year-round school so that we may all focus on safely reopening our schools. Thank you. And I will read some of the data. A revisit of Virginia schools studied in the JLARC 2012 report, Review of Year-Round Schools Using Current VDOE. Year-round schedules do not appear to have a positive impact on student achievement. Key findings. Out of nine year-round schools in the 2012 JLARC Virginia study, only four have remained as year-round schools. All others have reverted to a traditional calendar. Of those four schools, only one, William Bass Elementary School in Lynchburg, Virginia, 
has higher student academic achievement, including a higher achievement level, less gap for students of color than their traditional schedule counterpart comparison school. The other three remaining Virginia round schools in the study all have lower overall student academic achievement, including a lower achievement level, greater gap for students of color than their traditional schedule counterpart comparison school. Beth Medvedev. I'm very concerned that I've heard nothing about preparations to get kids back in person successfully in the fall. If the reason for year-round schools is because of the academic loss due to virtual learning, then where is the work towards getting us ready to go back? That should unequivocally be the main focus of anything this board is doing right now. I feel the discussion and resources focused on year-round is a smokescreen for failure to get the district ready for in-person learning. Sarah Beth Kawugle, I apologize if I mispronounced that. Please consider waiting until the 22-23 school year before adopting a year-round calendar. The students, parents, and teachers will all benefit from a full summer break. We need to consider everyone's mental and emotional well-being in addition to their academic needs. Additionally, we need to assure families and staff that the buildings are at their safest for our return, and this seems most realistically achieved for a September start. Naomi Hill. Year-round school is a big no. Students want to enjoy their summer, and yes, we would get more breaks throughout the year, but we can't go out in the middle of winter on a bike ride, and that's something we could do with summer. Also, do you think any of the kids would like this? You probably don't even care what we want. You're taking away our lives like this. Virtual school is hard enough, but taking away our summer is going to make it much worse. I hope you choose to keep school the same. Katherine Irby. Our family strongly urges you to vote against the proposed year-round schedule at this time. The data does not support the success of such a drastic change. Please, please focus on safely getting our children back into the classroom. We have the lowest graduation rates in the state, we have the lowest test scores in the state, and we are only one of two districts fully virtual. Shame on you. Get these poor children back in the building to learn like we know children should learn. My daughter's first grade teacher sent an email today saying they are possibly going to only three days a week of instruction and two days asynchronous learning for seven-year-old children. The term asynchronous learning needs to be thrown out the window for first grade. Once again, shame on you. Coretta Atkins. Most of the children who will be selected for the equity calendar are not living in an equity world. Families are faced with limited access to healthy food choices, socioeconomic inequities, unhealthy substandard school buildings, and so much more that impacts student learning and health. It's bigger than extra days in school. I would ask that the RPS family also consider reducing the amount of testing students are faced with and make space for an increase in meaningful and authentic learning time. Perhaps this would decrease the potential of learning loss and instead increase literacy, critical thinking skills, and give students the opportunity to be active participants in their learning process. Also, and I know this does not only apply to RPS, but wouldn't it be nice if teachers were compensated properly and did not need a $10,000 incentive to supplement their income? Beth Greenberg Knox. As a parent of two young RPS students, Edie Red and Summerhill Preschool, I am writing to you today to voice my concerns over the calendar proposal. Generally speaking, I do like a year-round schedule. However, I do not like this proposed calendar. It seems very hodgepodge and last minute. While I do understand that some children have fallen behind academically this year, I think that we need to look at all aspects of this decision. Teachers have undoubtedly worked harder than ever this year. Whether it be learning to navigate teaching virtually, engaging students, trying to build relationships with their students, and making sure that their students have everything that they need to succeed through the many school-wide distributions. Teachers and all school staff deserve a break more now than ever before. Let them breathe and unwind so they can be their best to resume in-person teaching. Families and caregivers have also worked harder than ever this year. I left two jobs in order to be home with my children this year for virtual school. I wouldn't change that for the world. They needed me, not just logistically, but emotionally. And it was important to me that we do this together. For me to show them that I support them and am invested in their education. I empathize with families who are in a different place than I am. I'm not ignorant to the fact that for some students, 
School service, possibly their only safe place, access to food, health care, and many other social services that are needed. I understand that for some families, their children may need the extra time in school, but I'm speaking up for my children because if I don't, no one else will. I feel that students have also worked harder this year, many just learning how to navigate online. For my daughter, who was in first grade, to adapt so gracefully to this new model was very fortunate. And for my preschooler to actually form a friendship with a child that he had only met virtually is incredible. Students have had to learn how to be more independent than ever this year and to truly own their education. We have all had different experiences during the pandemic and there is no doubt that my children, as most, have some social and emotional Hi. needs. Lions Hardy. I am an RPS parent in the first district. I support the year round calendar and would be fine with starting it in fall 21 or fall 22. I don't think there's a significant difference between starting it either year. And to me, the important thing is we know the dates for the 21-22 school year as soon as possible. It is very important that RPS partner with organizations such as YMCA and Parks and Rec to ensure there are affordable childcare options available for families during intercessions and other school breaks. Stuart Thompson. Mr. Cameras continues to misrepresent the final results of the study done on year-round schooling by the Virginia General Assembly. Has he just not done his research or is he intentionally omitting information to be misleading? The fact is, is that pre-pandemic, over half the schools in the JLARC study have reverted to a traditional calendar and all but one of the schools that continued with the year-round calendar are underperforming their traditional calendar counterparts, including a lower achievement level for students of color. The information is all there on the VDOE website for public consumption. Much of the misinformation campaign led by Mr. Cameras and his PR team are reminiscent for many of the pairing discussions during rezoning, but now let's contrast. During rezoning, we had a million public hearings about the millions of pairing plans for which we had no money. Now, regarding year-round school, we have had no public hearings about the one and only plan being considered for which we have $14 million to spend. Seems rather confusing, backwards, and disingenuous, doesn't it? Regarding the long-awaited reopening dashboard, surely the school board cannot vote on the year-round school calendar as an agenda item before this dashboard is presented. It would be irresponsible and irrational. Additionally, critical information remains either missing or vague to the point of being useless. Where are the timelines to completion and responsible parties noted? Presumably, it would be pretty helpful to know if these safety measures will be completed before the proposed first day of school prior to a vote to move the first day of school forward by weeks and weeks. Lastly, in the dashboard, how can classifications called completed and unplanned be lumped together in the very same column without distinction? It is not crucial for the school board and the public to know which items were completed which versus which were deemed unnecessary, why exactly they were deemed unnecessary and by whom. Excuse me, that was, is it not crucial? Not, it is not crucial. Elisha Brown. My name is Elisha Brown and I'm a fourth grader at Oak Grove Bellmead. School has been really hard for me this year and my siblings this school year. We have lost a lot of information and don't get much support at home besides Artie and Mary Kay. Your round school will help me be a better and stronger student. Ralph Chief Richardson. My name is Ralph Chief Richardson and I am a 10th grader at George With High School and I am in support of the year round calendar uh, school schedule. I have five other siblings that attend RPS schools. Virtual school has been a struggle for us. It has only set us back further. I think if you vote on this schedule, it allows for people like me and my siblings to catch up and feel long-term stability throughout the entire year. Cynthia Mankus, greetings. I appreciate the opportunity to once again address the board. As a 30 plus year RPS veteran, I have questions and concerns. I understand our students are struggling to learn virtually, but I also understand that we cannot continue to grasp ideas that make sense without having a complete and calculated plan to make it all work with precision and success. I'm not resistant to year-round school, but I am definitely against rushing into a decision without having the time to plan and apply it carefully. 
We saw this with the rollout of this new awesome curriculum, even though we didn't have all the parts and pieces to in place, not to mention it not being aligned with the Virginia state standards. We are a year into a worldwide pandemic and to continue and continue to float in uncharted waters. We have a new curriculum that in theory may be an awesome program, perhaps no, not so much for virtual learning. We have old decaying buildings and some nice new state-of-the-art schools that have spent a year locked down with only recently having work started to fix that which was broken long before the pandemic hit. Our students deserve better, not in words, but in action. Please take the time to truly come up with a calculated plan. Please make sure our buildings are updated prior to bringing us back. Please make sure thought and precision is given to our return prior to calling for our move back to in-person. I plead with all of you, our honored school board members, to please not react quickly, make a change without putting a defined process in order. Again, I acknowledge that our students and teachers are struggling. I am reminded of that every day as I work hard to engage my students and provide quality instruction with limited parental support. I can't teach if students are not present. I can't teach if students have so much chaos surrounding them in their home environments. I cannot teach students whose parents remain asleep while our students attempt to participate by also providing childcare to their younger siblings. Arjane Avula. My name is Arjane Avula and I'm the oldest sibling of six kids that attended Richmond Public Schools. I believe that the school board school should vote on year-round school for multiple reasons. It gives underserved and less resourced kids an opportunity to grow academically with a constant in class and out of class support systems that are being put in place. Also it gives kids a chance to experience stability in school in a way they feel comfortable with being challenged. Y'all should just vote yes on this. Tarnicia Richardson. My name is Tar. Inchia Richardson, and I am the mother of six RPS kids. I am in full support of the year-round calendar. My kids attend Oak Grove, Bellmead, Bouchal, and George Wythe. I'm not going to beat around the bush. I don't know the ins and outs around year-round calendar, but I do know that everything that I know has been good for my kids and other RPS students. Christopher Irby, Jr. Hello, my name is Christopher Irby Jr. and I am a seventh grader at River City Middle School, home of the Red Tails. I am emailing on behalf of myself and my three other brothers, Lamar, Elijah, and Emmanuel Irby. We all have a question. One, Lamar. Yes, year round is okay, because I did have year round at my previous school. But this has been sitting heavy on me. Like RPS is talking about opening up now because the government said March 15th for all schools to be open. Or is RPS saying after spring break, we will go back in April? Or if y'all vote yes on the year round calendar, will we all be going back in August? But I have a question. How will we know if it's safe to go back into the school buildings? If y'all don't even have in-person or face-to-face -face or six feet apart meetings, you're all always on Zoom or Facebook Live or any online meeting, but never in person. But y'all want us to go back into the buildings? Sorry, but I say no. To going back in the school's buildings, it's not safe. Some and a lot of the school buildings need lots of work done. And I pray over the year that we were all out of the buildings that Y'all have at least gotten some of the work done. Not sure if you have or not, because I have not seen or heard anything going on inside of the buildings. But thank you for my new school, River City Middle. I wish all Richmond Public Schools were all new buildings. Thank you for the time to read my email from your proud students. Shayla Riggs. I am a teacher with RPS schools. I love the year-round school model, but pushing this year-round calendar through during an ongoing pandemic with no regard or planning for whether schools will be physically safe is irresponsible and quite frankly seems like posturing, virtue signaling on cameras' part, not to mention that kids and staff badly need a break after a long, difficult year. Tejas Patel. I had the opportunity to look at the reopening dashboard this morning. If this is how little has been accomplished in the last two months, 
12 months, excuse me, then RPS will need to commit all of its time and energy to safe reopening and not a calendar with optional intercessions. Hold the razzle dazzle and complete the basics. Lars and Kimberly Bolton. It appears a foregone conclusion that this body will move forward with the transition to a completely new calendar, a mere five months before the start of school, a school year that itself presents unprecedented challenges in safely reopening facilities for in-person instruction. While disappointed with the manner in which this decision's timeline has been undertaken and the show of community engagement at the end of the day, we just want the children safely back in person instruction. We again urge for focus to remain on that task. Please do not lose sight of the main objective. While other schools have worked on concrete reopening plans, RPS is still working on the creation of a dashboard. There is no excuse. This body needs to double down on drafting a specific detailed reopening plan. Kristen Dutton. Thank you for continuing to push the administration to provide a clear dashboard for reopening. I hope that what the administration shares tonight has details, action items, accountable parties, and timelines against which progress is reported. Short of that, there is no plan. Vague categories and bullet points aren't going to get windows fixed, janitors hired, and HVACs updated. Also, I attended many of the community conversations around year-round school last week. To call it a conversation is a misnomer. The vast majority of the lamentably short meetings were spent presenting the calendar and then answering clarifying questions. There was no time for feedback. Questions were cut off with dozens and dozens and dozens left unanswered. Rezoning was a beast and I'd never wish that process on anyone. Thank you to last year's reps and Mr. Cameras for holding so many in-person meetings and public hearings, specifically Ms. Dorr in our district for countless living room chats. But this $14 million investment in calendar change warrant more than one-sided presentations. They deserve true public hearings. Sure, it may be virtual, but people should be allowed to get in line and have their voices heard. In one of the conversations, Dr. Harris in the Office of Community Engagement admitted that she wished there was more time. Well, then make more time. Do parents want this change? Do teachers want this change? Can you pull this off while ensuring our schools reopen safely in the fall. Unfortunately, the flawed survey, Mr. Cameras' logic is yes, the survey was flawed, but so are our others. And limited community conversations have not provided clarity on what communities actually want. I do not believe you should vote tonight to implement year round schools that start in four months. Take time to engage the community and ensure all voices are heard. If you are voting to implement year round school, Please do it for fiscal year 23 and take the time to do it properly and rooted in community feedback. T. Harris, I am a veteran Richmond public schools teacher and I urge you to vote no on the proposed year round school schedule starting in July 2021-22. Please use this time to make sure the buildings can reopen safely in September and to give students and staff a regular school year to readjust in-person learning. Please postpone implementing any major changes this coming year. Any major changes, including your round school, should only be considered beginning in the 22-23 school year. Autumn Yeager. Hello, I just wanted to say how I feel about school. Um, I feel if y'all want to give us days in school, you might have to change the times because of the simple fact that we feel like we take tests, we get up early, we're tired and we do all the work and teachers say, oh, we're going to be easy on you, but it is not all easy. Harold Fitcher, I write today to support the superintendent's equity calendar. These last 12 months have presented extreme challenges across our city. We witnessed protests in our streets and across the country and recognized the voices of marginalized citizens that had long been silenced. We experienced long-term school closures and grieved for job losses, housing losses, and the loss of fathers, mothers, brothers, sisters, and friends who died from a virus we had never heard of one short year ago. But this is America. We come back strong. Schools must come back better than before. We can all acknowledge the inequities and gaps in our systems, made stark even within our local community, and we must do better for our children now. The equity calendar is one way to move our commitment to students forward. 
While it is not a silver bullet, research tells us that a year-round schedule with additional targeted intercessions holds great promise. I believe it is a positive step forward in our obligation for equitable outcomes for our children. Anna Marie Heaton. I am a parent of a current second grader and rising kindergartner at Linwood Holton Elementary School. I appreciate the time and effort that Superintendent Cameras and Dr. Harris put forth to deliver and communicate an ambitious year round calendar. It not only benefits the 5,000 students identified as needing extra attention from time loss at the beginning of this pandemic, but also the other students across the district. Given the summer learning loss or summer slide that already occurs at the beginning of each school year, I believe that it's particularly critical for the board to approve and adopt this calendar, excuse me, and I would further suggest that it be approved going forward after the 21-22 academic year. This is an excellent opportunity to support our students and our teachers during this unprecedented past year and moving forward, I see great benefit for our students. Shannon Hodges, good evening. Thank you for creating the dashboard to keep stakeholders up to date on the district's progress on a safe reopening of schools. I look forward to seeing a more fleshed out dashboard or information this evening that provides more detail than plumbing work and general contractor work, making sure our school buildings are ready and that we have the supplies and staff needed for reopening is more important than implementing year round school for 21-22. When you fail to plan, you plan to fail. From what the community has been shown by RPS, it looks like both reopening and year-round school need more planning. Please focus on reopening in 21-22 and year-round school in 22-23. Pat Levy Lavelle, please do not pass year-round school for the upcoming school year. We need to ensure that everyone in the RPS community actually knows about this, including both the pros and cons. Likewise, we need to ensure that everyone has a meaningful chance to speak and critically to be heard on this. Additionally, we need to make sure the community supports are in place well in advance. This includes broad access to affordable daycare options for this non-traditional schedule to support working families in this change. Under this calendar, there are now different weeks where there is no school for the vast majority of RPS kids. Where do kids go while their parents work? Lastly, we should focus for this fall on in-person reopening to make it as safe as possible and with whatever building upgrades we can achieve. Laura, Laurel, excuse me, McDaniel. During this past year, we have endured many changes and changing our school schedule is the last thing we need to do at this point. It has been quite overwhelming for parents, kids, teenagers, and also teachers. We've had to adopt, adapt to a new learning environment and need to get things back to normal. Many people have lost their jobs due to COVID-19 and so many lives have been changed. Adding more change will make school harder for so many people. Families also want to spend time with people they love during summer and the new schedule will make this harder. Heather Cullen, I urge you not to adopt a year-round school schedule for next year. Please consider more planning to implement year-round schooling the following year. The pandemic has rocked my family hard. We are under a lot of stress and the added strain of a new schedule is making it even worse. Emily Surratt, I am writing today in opposition to the proposed calendar that is up for a vote during this evening's meeting. I oppose the possible approval of this calendar for a number of reasons. First and foremost, there truly wasn't enough time between the calendar being released and the scheduled board vote to gather the necessary parent, teacher, and student opinion and feedback about this calendar change. As it has been discussed in prior meetings and prior public comments, the survey was very subjective and didn't gather enough concrete and or valid information from those who filled it out. Town hall meetings were held only a week before the vote was scheduled. The planning and execution of gathering feedback should have been done better. Secondly, we are beginning to see the light at the end of the pandemic tunnel. Families are planning trips to see family over the summer, and I imagine some of these trips will take place in August when the first boost period is scheduled. The planning to welcome all students back to in-person learning in the fall is underway, I hope. Students are struggling very much with learning virtually and need a break. Parents and caregivers need a break. 
To change the calendar for the 21-22 school year would be to rob our students and their families of so much more than they've already lost in the past year. There are many other reasons why I do not think this calendar proposal should be pushed through, but we'll just end by saying that I would like to see other calendar proposals and I would like to see a pilot program put in place for one to three years to gather data to see if this will truly benefit our entire student population before changing the calendar for the district. Thank you for your time and service to our community. Denise Forte, thank you for the opportunity to submit testimony. The Education Trust is a national nonprofit that works to close opportunity gaps that disproportionately affect students of color and students from low income backgrounds. Through our research and advocacy, EdTrust supports efforts that expand excellence and equity in education from preschool through college, increase college access and completion, particularly for historically underserved students, engage diverse communities dedicated to education equity, and increase political and public will to act on equity issues. It has been one year since school buildings across the country first closed to the coronavirus pandemic. Despite some heroic and well-intentioned efforts to quickly adjust, there's no denying that students, some much more than others, have suffered from the absence of in-person learning. A study from McKinsey indicated that students of color are disproportionately impacted. They could be six to 12 months behind by the end of June, 2021. As school buildings reopen and in-person learning resumes, District and school leaders must do all they can to help students, especially the most vulnerable students, complete the unfinished learning exacerbated by the pandemic. Without targeted evidence-based interventions and opportunities to accelerate learning, both high achieving students who do not have the opportunity to engage in more rigorous curriculum and the many students who are experiencing unfinished learning are at risk of disengagement and may not have the opportunity to graduate college and career ready. We are urging districts to ensure high performing students and students experienced un experiencing unfinished learning have access to the opportunities and supports they need. This is especially true for students of color and students from low income backgrounds in Richmond Public Schools where too many students were already lacking access to the opportunity. Mm -hmm. Kara Stupp, I think there are several issues in play right now. They should be separated and voted on separately by the school board. Number one, when can students and which groups of students begin to return safely to school buildings for in-person instruction, vaccination, fully prepared buildings, and fully developed plans to maintain CDC guidelines are necessary for everyone's health and safety. Right now, the federal government is estimating it to be sometime in autumn 2021 for teenagers and sometime in 2022 for younger children to be approved for vaccination. Two, one of my children has been greatly benefited by virtual school. Virtual school has, quote, leveled the playing field for many of the challenges that in-person school cannot mitigate enough. Can we look at a permanent RPS virtual school program, perhaps more of a hybrid program with some in-person services? I think this may also be a good option for many of the alternative programs as well. Three, are families and staff in favor of spreading out the 180 day school year calendar to have more or longer breaks throughout the school year for the 21-22 school year or to begin in the 22-23 school year? Four, can we see more development of the boost intercession program for more students or would it be better to focus the federal monies on investment in more reading and math interventions and more staff? I'm absolutely in favor of doing something major to improve the literacy and math skills of every single RPS student. I believe this is the biggest hurdle our students have in accessing all of the benefits of their education. Shannon Dowling. Thank you for listening to our comments tonight. I am sure they will be overwhelming and the meeting will be a long one. Thank you for all that you do to represent our families. I urge the school board to vote against year-round school for the 21-22 school year. Please don't buy into the false narrative of learning loss. Our students have grown in so many ways this year, not only in ways that can be tested by Pearson. As Secretary Cordona said at 
South by Southwest last week, quote, we teach kids before curriculum. We have to meet them where they are, end quote. Our students have experienced trauma. Our teachers have experienced trauma. They are running on fumes right now. Our families have experienced trauma. We need a break. Year-round school may be a good future idea, but now is not the time. At a town hall last week, I asked Cameras about Petersburg's foray into year-round schools and what we learned from their journey that we could use to improve ours. He claimed to know nothing about Petersburg and pivoted to intercessions. Mr. Cameras, if you know nothing about how our neighbors implemented year-round schools and failed, then shame on you for not researching ideas thoroughly before presenting them. Using grant money from the state, the same grant money RPS has mentioned, Petersburg implemented a year-round school calendar with intercessions exactly as RPS set up. Their test scores improved over three years, but it turns out that was not the result of year-round school, not the result of intercessions, but the result of cheating. Teachers and administrators lost their jobs. Students lost their trust in the adults that care for them. We have had this situation in RPS before. It's too fresh. Let's not jump back into high stakes situation. Real authentic learning and social emotional learning are more important than money. Also, I am sure that everyone has heard Mr. Cameras mention the JLARC study because no one at RPS followed up on the research. Emily Cavanaugh. Bipolar ionization is not a proven effective measure against COVID-19. Let's not spend millions of dollars on what is the quote, herbal life of air purification. The CDC does not recommend this as a valid mitigation tool against COVID-19. Please read this article on bipolar ionization in schools. Also see, I can read the titles. Personal air purifier ionization devices have been sold to the public for some time, but according to the Mayo Clinic, they are generally not beneficial and can exacerbate symptoms of asthma due to the creation of ozone in the air. Finally, quote, while school districts are probably not putting their pupils at much risk by installing bipolar ionization devices, they're likely not making them any safer from COVID-19 either and wasting millions of dollars in the process. You must do more research. The fact that a handful of other facilities and programs use this technology does not give it legitimacy. Ruth Green, as you consider the proposal for the new calendar and new programs before you tonight, please consider the following issues. This vast change to be imposed with only a few months notice after the disruptive and isolating change the ex students experienced for the past year has the potential to do more harm than good practical concerns. Implementing this calendar in a one-size-fits-all method for all schools and grades with so little notice creates an undue hardship and will ultimately weaken the school system. The criteria for determining who will make up the 5,000 kids selected for Jumpstart and Boost has not even been made yet, as we were first advised on Wednesday night in the only public discussion on this topic. By the time it is made, presumably by teachers who are already working to educate our kids virtually, and administered to find out who meets these criteria, those 5,000 kids may only have a few weeks notice that they have been selected. What if they had secured a summer job and their family was counting on that income? In fact, any teacher who was planning on having a summer job, as many of us did all through high school, will be out of luck. Employers will have plenty of kids to choose from who can work the entire summer, as RPS kids will be the only ones in all of Central Virginia to have this new calendar imposed upon them. Where did the number 5,000 come from? Do we know that only 20% of our students will need extra help catching up after an entire year of virtual learning? Have any of you tried to do a biology lab on the computer? What about kids who don't meet the as yet undetermined qualifications for Jumpstart or Boost? Will there still be summer school for kids who need help in one or two subjects? What will be taught in Jumpstart and Boost? We don't know. The curriculum has yet to be made. When this is, when will this be done and how will we know what the subject matter should look like since we don't have time to get any real data? What will the kids who are not in Jumpstart and Boost programs? Hi. Katie Noland. 
Two things have been made abundantly clear over the last few weeks since the idea of switching RPS to a year-round school calendar have been made public. One, that public opinion and teacher sentiment does not factor into the decisions being made about our school calendar. This is made obvious by the fact that despite plenty of well-reasoned opposition and skepticism from your constituents, nothing has been done to address those concerns and the school board and superintendent continue to push forward with the idea of year-round schooling for this coming school year. Two, that if you as a school board member tonight vote in favor of a year-round calendar for the upcoming school year, that you do not vote in line with your constituents. This is evidenced by the fact that despite receiving endless emails, phone calls, Facebook comments, and more from the very people who this plain plan will directly affect, all with very sound logic, questions, concerns, and requests for a more fully vetted process, you will choose to vote in favor of year-round schooling anyway. If year-round schooling is passed for next year, ultimately this means that the school board and the superintendent believe they know what is best for their constituents, even when their constituents are telling them the opposite. School board members and superintendent cameras. While you all are strategizing over alliances, voting blocks, and flashing headli flashy headlines and NPR pieces, our children still sit at home, faithfully logging on to yet another Zoom math lesson and virtual gym class, without the assurance that their schools will even be ready for them to return next year. Please stop the politics and just focus on getting our kids back to school in person next September. Megan McPherson. My concern with year-round schooling is that we are not ready for it. I would like to see a focus on returning safely instead of rushing because there is a concern that students are behind. Dave Noland. I am an RPS parent and I am opposed to the year-round calendar for this coming year. Despite plenty of well-reasoned opposition from your constituents, you continue to push forward with your idea for year-round schooling. I am respectfully asking that you please vote no on year-round schooling for this coming year and simply focus on getting an actual plan in place for our students' return to school in the fall. Vicki Cavanaugh, please do not spend millions of dollars on potentially ineffective measures such as bipolar ionization when there are so many necessary improvements that could be done with those funds right now that would achieve measurable improvements in the air quality and overall health and safety of our students. Zach Grant, I am against the proposed year round calendar as I believe the potential gains made from this calendar will be undermined by the ever increasing issue of stress, fatigue and trauma stemming from this pandemic. Transitioning to a year-round calendar would have what I imagine will be a detrimental effect on families and their dynamics as they again rush to find available and affordable childcare, alter work-life structure, rework finances, and continue to grind. We have asked a lot of students and their families, as well as the teachers and staff who have supported them day in and day out since our schools have reopened for distance learning, and I think an honest assessment would reveal that the expectations held against the aforementioned have been ambitious, if not unrealistic. They have risen to the occasion and have fought admirably, but I'm left wondering what the cost from a mental health perspective is to date and what it will be if we continue to push them further. Everyone, everyone is exhausted and we're only mid-March at this point. Ask yourselves this, do the potential gains in learning for some outweigh the need for rest and recovery for so many? T. Ellis, I am a teacher within RPS, and while I appreciate the idea of a year-round schedule to help our students catch up, I do not believe that this is not the time. I, for one, am ready to get back into the building and teach my students face-to-face. -face. I'm ready to go back to a safe building with a strong and full custodial staff and ample cleaning supplies that will last the whole year. I believe the effort should be placed on a safe return this fall, not this July. In addition, many teachers live in neighboring counties who will be on a different schedule. They will face childcare issues as camps and things have already begun filling up. Secondly, I taught in Petersburg the first year they implemented a year-round program and it was not a good, it was not good. There was so much testing to prove that the program was working, but it left little time for the teachers to actually teach. The two-week intercessions were not well thought out and it was a waste of resources. 
So we don't wanna repeat the same mistakes with a rushed program. Let's take our time, get a team together to plan this year for a successful year-round program next year. We need to focus on more pressing issues this year in addition to opening the buildings for face-to-face -face instruction, such as building relations with all our students and parents, starting parental education programs, using our community partners to provide after-school enrichment activities that will bridge some of these achievement gaps, transportation, dinner, and childcare to help get parents to come to the buildings for programs and conferences, and community service projects for our most troubled students. Jill Henrisu, I apologize if I mispronounce the last name. As the parent of a special needs child with an IEP, I do not support the year round school calendar, especially this coming school year. The very children the administration is proposing to provide extra support through a summer jumpstart in their sessions are the very children that could be hurt the most if year round school should fail. Do not rush this with only four months to fully prepare. Take time to properly vet the planning and funding necessary for a year-round school calendar. Catherine Schenk, I'm worried the board is going to wait, I'm sorry, I'm worried the board is going to vote to adopt this calendar for the upcoming school year against most constituents' wishes to wait. Give families more time to plan, give students and teachers more time to rest this summer, and give employees time to look elsewhere if needed. Moving forward with this is foolish and needs to wait until next year, if at all. Alan Sturgis, I wanna thank the school board, the superintendent and the administration for their tireless efforts in coming up with this schedule while including feedback from community members. A lot has changed in the past year and the future change is inevitable. The future is bright. I would like to submit this quote from Arthur Ashe. Quote, most people resist change, even when it promises to be for the better, but change will come. And if you acknowledge the simple but indisputable fact of life and understand that you must adjust to all change, then you will have a head start. Lila Field. I am an eighth grade student at Binford Middle School and I am writing to express my opinion about the proposed calendar change for next year. I believe that many things need to be fixed before year round school is appropriate. For example, when it gets hot in my classrooms at Binford, the window air conditioning makes it impossible for me to hear my teacher, but if we turn it off, we're all miserable. We're all exhausted from a year of learning at home and another change would greatly affect students' mental health. Please let us have a normal year. Sarah and Tim Hendricks. I'm the mother of two children at Holton Elementary School. My husband, Tim and I are opposed to the possibility of year round schools and RPS in the upcoming calendar year. Please, 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 we beg you to put all of your time and money into making sure that our buildings are ready and safe for our schools to open in September 2021. We're not completely opposed to the year-round school, but it takes a lot of time and planning. Four months is not enough time to focus efforts on opening schools safely and making sure year-round school is ready to go. Please focus on doing one thing really well instead of two things halfway. Focus on reopening with love and safety. Thank you for your consideration. Mike and Ann Jones. We stand opposed to the year round solution, a solution both draconian and overly inflated. Draconian because the end of the problem, the pandemic is in sight and schools can be back to normal operations in fall 2021. Also draconian because it further establishes the school system as having to quote parent the student. Where's the accountability on the other end? In fact, our child has excelled in virtual learning this past year. Overly inflated because many studies have shown only slight or negligible gains from year-round schooling. We believe a child needs time out of the classroom as much as in, and glorious summers vacationing and exploring the outdoors are part of that. Vote no on year-round schooling. Casey Lucier. I write to support the proposed calendar and look forward to hopefully its implementation in connection with our return to in-person school this fall. I'm a parent of two elementary school children at Fox Elementary. If my children are invited to participate in the intercessions, then I will certainly enroll them. And if not, I'm still pleased with the modifications to the calendar for my own family 
and I am happy to see RPS implementing these changes to address structural inequities as well as to overcome the disparate impacts of the last year's virtual schooling. We will need bold thinking and courageous leadership to address our children's needs when we return post-pandemic, and I hope the adoption of the administration's proposal <clears throat> will be a step in that direction as we return to school. Andrea Bryant. Happy almost spring, school board and admin. While testing is a way that folks measure student achievement and learning, it is not the only way. As a proud RPS teacher, I am feeling beat down by all of these forms of testing, and my students are as well. From elementary to secondary, tests are hindering student learning by affecting instructional time and students' mental stamina. We are in a pandemic, and many students had to withstand five or six weeks of testing from PALS to MAP to mock SOLs, and now there is a survey, which is basically another test to our students. If we are going to keep the main thing the main thing, which is supposed to be student achievement, we have to evaluate our testing practices, especially during a pandemic, but during every school year. This exact thing happened last year as well. Have a great day and thanks for all of your hard work. I'm not sure if this comment- You submitted two comments and I combined them. I see. Okay, I was gonna say the ex so a, a separate thought, but the same person. I'm very indifferent to the year round calendar, but I am concerned with the lack of complete transparency with the way this is being handled. One, the survey was rolled out at 5 p.m., an hour before a school board meeting where it was being discussed. Two, the survey did not log data on who was taking it or offer some way to limit people from taking it more than once to provide accurate data. I didn't take the survey more than once, but I clicked the link and could take it as many times as I wanted. Three, we have only been offered one option that has changed once due to some feedback. Four, all stakeholders seem like they haven't been involved. Was there any communication to families beyond Zoom links, texts, or emails? What about postcards with return postage to submit votes? What about letters to families? This may seem outdated, but it still reaches more families than the internet right now. Transparency is having as many stakeholders as possible. Kelly Cannon, I am a first grade parent at Westover Hills and a resident of the fourth district. I strongly support the proposed calendar change. This is an impactful way to leverage federal funds to jumpstart the COVID-19 recovery period after more than a year away from school. It also presents a unique opportunity to pilot a long-term strategy to support students' ongoing academic success. Please vote yes for the proposed calendar. Lori Kreckman, I believe that the draft reopening dashboard on board docs proves that RPS requires every little bit of funding that is needed to get our facilities ready for in-person learning. It is utterly apparent that more time, money, and resources are required to get our buildings ready for CDC standards. Please stop this calendar discussion immediately and focus on what is within your grasp for our children's sake. Anything less than full focus on facilities is egregious and only serves talking points and not real needs. Emily Starrett, as a parent to current kindergarten and third grade students, I wholeheartedly oppose the idea of implementing a year round school model this fall. Our families, students and teachers have had enough change and chaos for one year. Please let us spend our limited time and resources on getting our facilities up and running for in-person learning September. There must be simpler, more effective, and less disruptive means to help our most vulnerable students. Erin Kachinko Willis. I'm a teacher at Bouchal Middle School, and I am completely opposed to the year-round calendar. When we are in person, I teach in a windowless room that reaches temperatures in the mid-80s while the heat is on in the winter. Moldy, wet ceiling tiles regularly fall from the ceiling in the hallways despite being replaced yearly. Staff was told there were upgrades being made to the buildings during this year of virtual teaching, but in February, Mr. Cameras himself said that all of the necessary upgrades wouldn't be complete by July. How can we even consider voting on a year-round option when there isn't a solid plan in place to return in person next school year? School board, please don't be swayed by the grant being offered to districts <clears throat> who transition to year-round school. There are more cost-effective and equitable ways to make up for learning loss 
than a calendar that only offers intercession enrollment to 5,000 students, less than 25% of RPS students. Justine Zinsky. There seems to be a good amount of unanswered questions that need to be answered via for a vote is taken to implement a year round schedule, especially when such change is meant to benefit 5,000 students will impact 25,000 plus staff. Mm -hmm. Is Madam that the two Chair, hour time? Yes, we've reached the two hour limit for public comment Thank you. tonight. Thank you so very much, Ms. Sadasco. My goodness, thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Lilly, as well. And to um, the letters that weren't read, please know, parents, our stakeholders, that we do have all the letters on um, board docs, including the ones that came in after one as well. So we can, as a board, read that. All right, colleagues, we did make an adjustment to the um, Agenda. So right now we'll move into, we said we didn't number it, 6.01, I believe, which is receive an update on spring 2021 reopening plan. Mr. Cameras. That's me. That's you, Ms. Nasco? It is. Who's that? Oh, yes. do you want, <clears throat> you okay? Uh, I am. I'm ready to pull it up. Thank you. Thank you so much. Would you like me to share it, Ms. Hidasco? Or... I'm, uh, I defer to you. I'm, I'm uh, happy for you to do so, or I'm happy for me to go. Your choice. Go ahead. <laughs> All right. Uh, good evening, Chair Burke, school board members. Um, I'm going to, Mr. Cameron, Jason, maybe you could just show it on your screen. Gotcha. While um, you're pulling that up, we do have a question, Mr. Young. I think. Um, yes, ma'am. All right, thank you. Dr. Harris Muhammad? Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, did we move the 4.01? Is that where we're, I'm, I'm a little confused. We no, when Mrs. When Ms. Gibson made her, um, did the amendment? I got it, I it got moved. it. It yes. moved, okay. yes, ma'am. Thank you. Right. I, we just, Yes, Ms. Lily said, don't worry about the numbering now. So that's, right. that's why she we did. So yep. then we'll thank go you. back to dreams for RPS. Thank you, thank you. All right, thank you. All right, yes, yes. this is, I remember evening, we were this on Mr. Dasko. Yes. Thank you. Um, so um, per the board's uh, vote at our last meeting, um, beginning on April 12th and through the rest of this school year, we'll be offering um, in-person learning opportunities for two groups of students. Um, again, to reiterate, that will be um, selected kindergarten through fifth grade students who are part of the intensive services program um, that's part of exceptional education and kindergarten uh, through um, well, early elementary um, English learners who have more significant English language acquisition needs. Um, those students will um, uh, receive the in-person learning at two of the sites that are currently being used for our facilitated learning centers, um, and those are Holton and Miles Jones. And these sites will follow the regular RPS calendar um, and the school day. So to provide a little bit more detail on the teachers and support staff that will be present, um, I think one of the most important things uh, to remember is that this is optional for our staff. So to begin with, we surveyed exceptional education teachers who currently work with students in the intensive supports program, as well as our ESL teachers to gauge their interest in teaching in person. And to date, we have 17 um, exceptional education teachers and 25 ESL teachers who have expressed interest. We'll be holding two information sessions with them this week to talk through um, the schedule, health and safety protocols, and to answer any questions so that they can make a final decision. In addition to teachers, there will be instructional assistance and behavior aids in the special education program to meet IEP requirements of students who might, might opt in, as well as bilingual tutors in the ESL program. One note, one distinction between these two groups of staff, our ESL teachers will continue to support other students who are not in person virtually, 
um, whereas our exceptional education teachers will only be working with their in-person students. Based on the number of teachers who opt in, so of those 17 exceptional education and 25 ESL teachers who have initially expressed interest, once we get the final count, that will determine our final student counts. Um, the ratio for our ESL classrooms will be one to 10, and then the ratio for exceptional education will be two to six, and that two includes the instructional um, assistant. So concurrently to in talking with our staff, we're also talking with our families. So we've identified 122 eligible students in exceptional education. Of those, a little under 50 have expressed interest in coming back in person. And of about 200 eligible students for the ESL program, about 90 have expressed interest to date. And we'll continue to call families um, just to determine interest. And again, we'll be able to anchor our final count based on um, our teacher opt-in. In terms of other site-based staff that will be present to support the program, um, we will have a site-based administrator um, that is not the principal of Holton or Miles Jones, um, but a different site-based administrator to ensure that day-to-day um, -day operations run smoothly. And we have already identified uh, two individuals for that who are willing to opt in. Um, we're currently working with and meeting with the site-based custodial staff to ensure um, their comfort with this increased level of in-person work, and if not, allow them opportunity to move to another placement um, and find custodians who um, would be comfortable working around students and people throughout the day. And then we're also working to identify substitutes um, as needed, um, lest someone uh, need to call out sick. Um, in terms of health and safety, um, you know, since we've had some uh, just in-person interactions, whether that's been distribution events or opening our building for families periodically throughout the week, um, we will continue um, a variety of robust health and safety protocols. Um, one of the, the more notable and certainly different ones for this opt-in program is that all staff who opt in must be vaccinated or in the process of becoming fully vaccinated. Um, and this is just important given where our community is um, right now uh, with transmission rate. We want to be able to uh, right now provide this additional assurance. Um, all staff and students will have their temperature checked each day upon arrival, as well as the CDC symptom checks. Masks will be required at all times for staff and for students, except when eating and of course during those periods, um, social distancing as it will throughout the day will, will of course be in place. Um, additional opportunities for hand washing um, will be scheduled throughout the day and hand sanitizer is available in every classroom, along with additional PPE, um, including plexiglass shields, gloves if needed, face shields if preferred. And face shields would of course be in addition to masks. Um, there will be signage throughout the wings of the building that will be used for this space, which um, are actually standard signage right now in the um, foyers and offices of all our buildings, which have symptom checks, reminders um, of stay home if you're not feeling well, as well as floor markers um, on the floor and on stairs for social distancing. We will have on-site dedicated nurses, um, both for possible COVID support but also because some of the students uh, may have other health-related needs, um, asthma, diabetes, et cetera, that need to be attended to throughout the day. Lest there is any type of COVID-related um, symptoms, an isolation room will be designated um, on site um, for students or staff. Won't be using water fountains, but we'll have other opportunities um, for students to have water and classrooms be fully cleaned um, each afternoon. High touch surfaces um, will receive more frequent cleaning throughout the day. Um, if there is a positive case um, uh, in our in-person site, um, we'll immediately utilize the isolation room. 
Contact tracking uh, would begin immediately, a process that our nurses and talent team um, have been implementing uh, all year. And then based on the level of exposure, um, next steps would be taken. Obviously, it is possible that the site would need to close uh, temporarily um, if there was more significant exposure. Um, other just important program components, um, breakfast and lunch uh, will be served, served within the classroom. And of course, once the students are identified, uh, normal school policies around food allergies and such and working with families um, will of course be, be determined. Um, transportation will be provided to participating families who are interested. We will again use contracted transportation. Um, once our student lists are finalized, we'll determine the number of routes and total cost. If the number of, uh, or the percentage of opt-in is anything similar to our regional schools, although not sure if it will be, that would be about 20% of, of families have opted into transportation. Um, of course, a, a family drop-off would be an option as well. Um, students will continue to bring their Chromebooks to the site each day. Um, we will get students Chromebook covers um, just as a way to prevent uh, possible damage during transmission, uh, transition from home um, back to the site each day. Um, because the Miles, Jones, and Holton site are also the YMCA's facilitated learning site, um, the YMCA um, has offered partnership to provide afternoon enrichment activities um, for all students. Um, as desired. And then in terms of facilities, these are two of our newer buildings. So um, repair and facility upgrades um, are certainly minimal in terms of need, but final bathroom repairs, um, as well as uh, bipolar ionization, uh, air quality work um, will be prioritized um, such that uh, it will be completed prior to, to April 12th. Um, I'll just, uh, the last slide is actually <clears throat> unrelated to uh, the two sites for the spring reopening, but was a secondary part of the school board's reopening plan. And that was to explore possible expansion at the uh, community partners uh, facilitated learning center sites. Um, I've pasted the language of our current MOU with YMCA, Peter Paul, and RBHA, um, which determined that the maximum number of, avail of available seats would be 100. Um, the three YMCA sites are closest uh, to 100. Um, and so we are recommending an amendment to allow up to 125 students um, at each site um, to help uh, expand that should there be parental interest. And I'll pause there for questions. Thank you, Ms. Hidasco. Mr. Young, do we have anyone listed? Dr. Harris Muhammad. Thank you, Dr. Harris Muhammad. The floor is yours. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have several questions. I can ask one at a time or give you all of them and then you can address them however you want to address that, Ms. Odesco? The Let's staff, do it one at a time. Okay. The staff that um, will not, well, how will we handle situations of staff who will not be vaccinated in August and September? So mm -hmm. I heard you make a comment about all staff must be vaccinated to participate um, in this opening program, reopening program. So how will we handle staff? And this may be a question for Mr. Cameron, so I'm not sure, but how will we handle the situation? What's the plan for those who do not get vaccinated and how are we collecting that data? Um, I'll let Mr. Cameron uh, respond given that's related to fall um, reopening. Yeah, just to <clears throat> just to clarify, Dr. Harris Muhammad, you're you're speaking about the fall, not the spring. Both actually, you have some that she, Ms. Adesco, if I'm not sh mistaken, indicated all staff have to be vaccinated or has been vaccinated to participate in, I guess, the K through five reopening in those centers. 
Okay, so how are we handling those individuals? How are we handling our staff? I don't want to use the word handle. That sounds so negative, but what is the plan? What's the situation? How will we deal with um, situations that arise when staff have not been vaccinated? So it's spring reopening, fall reopening. It's the same situation. So for spring, given the very limited numbers, um, we believe we would have enough staff who have been vaccinated, so that shouldn't be an issue. Uh, for the fall, this is something that we would ultimately bring to the board as, as part of our comprehensive reopening plan. Uh, my sense at this point is um, that while the vaccine uh, likely would not be required, in fact, uh, it can't be required uh, right now, given that the CDC has not officially approved the vaccines. They've all been approved as emergency vaccines. Uh, and so actually um, organizations aren't able to require them until that approval has been given. But even if that has been given by the time we reopen, um, my current thinking on this, though, of course, and we would discuss this, is that uh, we would strongly encourage, um, but perhaps not require. That being said, uh, folks would need to return to work um, and they would have to do so uh, at their own risk. Um, now we could implement a testing program uh, to ensure that they uh, were not uh, uh, positive for the virus when they came to the school and, and to protect others. Um, but that that's the current thinking. Again, we would put this together as part of our comprehensive reopening plan um, for the board to consider. Okay, thank you. My next question, I appreciate that. How many children are currently attending the centers, Peter Paul, YMCA um, and other centers? And how many new students are that are not in question number two that I just asked will be attending school as of April the 12th? So number two, how many children are currently attending those centers? Peter Paul, YMCA, and I believe that was the third one. Or RBHA. Third. Yeah, thank you. So yeah. how many are currently attending? Out of those students that are current that currently are attending, how many? new students are going to be a part of that program. Yep. So I'll go one at a time. So RBHA, which is referral only, currently has around 60. They do have a short waiting list um, and they are looking to increase their own staff there. Um, Peter Paul has probably on any given day closer to about um, six, 60 to 70 um, students attending. Uh, so they have space to go up to um, another 30 to 40 based on current parameters um, or if the board was to approve an MOU to go up to 125, um, there could be more new students. The three YMCA sites are closer to being full. Holton is full and already has a 15 student waiting list. Um, so they're at 100. Um, they could take 114 if the board was to approve them to go up to 125. Miles Jones is at 91. So they could take 10 more kids under the current parameters of the MOU, or if you extend it to 125, they could take 35 more kids. And uh, Huguenot was at about 75. So they could take up to 50 more students um, if the board approved the MOU to go to 125 for each partner. Okay, thank you. How will we gather information from families of children with food allergies? What's the plan? Yep, that's a normal part of our back to school process. Um, and so we have forms that are um, produced by our food and nutrition team and, and distributed to families. Um, but certainly right now, because this group is so small, um, we're able to have one-on-one -on -one conversations with families as well to be sure all health and, and safety needs are taken care of. Um, so while we may have something on file, obviously allergies change and develop. And so we'd be having um, conversations uh, with each family about that. Last question and then um, a last comment. I appreciate the 
the conversations that we have for families, but based on the incident that happened in Chesterfield County, very near to us several years ago, I think we need to also make sure that we update, we, we gather new documentation from our families, I think as a precaution. Conversations are good and I support conversations, absolutely. Um, last question. Do we have in each of those sites, except I believe Richmond Behavior Health Authority, because that's a, um, um, you indicated that is a referral. Yep. So at each site that we have, do we have a current licensed RPS teacher in those sites teaching those students? No. Um, the, the current MOU with each of the partners is that they provide um, the oversight and support as part of the plan that the board approved effective April 12th, we will have a licensed professional, um, not necessarily a teacher because one of the guiding principles was not to disrupt uh, current teaching groups, but we're working to identify um, uh, t individual licensed professionals who would be willing to work in person at those five sites to provide additional in-person supports um, in collaboration with the partners. Okay, so final comment. If we do not have a content licensed teacher at those sites, then what can we anticipate for the data to tell us? Because if we just have a coordinator there at the sites, how do we know that our teach uh, that our students are receiving the resources and the the academic support that they need to be successful? Because just putting a licensed support person there, that could be anybody, certified or classified. So when you say licensed support personnel, Ms. Desco, I would like for you to be clear because you have licensed electricians. I'm not saying electrician is in there. I'm just saying we need to be clear to the public what that means it's moving forward. I, and I think our data, one, one more thing, I think our data is gonna show that we should have made a different decision. Thank you. Did you want me to reply or was that just a statement? I'm, I'm good, it was a okay. statement. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hidasco, Dr. Harris Muhammad. Uh, Mr. Young, who's next? Yes, ma'am, Ms. Rizzi, then Ms. White. Ms. Rizzi, the floor is yours. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have a few questions. Um, I'm just kind of seeking clarification. So there are going to be at this point um, that you know, 17 exceptional ed teachers, is that right? On the, in the Holton Miles Jones sites. And 25 um, for, yeah, go ahead. That is those the, just the ones, go ahead. Th that's the number who have expressed initial comfort with working in person. We are having two right. information sessions this week. So it is very possible that we won't have a 100% conversion rate of every one of those individuals saying, yes, this this feels right to me, but those were folks who expressed initial interest. Do you need that many? I'm just curious. Have you, have you, uh, do you have enough people who have expressed interest to fill the positions that you'll have? Yes, with the ratios that were shared, the one to six, uh, well, two to six with the instructional assistant um, for special education and the one to 10, um, that would be, um, if, if all of those folks opted in, yes, we would be fine. We're looking at 122 eligible exceptional education students with less than 50 families comfortable coming back in person. So that would be only needing about 10, I'm rounding, exceptional education teachers at this point. And with 90 ESL families expressing comfort coming back in person, that would mean only nine ESL teachers. Now, it's very possible that, um, you know, some additional families who maybe have said maybe at this point uh, might fall into the, the yes category. We're, you know, continuing to have conversations. But if these numbers stayed as is, um, we would not need all of those teachers to opt in. Okay. Um, are you hopeful that these numbers will increase? You've got 50 or so out of 122, 90 out of 200. 
Um, is the goal to have these numbers increase? I think the goal is to offer options to families and let them make the choice that feels right for them and their families. Okay. Uh, let's see. Um, at the, you talked about um, having like social distancing marks in common areas in the schools, Holton and Miles Jones. Um, what is happening in the classrooms? Will desks be distanced or are they going to be social, you know, is there social distancing within the classroom? Yep, absolutely. Those sites right now um, maintain that structure with the facilitated learning um, center. So we keep um, distancing, all students face the same direction. Um, so yes, those things are, we have some, some effective practices that have been in place from the facilitated learning centers um, since October that we'll um, continue to use um, in these additional classrooms. Okay, thank you. And one last question, um, you know, with the proposed change to the MOU, um, are these sites, that I'm, I'm assuming that they have the capacity to increase their numbers the way you will ask them to? Well, they Has would need to discuss with them. It has. I've reached out to the point of contact with all three of them. So, for example, our BHA indicated they were looking to hire one additional staff member. The YMCA is looking to um, hire additional staff. Um, it will not cost um, RPS any additional funds for any increase because none of them have been operating at full capacity um, up to this point. Um, so the allocation that the board already made in the ESSER uh, to support childcare uh, would be sufficient even with this increase. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rizzi. Ms. White? Thank you, Madam President. Um, Ms. Sandusco, I'm going to concentrate on uh, my number one priority is safety. I heard that you were speaking, you were saying that the actual custodians uh, those who are comfort or comfort, comfortable uh, working with students. Where's the training for the custodians? Because I didn't hear anything about the training or for uh, teachers. Do you mean training as related to um, health and safety or? Yes. Health and safety, cleansing, mm -hmm. uh, hygiene. I didn't hear any of that. And if so, when it's going to be done? Uh, also for the actual um, teachers or instructors, nurse, everyone needs to be trained the proper way of uh, the, the correct protocols in dealing with COVID. Yeah, and um, I'm pleased to be able to report that um, for custodians and nursing staff, that has occurred and has occurred during um, uh, this period. So all of our nurses have been attending um, extensive training with the health department, um, local hospitals, et cetera, and are fully prepared um, to uh, work in this context. Um, I'm also really pleased to report that we've um, notably increased the professional development that we've been providing to our custodians. In fact, recently issuing all of them technology so that they'd be able to participate in more online professional development. We've also increased the number of custodians and custodial managers who are now certified to do COVID related um, defogging, for example, and we've purchased the necessary equipment. Um, so we've been doing a lot over the, um, the, the last couple of months um, to prepare staff uh, for this context. Um, in terms of the teachers, that's part of what we'll talk about in the um, information sessions this week. While the custodians will certainly be present um, to do more frequent cleanings of the classroom, including the removal of breakfast and lunch, um, to make sure that the bathrooms remain clean, um, and we'll be able to wipe down some of the high touch surfaces. We'll also be talking with teachers about the role that they can play in that as well, having the hand sanitizer, of course, present in the classroom um, and, and wipes and things like that. But the custodians uh, will be a primary support there too. And I got a couple more questions for you. Of Do you just want me to ask you the questions one by one or I can just ask you all? One by one is great. Okay, I also noticed that you said water fountains will not be in use. Uh, what will be used in substitute for that? 
Um, we will have uh, opportunity for families to um, bring water bottles or we also can provide um, uh, water for students, but the water fountains are, are off now. Um, so that's something that we'll be working on with families if we'll provide bottled water um, or, or they can bring. And in your uh, uh, question about transportation, I heard that you said that uh, the service will be contracted. Do you know how many students will be allowed to uh, be on the bus on this? On the, if, it's a normal, if it's a normal size RPS bus, um, no more than 12. Um, but depending on the buses, so especially for some of the students with more significant special needs, they often have specialized transportation um, and those may have a much smaller uh, ratio there, but um, the distancing protocols uh, will be in place for the bus regardless of size. And um, I do have a question. I just want to um, follow up on uh, one of my colleagues, Dr. Muhammad. Uh, she had stated about, I had a, I did, I did um, the other day, went out to my actual um, district and I was talking to some of the families and one of the children actually go to Peter Paul. So I can understand what she's saying because she's five and mm -hmm. she's at Peter Paul, but there is no one there to put her actually on the computer. So her father uh, was talking to me about he feels that there needs to have some uh, someone from RPS to be there because she's been sitting there. And so she's been, um, that's, that's learning loss. That's what you well, call it. I do frequent audits at all of our facilitated learning center sites. I have never seen a classroom at the Peter Paul Center without um, adult supervision in each room. Um, that is part of the MOU that they have a representative from their program um, that helps get all of the kids online in the morning and is in the classroom throughout the day. Um, if, if you'd like to share with me the student's name privately over email, um, I can do a follow-up, but I have never observed that. Um, and I'm sorry to hear if that was the case, but it was certainly not um, the norm. It's, um, I, I just want to make sure. Uh, so is the Peter Paul also uh, included with the friends? Uh, Peter Paul, no, is is running their site out of MLK Middle School. No, this one was, was friends. I'm sorry. I want to make sure. I see. This friends okay. that the uh, child is actually is, okay. is, is there. And that is not an RPS sponsored um, site. So um, I unfortunately cannot speak to the supervision at that site. That is a okay. community-based pod. Right. Okay. And then my other question for you, uh, what percentage of children will cause the school to close if uh, a couple of children may uh, get COVID? It's a, it's a great question. There's a, a couple of, of factors at play. Um, one, and I do just want to mention that the facilitated learning centers have been open since October, and uh, there have not been a notable number of positive cases um, at those centers. So um, certainly, if, if trends continue, um, I am hopeful. Uh, it's certainly another reason why in these early stages of reopening, we are asking that all staff be vaccinated. Um, quarantine, quarantine, quarantine um, uh, parameters look a little bit differently for individuals who are vaccinated. So we'll need to take each case um, by a case by case basis, um, see what the exposure looks like, and then what the current CDC guidance looks like to determine if it would be um, uh, just an individual quarantine, a classroom quarantine, uh, or potentially something larger. Okay, that's my last one. Thank you. Of course. Thank you, Ms. White. Mr. Young, anyone else? Yes, ma'am. Ms. Rizzi. Ms. Rizzi, the floor is yours. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and, and thank you, Ms. Hedasco, for all of this information. Um, I have another question. I totaled up all of the numbers that you just um, gave us, and I'm coming up with maybe 600 kids, and I thought we'd approved it for up to 800. So my question is, if these children that you have identified, you know, the 122 and the 90, if, you know, they don't 
um, you don't get close to filling those numbers, are you going to open this up to other children who were not initially identified? Certainly something that we can look into. We wanted to first get our final teacher counts. That will be our anchor for total student counts. Um, once we then confirm student participation, there may be some additional natural thresholds. Um, but I do think one very important consideration is um, clear boundaries on groups. Um, so that it doesn't feel like a random lottery of, you know, some additional subset of students being selected. Uh, these were students in the intensive supports program or students with um, uh, specific levels of language acquisition need. Um, so we would just need to look at what a potential um, additional threshold could look like and, and then confirm that um, that didn't take us above account. But we should have more information at the next board meeting about what the final numbers are and then can make a recommendation on that. All right, thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Young, anyone else? No, ma'am. All right, thank you very much, Ms. Adasco. We appreciate Absolutely. your report. And now we're ready to move back to our agenda. Number four, dreams for RPS update. That's me. Let's receive um, an update on PALS literacy data. Um, yes, I, thank you. That's me. Let me share. There my you screen. are. All right. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Um, you're at the end. <laughs> um, good evening, Chairwoman Burke, Vice Chair Young, school board members. Um, I am. Uh, I come tonight to present an update on our goal three, uh, Dreams for RPS, uh, which centers us on academic proficiency. Um, our goal three measures academic progress in three areas. For uh, grades K-2, we uh, measure early literacy through the PALS assessment, which is the focus of this presentation. Um, for grades three through eight, we look at SOL pass rates and for grades nine through 12, we monitor SOL end of course exams um, as well as uh, PSAT performance. Tonight, I'm going to focus solely on the K-2 measure. So just for an overview um, for PALS, PALS is a screener, an early childhood screener um, that is designed to assess students' uh, skills and uh, really essential foundational literacy skills and uh, things that are predictive of future reading success. It's important to note that PALS is not a standardized test, but a literacy screener that's given um, teacher to student and it's used to um, provide valuable data to teachers about what students need in early literacy uh, and also to identify students who need intervention in order to help them read proficiently by the third grade. Some of the skills and while the specifics vary by grade level and time of year, um, the foundational literacy skills that PALS assesses for um, are things such as letter recognition, uh, being able to identify upper and lowercase letters of the alphabet, uh, matching letters and sounds, we call this letter sound recognition, identifying the beginning sounds of a word, um, recognizing rhyme patterns, sounding out words, we call that decoding uh, in the education space. Uh, PALS refers to this as spelling. Um, combining sounds or chunking uh, letters and letter sounds together to sound out a word, we call this blending or segmenting. And then oral reading at a grade, um, oral reading and the ability to read a, a passage um, by grade level. And each of these skills are essential to a student being able to read fluently. Um, so without having to stop and sound out every word so that students can concentrate on comprehension rather than the mechanics of reading. So we call this uh, in the early grades, students learn to read so that they can read to learn. PALS, um, this is a statewide assessment um, that's required by the state of Virginia, and um, we give it several times by grade level. Uh, in K and 1, all students are required to take, uh, have the PALS um, screener administered 
um, at least twice a year in the fall and spring. And, um, and then all second grade students in the fall. And then after, um, after second grade fall, it really um, depends on uh, basically a subset of students if they've been identified in the past. Um, so for example, third grade students uh, would be screened if they were new to Virginia or if they, had, they were a student um, from second grade who received um, intervention during the summer. Um, the PALS data is used to, um, again, first and foremost, hopefully inform instruction at the classroom level. Um, it's also used when a student is identified um, via PALS, it means that they have not met this, uh, the benchmark for their particular grade level and point in the year and uh, means that they've been identified for targeted intervention. Um, and this also uh, helps us gather data to determine students that are in need of summer or additional literacy intervention. Um, and uh, in, a, uh, in addition to these required times, uh, RPS does uh, also, we do a mid-year screener so that we can assess uh, midway uh, throughout the year. It's not required, it's an optional screener. Also important to note that um, pre-K also has a PAL screener and that's used um, for separate oil literacy skills and we can, we'll pre present on that at another time. A few things to note in terms of PALS and COVID. Um, there's a few things we know really across the state. Uh, so in the fall, the state issued a report on PALS data with three big takeaways. The first was um, looking at uh, PALS data from fall 2020. So this past fall, um, significantly more kindergarten and first grade students were considered a high risk for reading failure compared to a year ago. This, this translates statewide to 30, over 37,000 students, um, which is an increase of 11,000 year over year. And it's the single largest increase in identified students since the, in the history of PALS being given. So I share this just so that the board and the public have some context uh, for uh, how PALS is uh, playing out statewide. Uh, second, we, um, and I think this is unfortunately consistent with other things related to COVID, the increase in first kindergarten and first grade students starting the school year in the fall um, at high risk for reading failure was largest among students who are black, Hispanic, economically disadvantaged and English learners. And then third, the increased number of kinder and first grade students beginning this school year in the fall at high risk for reading failure really is, um, poses a threat to students being able to read on grade level by third grade. Um, so our, early, our um, early elementary educators know that um, if, if students do not receive these fundamental skills and learn them early, they continue to struggle in reading throughout their elementary years. To give you an example, the specifics um, comparing RPS to Virginia, um, the number of students identified at, uh, at risk of reading failure went from 29% um, from to 41% in kindergarten and 38% to 52% in first grade, uh, an increase of uh, 11 points and 14 points respectively. Virginia had an increase of nine points and 10 points respectively. So th this is a pattern across the state. Um, and and um, unfortunately, uh, our, our, our students have been even harder hit um, as a result of, of COVID. That said, there, is, there, are, uh, there are some bright spots and uh, some things to uh, um, be proud of. Um, in our looking at our mid-year data, uh, we, we selected um, several key skills mid-year. So we did not give the whole screener mid-year. We select the foundation, the most important skills that are a proxy for the next set of skills. So for kindergarten, that, that um, for example, assessing letter sounds, the ability to um, uh, know that, you know, the sound for A is A. Ah, um, and so students need to be able to do that. We saw growth um, from the fall to winter, substantial growth. And I should also note the winter benchmark is higher. So it's not the same exact um, level. So this is um, growth towards a higher standard mid-year and the standard in the spring is higher even so. 
So we saw students make big gains in the average score on growth uh, on letter sounds. And we saw that across um, every subgroup. Um, and, and we also, across every school, we saw growth, clear growth um, in letter sounds across every school. Despite growth, the growth unfortunately is not significant, sufficient enough for a student to be on track to reading on level. And so this is where the concern comes in. Um, this is the percent of kindergartners who were proficient on letter sounds, meaning they met the PALS benchmark for where you should be midpoint of kindergarten for knowing your letter sounds. And so you can see across the board almost, um, with one exception, we had one that was flat fall to winter. Um, and you'll see a decline um, from fall to winter. Now, again, this is not students going backwards per se. It's just that they didn't make enough growth to be on track or proficient. Um, and some, and, and, and uh, so you can see the difference there. Again, uh, the pattern is, is pretty consistent across schools. So there were, uh, there were some um, schools that did make growth in proficiency from fall to winter. Um, for example, Chimborazo, you can see here, um, uh, the, the dark blue line is the winter, the light blue line is the fall. And so you can see um, Chimborazo, Westover had some large gains. We see some gains with red. Um, with Munford, um, a slight gain with Reed, um, Fisher. So um, Barack Obama held steady. So you can see um, again, but 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 by and large, um, uh, our students uh, are are not where they really should be at this point in the year on this particular aspect of the PALS. Moving to first and second grade, we see a similar pattern. Now for first and second grade, um, we looked at um, spelling and spelling is really PAL's word for uh, category for the ability to decode or sound out words, okay? So um, can you take C-A-T and spell it out to make cat, right? Um, uh, sound it out to make cat. So again, we saw growth consistently across the board and across all of our subgroups. And we saw growth across every school from fall to winter. Um, so we're pleased to see growth. Um, and again, when it comes to proficiency, we're not, we, we're not yet where we need to be. So um, if you look at this, 42% of our first and second graders are proficient in where they need to be um, and the ability to really decode and sound out words, which, um, will be a, a huge, a pretty significant um, impediment to learning to read fluently as they go into second and third grade. And again, this pattern is consistent across our subgroups. Um, the, the, uh, so you can again, see that across the board. And similarly, a fairly consistent pattern across all schools, although a handful did make gains in the percent of proficient as well. Um, so Westover Hills, Southampton, um, Holton, uh, Fisher again. Um, so we see, we do see some, um, I think they're, uh, re, I thought red was in there, sorry. That, yeah, Westover, Southampton, Holton and Fisher. So we can see some schools making those gains. Uh, and again, where we really wanna be by the, by the end of the year, is that all of our students in first and second grade are proficient in this area because we know that's foundational for reading success um, in second and third grade. So in terms of next steps, the headline, we're making growth. Uh, the growth is not um, as, significant, as sufficient as we need it to be for students to be on track. Um, and um, you know, when I think about even if we look at our PALS data uh, year over year, um, while we saw it did decrease due to COVID and that's created more of a challenge, um, we, we have known, we've known as a school district, we have a real reading challenge. When we look at um, students reading scores and abilities on um, the SOL reading test and, and so on. So um, I see this as an opportunity to really hone in 
on early elementary and thinking through um, what will be our response to COVID to make sure our students really get these foundational skills. Because if they do not, they will continue to struggle as readers throughout elementary school and then unfortunately will follow them into middle school and into high school. Um, and if you've ever known a reader who struggles or have been a struggling reader yourself, you know just how frustrating um, that can be. And it can really lead students to um, be disengaged and to uh, you know, really feel um, a lack of excitement for school. So in terms of next steps for, for us, um, we're, in, we're meeting with elementary schools, each elementary school to make sure their intervention schedules line up with their student data to ensure that any student who um, has not been meeting the benchmark is getting the targeted support. Um, over the last two years, we've put in place very um, clear evidence-based programs for intervention based on what students need. And so um, we will make sure that the intervention schedules are updated for the remainder of the year to make sure students are matched with their needs. Um, we also want to do gather some more information by observing and providing support to schools and coaches and teachers to ensure that the skills portion of our ELA um, block is being taught each day with an emphasis on these foundational literacy skills and to problem solve with teachers um, given the inherent challenges trying to do small group rotations with littles in a virtual setting. We know that the virtual setting has made um, kind of that small group rotation a little more challenging. So trying to continue to problem solve with our teachers. Ensure that we want also wanna make sure that um, families in very um, uh, layman friendly terms understand, um, sorry, understand, uh, sorry, understand what their students need and the academic support we have available before and after school. For example, um, we've, uh, we've launched an intensive reading academy for K2. Um, so parents can sign their kids up and we also, our, our schools are reaching out to students who they know need this for one-on-one -on -one sessions twice a week for six weeks focused on reading skills. So that's happening this spring as well as one-to-one -one on-demand tutoring. Um, and those are individual tutoring sessions based on ELA skills. So parents can um, sign their kids up for that if they haven't been referred by the school. And then lastly, um, taking a look at our literacy plan and uh, revising that to make sure we have a comprehensive do whatever it takes plan to use um, using our expected funding from the stimulus package to really really smash um, early early literacy and make sure that every single student in RPS is on track to read by third grade. Um, we know that the science is clear about what it takes. Um, I think our support systems with our exceptional education program and our um, English language learner program, you can see that um, students, there's not a significant difference in that group. And I think part of that is because of the supports we're providing. Um, and so uh, we just need more of our students um, to be on track. And we, we know what to give them. Uh, part of this is we need to find creative ways to get more time with students and the, with talent, with teachers who know the signs of reading and, um, and we can crack this code. But um, there really is no replacement for more intensive time when you're trying to support a struggling reader. Um, and so uh, part of our plan uh, needs to find a way to get more time with students, whether that's before school, after school, summer, extended year, uh, extended, uh, extended day, extended week. Um, there's a lot that we can do during the school day, but when we're looking at 50% of our students not being on track, we've got to find more time to tackle um, these literacy skills. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Epps, so much for that um, detailed report. A lot of good information. Mr. Young, I see we have you to speak. <laughs> yes, yes, ma'am. Uh, first, I want to convey my gratitude to Dr. Epp for the presentation. And I don't, if this doesn't alarm everyone in the city of Richmond, irrespective of if you have a child or not, I don't know what will. I don't know what will. Uh, to have over half of our, our students, over half of our first graders 
uh, identified as reading significantly below grade level uh, signals that Rome is burning. We know that for third graders that aren't reading proficient, you're four times as likely to not graduate from high school. We know that if you're thir third grader and you're not reading a proficient level and you happen <clears throat> to live in poverty, you're 13 times, 13 times more likely to not graduate from high school. There's been a lot of conversation about uh, calendar changes, supplemental supports, and uh, I don't want to diminish any of the very valid points that have been introduced either pro or con, but I'll just share for this board member, for this board member, if this data, if this data doesn't say that a business as usual calendar is inadequate, I, I don't know what would. There is no substitute. It's, it's kind of like that old uh, parenting uh, false choice, quality versus quantity time. Well, the truth is, and, and Dr. Epp just said it, there is no substitute for quantity. I apologize for my for me getting on a soapbox. I'm glad to feel back bound some of my time, but uh, I'm grateful for this, this data as uh, difficult as it is to to digest, I'm most concerned for our students, and uh, and at the risk of pointing out uh, the obvious, folks, we weren't in a good place before COVID, and now because of it, over half of our over half of our first graders are identified as being significantly behind in the the most important most important element or variable in identifying if they will succeed in their academic pursuits, graduate from high school, and achieve all those things that we want, uh, we want and so desperately um, know that uh, they, they deserve. Uh, so Madam Chair, uh, thank you and uh, I apologize for being so long-winded. I believe Ms. Ms. White is next. Thank you, Mr. Young. You weren't long-winded at all. And your information was was needed to be said. Well said. Thank you so much. All right, Ms. White. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Uh, Dr. Epps, uh, looking at the pale statistics that I'm looking at this data, it doesn't, <coughs> excuse me, it does not show where the children has made any progress. It doesn't show the progress I'm looking at it, I'm sure that this one was uh, probably in the fall and one was in the, I guess, in the winter and one was in the spring. And I kind of remember this because I, I did have a kindergarten uh, a couple of years ago. And um, I know that the benchmark lowers the score. So it doesn't show, if you have a child that Perhaps the fall might be the number seven and your winner may be 26, 27, the benchmark. It doesn't show that progress if that child is actually making progress. Am I correct on that? Can you say that last part one more time? Just to make sure I understood it. Okay. Based on your bar, the barcodes I'm looking at, uh, for instance, this, I uh, believe you have the fall and the winter. So the fall probably was the September and the winter probably was the January. And if you look at the, your first bench, I mean, the, the first benchmark may be what, a six, seven, something like that. And the next benchmark, which is the winter, is way beyond like 20, 25 or whatever the number is given. That benchmark normally, it lowers the score. Mm -hmm. But if a child is progressing, I don't see that in your bot, in your data here. I, doesn't, I don't see that. Okay, so, well, um, I think I understand the question and you're correct. Um, the score you need uh, at this, the fall is different than the wi winter and different in the spring, it goes up, right? Right. Um, so students made, what you're looking at here, for example, is the average score from fall to winter. So students made 
growth. They just didn't make enough growth to be proficient. Right. And then my next question is, um, I heard someone said the ELA, uh, I guess you do use that. And that was a new curriculum that was, that came in just before the pandemic. Did we look at these, uh, this data before that was implemented? Yes, so um, we actually, um, prior to, um, let's say two years ago, the division did not require phonics to be taught, a systematic phonics program to be taught K2. So one of the thing, one of the first things we put in place was to do that. And we used our old curriculum because that's what we had, but mm -hmm. we, we required it because we heard, I mean, that was one of the things I saw immediately. Um, and so um, that we had, and when we adopted our ELA curriculum, part of that, part of the requirement for K2 was that it had a systemic, systematic phonics approach. Um, and that for, so for our ELA program curriculum, there are two parts in the K2 realm. There's the kind of um, text-based, novel-based, we call those the modules. And then there's something called the skills block. The skills block is where students get the foundational reading skills and phonics. And that is um, generally what it looks like is there's a teacher led mini lesson followed by small group teachers, teacher student small group instruction based on each student's levels and what they need. And students are rotating through different exercises until they get their time with small group to reinforce their skills. One of the things that's been challenging in the virtual environment that we've heard from our teachers, the skills block is challenging to implement in that way. Now we still, we're still working, we, we're like, we gotta try. Um, we gotta keep working it because we can't let that go. I will be honest also, there's a lot of, you know, not, not uh, if you're trying to do one thing uh, maybe the first part of the ELA block that uh, is part of a new curriculum. The second part of our ELA block may not be consistently being used, the skills block, because of that difficulty navigating small groups and really having to know where each kid is and pulling them into a small group and doing that very differentiated instruction. And so um, we're working to, with teachers to try to fully understand um, where their implementation challenges are. Um, so, but absolutely when we selected the curriculum, we made sure that it had the components that should meet these needs for students. I think we're dealing with an implementation challenge right now. Yes, you are. Oh, unless you have two people in the classroom. I see that I've already reviewed that every day. I see that, absolutely. which are exactly what you're saying. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. White. I think uh, Mrs. Page is next. Ms. Page? Yes. I turn my mic off. Thank you, um, Dr. Epp, for this information. Um, I shared the sentiment with my colleague, Mr. Young, and I beg to differ. Is really lower than third grade is a true indicator of, you know, how our children, you know, if that support is not put in place early on intervention, it's just a domino effect. It just, it continues from grade to grade. But so let me get to my question. So Dr. L, so, and I may have missed this, but the threshold hold or the key indicator that children need that intervention or support, um, say if a child is maybe two points over that th threshold, what is, I guess, the defining number that um, truly indicates a child receives the intervention? Um, I, I actually have a chart, um, let's see if I can quickly find it. We have a, a pretty detailed chart that, um, 
outlines exactly what um, students are to get. Um, again, it depends on the grade level and time of year. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to send that around. Here we go. I think I can quickly show this to you if you'd like to see, and I can share this with the board. Um, come on, it's loading right now. Okay. If it, okay, here we go. Um, because interventions and uh, uh, is RTI is what we call it, response to intervention based on data is one of the things we've been working on, working to establish here in the division since Mr. Cameras took office. Um, we did not have a systematic intervention program. Uh, we had a lot of kind of random, like a lot of tutors who met well, but it was mm -hmm. just not coordinated. Um, and so this is an example um, there's a lot of information on this, but this is an example of based on your score in each of these areas. So these are the, the areas that you're assessed on. Mm -hmm. And if you're above the benchmark, these are the scores. So you, you, it's hard to say one score because they're scored differently. It's a little bit of a matrix. So over here, if, you're, if your scores are over here um, where you're below benchmark and you need intensive support, your scores range from zero to eight in one category, zero to 20 in another. So um, those are things that we work with schools um, to provide them data to help them group their kids accordingly. And then based on the area, they get a certain um, intervention. Again, and, and I'll say students who've received what we call tier three, which is the most intensive intervention, mm -hmm. uh, we can't give every kid intensive intervention all day long because then we wouldn't be able to do the other grade level instruction. Um, but the students who've received tier three intervention have actually progressed even more than students on average. Um, and also students who you know, participated even in our, pro our summer programs over the last two years, those like last summer, those students had less of a drop um, than their peers. And so we know that with more time and the ability to give kids more targeted support, mm -hmm. we can get, they can get there. Right. Um, it's just, there's, there's too many in the course of the day to do that across the board within the time allotted. Okay. And so my next question, when will you, um, the administration will be reporting back out to the board to compare the scores, you know, to see the growth or, you know, where there is still um, intervention needed? Because I know they have the piles in the spring. Yes. Yeah, so in the spring at the end, towards the end of the school year, um, we will do the end of year uh, screener and then report that data out uh, sometime in the early summer. Okay. And, and thank you for this information because it was a time um, seem like information or different um, strategies seemed like it was just thrown on the wall and let's see what was going to catch. Um, because, you know, we had 19 schools that had been denied accreditation. So yeah, I remember. So thank you. Thank you for doing this work and um, the administration and the board collectively we need to work together and we need to we need to move the needle like yesterday thank, thank you. you thank you miss page i think miss rizzy's next is that right mr young is rizzy then miss white that's correct yes ma'am all right miss rizzy thank you madam chair and thank you, Dr. Up, for your presentation. I just have a few questions. Um, you know, I know just from being a teacher for as long as I've been, um, I've taught many kids to read. Um, I love teaching reading. There's nothing more magical in the world than helping a kid discover the joy of reading. Um, and I really mean that, you know, I mean, I think that um, once you, a kid, you know, you open that world up to them. It's, it's amazing, you know, how you can see them fly. And so, um, you know, this is really important. I'm wondering, um, 
you know, I'm thinking about how I learned to read. I mean, certainly my first grade teacher was excellent. Um, she stayed after school personally and helped me because I had a real interest in it. Um, but what are, are there any support for parents to like reinforce um, reading skills? You know, I mean, like I have fridge phonics for both of my kids, right? And it did wonders, mm -hmm. wonders. Um, so I'm wondering, you know, are there like, are you working with parents? Are you making this more of a community effort? Um, because it is something our community could definitely get involved with. And especially parents. I mean, our parents are busy. I mean, I, I, I was busy too. Our parents have a lot of concerns, especially now during COVID. But there are some small things that they could do to support their kids and, you know, assist them with developing these skills. Um, there are fun things you can do with kids. You know, this doesn't have to be drudgery. It right. doesn't have to be testing, testing, testing. No. Actually, reading is a lot of fun for kids once they they get it. And so I'm right. wondering, are there any kinds of supports for parents specifically that can help them support the work that you're doing in schools? Yeah. I mean, certainly quantity. Yeah, we can put them in school. You know, I don't want this to feel like punishment for our kids. No. This, you know, reading is, is amazing and fun and our parents can help them. Our communities can help them. Um, this could be a full, full community effort. That doesn't mean that our kids have to like be in class forever, you know, right. when they really would rather be outside. You can be outside and actually practice reading skills. There are creative ways of doing this. Absolutely. So wondering, yeah. Absolutely. Um... I was actually just talking to one of our kindergarten teachers and was talking about the magic of K-1-2 uh, teachers who really have such a special role in unlocking the magic of reading for our kids. Um, uh, so yes, to answer your question, absolutely. Part of our plan uh, has to include, will include, um, it must include families and community um, we certainly, you know, last year we had our family academies in partnership with the Office of Engagement. So we'd want to um, return to those. Uh, we also want to think about how to make this, um, uh, you know, again, really simple, uh, given families have a lot going on, um, you know, simple, but, but powerful. And uh, we know that reading every day to your child, there's nothing to replace it, but there are a lot of fun um, simple strategies that we can share with families um, to help. And uh, so that will certainly be part of our plan. Thank you for emphasizing it. Okay, thank you. And I have another question. Um, I know of children who do pretty well on PALS, um, but then later you discover maybe they have some um, dyslexia, dysgraphia going on. Mm -hmm. How are you identifying children like that? Yeah, um, well, I think, it, um, First, I think it's important to note PALS is not a proxy for being able to read. It's a proxy for being able to identify gaps in the foundational skills. So it's, I'm glad you noted that. Um, uh, and in terms of uh, dyslexia, we hope that teachers are seeing that when they are screening students. Um, but we actually think, uh, we, we know we need to do more on um, a formal this dyslexia screening and training. We need to update our training for teachers on how to catch that at an early age. Um, so that's something our Office of Exceptional Education is working on um, is our dyslexia plan. So I can come back with more information on that. Yeah, thank you. Because it is it takes specialized skills to identify those children. Absolutely. It's sometimes very hard because they are so skilled at other, you know, I mean, they, a lot of them memorize, right? <laughs> And so um, it's, it's kind of difficult. And I just wondered if you guys were thinking about that. Um, do you have numbers right now about how many parents have signed up for the intensive reading? Um, I do not have them off of my fingertips, but I can certainly get that to you all. And then one last, um, it seems really complicated what you're describing, what you're asking teachers to do in terms of translating ELA to virtual. Um, are there backups or, or are you just sticking with the ELA? I'm sorry, can you ask that one more time? Yeah, I said it seems really complicated um, what you're asking teachers to do in terms of uh, translating ELA uh, virtually. 
I mean, it just seems like it's complex and, and a little tough. And so do you have any backups to the ELA or support that's outside of it since it isn't directly translating online the way a lot of teachers would like it to? Um, that's a great question. Um, again, we're gathering uh, more information from teachers as I speak. Um, I, I do think the alternative is our, uh, our, our suite of intervention programs. So if a teacher, um, if their data is showing that the majority of their students um, need more reinforcement on a certain subset of skills, we could have them pull that, uh, that intervention resource. Um, but again, we wanna make sure that um, because so much of this is individualized by classroom and by student, um, we don't want to um, demotivate students who don't need something um, because they've already gotten it um, or create frustration if they're not ready. Um, so um, the short answer is we are showing teachers um, alternative materials, um, but the headline is we just can't replace the teaching um, of these foundational skills. And so um, we're, we're really trying to work with teachers to see where they're stuck. Um, and we want to continue with that approach and make sure they know what the alternative resources they have are. I also, um, my, my, um, my, uh, one of my staff members just texted me, um, we've had 466 signups for intensive reading. Thank you. Which is a, a pretty exciting number. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much. And Dr. F, you have a great team there working with you. So thank you so much for whomever sent that that uh, response, that's, that's teamwork. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Mr. Young, any other questions regarding um, Dr. Epps presentation? Yes, ma'am, we have next Ms. White, then Ms. Dorr, then Ms. Page. All right, Ms. White. Dr. Epps, I do, I will have to say, um, I thank you for this presentation. Um, I know um, this is not your first time giving it. Uh, but it seemed like I believe some of my colleagues felt that is. And I do not believe that um, this is not about poverty when I look at your uh, barcodes. This is about learning. Um, and I am familiar with the ELA because my son actually does that every day. And I think that um, my colleague, Ms. Rizzi, was saying, do, do you use another technique? And I've watched the class, and I think that um, because they test, they read, they test, they read, they, te they test so much, I think I already know the book by myself, you know. So um, I think that some of the testing could, you know, could see so that they could get a clear understanding of actually what the curriculum is. And I know that uh, I've seen that the, the focus on the tutoring that you were just talking about that is offering. And that tutoring, I'm still trying to question it, that it is so late in the evening. After the child has been on virtue from 3.30, no child wants to come back at 5.30, 6.30, or 7.30 those times. Those is, it's kind of hard to get those children back on just to actually uh, work some, some ELA or some reading or actual um, answering some questions. So my question is, um, will you have enough resources to cover the virtue and the in school plan if we go both ways? Because somehow the virtue is gonna have to be tweaked. It has to be better. Somewhere mm -hmm. I know you, I'm, I'm, I'm hearing you saying, well, you know, we have this to fix, we have this to tweak, but I don't believe school is, all, is gonna be the same anymore. We're not just gonna always go into the school. You're gonna to have to eventually have both virtue yes. and in school. And um, those things have to be fixed. Yes, absolutely. Um, your, your point about reopening and how um, this looks in the virtual environment for next year, We'll, we will certainly be taking our learnings from this year to inform that uh, 100%. And um, we, we do have a, I, I totally hear your point on the late hour for tutoring. We do have a morning session available. Yeah, um, 7.30. Yeah, <laughs> um, I know trying to fit it in. Um, you're right. I don't think either are optimal. Um, 
but wanted to make sure we had some options available. But um, absolutely, we will be considering this as we think about uh, virtual options for the fall. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Doerr. Thanks, um, and thanks for this information. Um, uh, it underscores the importance of reviewing these things um, on a regular basis, so I appreciate um, the, the fact that we have this in our cadence now. Um, <clears throat> two questions. Um, one is, uh, glad uh, agree with Ms. Rizzi's comments regarding um, students with dyslexia. Um, and another thing that um, I was made aware of uh, recently is um, students that may have um, the need for glasses and because they're not in school, um, they're not uh, being evaluated. I had a constituent um, who was shocked to learn um, her son's vision score. Um, so <clears throat> I think that might be also an unintended consequence of not being in the classroom that would be uh, worth looking into. Um, and then second, um, in regards to kind of the what of whatever it takes plan, I know there's a, an elementary school in Richmond that um, prescribes no homework, but reading for an hour after school. Um, I'm wondering um, what uh, sort of community resources we can marshal um, just for informal reading um, and how we as a board can help marshal some of those resources. Definitely build that into our plan. Thank you. And noted on the vision screening, we'll, um, we'll definitely take a look at that. All right, thank you very much. Ms. Page? Yes, Madam Chair, this is more of a comment. Um, and this goes back to something that Ms. Rizzi stated about, um, is there an initiative, is there an initiative that, um, really encourages our, encourage our parents to get involved. Um, I can share one example, a math and literacy night um, Blackwell had, and it was really an awesome experience. Full participation of our parents and our children, as well as the staff, and it was an opportunity to show or to demonstrate the manipulatives with the parents and the children um, reading. I mean, it was just an awesome opportunity for our parents and students and staff working together. Um, I think, you know, probably can do more, more things like that once we return to face-to-face, -face. but it was a it was awesome to see parents, children, and the staff engaged. And it was a math and literacy night that they had put on. So Thank I just, you. you know, just encourage doing more of that. Absolutely. Thank you, Ms. Page. Mr. Young, anyone else? Madam Chair, Dr. Harris Muhammad, and then you are on deck. Thank you, Dr. Harris Muhammad. Thank you, Madam Chair. Dr. Epp, thank you. I look forward to us working together as a governance team to increasing these scores. They did not come here overnight and they're not going to um, increase overnight drastically. So we have some work to do and I am excited about that work um, that we're gonna be doing together. Is there a, a testing calendar um, readily available for teachers and parents to view so they can pay, plan accordingly, particularly parents. I know teachers, well, I'm hoping teachers receive a um, year long testing calendar, particularly our secondary high schools that are now on a four by four, their testing calendar may be a little different because they're on a four by four schedule, but is there a testing calendar readily available? for our parents to view. And, and for those parents um, and community stakeholders that are watching, sometimes because of things that happen with the weather, you know, our calendar may be off a day or two, but is it something readily, readily available for them to, you know, see and access, access and view? Thank you. We, ha we have it available for our principals and teachers. Uh, we have not, uh, 
we have not converted it to a parent friendly version, but we can certainly get it up on our site um, and see how we can uh, make it friendly with the copy. I do know that schools um, send out, typically send out reminders in their newsletters um, uh, because we try to give schools, you know, windows with flexibility, uh, but uh, we can certainly get that. That's a great idea and, um, and we can get that up there. Thank you so much. Uh, I have a comment. Uh, I'm going back to Ms. Rizzi's thought regarding reading being fun and you're right, outside, inside, wherever is fun. But I want us to be mindful of the little limo. Lit limo. We've received so much, and you all are familiar with that, I hope. So much attention, um, so much support. There are organizations, fraternities, sororities, and I'd like to, I'm gonna pass this on to Dr. Harris. She may already have it, and Mr. Cameras, of course. The Dorothy Height Day, sponsored by the Richmond Alumni Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority, and um, the Women Who Lead, and the um, National Council of Negro Women in honor of Dr. Ha Dorothy Height, who served as the president for 40 years. And for those that are listeners, Dorothy Height was very instrumental in the movement with Dr. Martin Luther King. And she's a native Richmonder, but she moved as a child. But this is gonna take place at the Hull Street Library on March 24th, 12.30 to 1.30, asking for books, asking for lightly used books, or brand new books, or you can order the books from Amazon and they will be delivered to the Hull Street Library, 1400 Hull Street. Don, that's your area, Ms. Page, isn't it? Is that your area or, or Dr. Harris Muhammad's area? It's my area and also um, Dr. Height is a family member. Oh, wow. Excellent. Well, I'll make sure, um, Dr. Harris, and maybe on, on the RPS direct, Mr. Cameras, because um, as she, you know what happens with the limo. I hope you all have mm -hmm. seen pictures of the limo on, especially on RPS direct or on the website as well. The children love it. They just go in there and can stay in the little, mm -hmm. little bus that's so decorative, um, all in black, like a limousine, but it's a school bus. Mm -hmm. And they just spend the day, they get as many books as they so desire and the books are theirs. Is that right, Dr. L? Yes. They get to keep the books. So a lot of our children are building lab their libraries out of the books that Richard mm -hmm. Public School, and it gives them an outlet. From what I understand, some students just like to go there and just, it goes to every area of the city on a schedule, which is usually in Mr. Cameron's, um RPS Daily Direct. So Dr. Epp, did you want to say anything else about that? Because in spite of COVID, there, there are opportunities because the bus, the limo, the lit limo, goes to um, our, our communities directly. I know I've seen it in Fulton. So the Lit Limo is a great, a great resource. It's an example of, um, you know, when we think uh, creatively about different ways to engage students, um, it's a great example of that. Uh, we also have something else coming online next year, um, which we'd hope to do this year, but we put on hold um, our um, book vending machines. Um, kids earn, you know, tokens for all kinds of fun things. Um, and then they can use those tokens to choose books of their, you know, to uh, get books of their choosing from vending machines. So we're piloting that at several schools, all part of our, in our strategic plan to build a culture of reading and really a joyful culture of reading. Excellent. Thank you so very much. Are there any more questions of Dr. Epp at this time, Mr. Young? No, ma'am. Well, Dr. Epp, thank you so very much for that data. And we know we're going to see you again at, at another meeting very soon with some more data. Thank and this you. helps us, as stated, to, to make sure we're in support of every child and keeping the main thing the main thing. All right, colleagues, we are now ready for board action items. And we remember we deleted, um, we rearranged, I should say, 5.01. So now we're at 5.02. Receive for action change in the agent duty agent. Mr. Cameras. I just want to clarify from my own understanding. Are we not discussing the calendar or I thought we were discussing calendar, just not taking action on the calendar. Okay, I moved it. Remember we said we would take it from board action item 
Ah. And we put it under administration item Thank to 6.04. My pleasure. So we moved it to 6.04. I think Ms. Under... Gibson, I think Ms. Gibson wanted to make a motion. Or to change it at this time? I believe so. Okay, Mrs. Gibson? Um, yes, it, um, so it was my my thought that we would not move it down on the calendar on our agenda that we would simply um, you know in terms of our discussion order so I, I would like to discuss the year-long calendar now um, and I have a motion related to the calendar discussion um, so my hope is to to proceed I mean it's 10 16 and this is a timely item so I think it would be good yeah, and you're making a very good point because we also have closed session tonight. Don't you all forget that. So, and I'm, I'm seeing some guests that we have to speak very at a very late hour. So um, do we want to make adjustments now? And, and Ms. Gibson, I think we, we can reach consensus as a group to move, to go ahead and discuss the calendar item now, and then we'll move board action item down to 5.02 where that is. So thank you, Mr. Cameron and Ms. Gibson. But my question also is we move forward because we have Head Start governance training. We have um, JCT report. We have the MOU, which we pretty could much could read those two items because the information is there, not unless we have any questions. So um, my major concern is the Head Start, which I know we need to do that, but looking at the hour as well, by the time we get there, it'll be near midnight. Plus we have the dashboard and the advisory committee as well, which I read that that was quickly done. All right, so um, if we're in agreement, anyone has any objective if objections, excuse me, to moving forward with the calendar discussion, and then we will um, go down to the board action items. Mr. Young, is anyone listed to discuss? I'm excuse no, me. All right. Okay, Mr. Cameras, and I know Ms. Gibson said she had a, um, you want to make your motion now, Ms. Gibson, or your motion once the, the presentations are done? Um, I think I can make my motion if there wasn't a plan. I'm not sure if there was a plan for a presentation, but I, I'll, I'll make the motion now. It might help speed things along. Go ahead. Okay. You put it in the chat. Um, I motion that the administration present the board with calendar options to include traditional calendars and year round calendars for both an August 23rd, 2021 and a September 7th, 2021 start date. The year round calendar versions will align with intercession breaks with our nine week calendar. The district will also provide at least two additional budget scenarios, including year round school pilots at an elementary school a middle school and a high school where all enrolled students at each school have the option of participating in planned intercessions. The second budget will be for an expanded and enhanced summer school program to begin in July, 2022. These items will be made public by March 26, 2021, discussed at a special meeting on March 29th, 2021 and voted on at our April 5th, 2021 meeting. Is there a second? Ms. White, would you speak? Second. It's been moved by Mrs. Gibson and seconded by Ms. White. Is there any discussion? And you did put it in the chat, right, Ms. Gibson? I sure did. All right, thank you. Any questions, Mr. Young, any discussion? Not as of yet, Madam Chair. May I ask some clarifying questions, Madam Chair? Please, yes. Um, okay, I uh, just want to understand um, the request. So tr traditional calendars and year-round calendars with, um, is the request one starting on Help me understand the, the two dates there, the August 23rd and the September 7th. Sure. So, um, you know, in looking at the calendars that were adopted last summer um, by Chesterfield and Henrico schools for the upcoming 2022 
2020, yes, 2021, 22 school year. Um, there, uh, Henrico is moving forward with a calendar that would begin on August 23rd. And, Ch and Chesterfield is, is implemented a calendar that would begin on September 8th. And so I think that, again, to kind of show um, some uh, alignment with what we're seeing happening in the counties, I think it would be helpful to provide some options that would align with, with either of those two. Um, the suggestion for, Octo I'm sorry, for September 7th rather than September 8th is that we normally start on the Tuesday after Labor Day. So, um, so that, are, that, that's the motivation for those two, uh, two scenarios. Um, and then, um, and then essentially to look at, okay, what would a traditional calendar look like if we were to begin on September 7th? What would a traditional calendar look like if we were going to begin on October, I'm sorry, August 23rd? And then likewise, what would a extended year round calendar look like if we began on October, I'm sorry, August 23rd and September 7th? Um, but in both of those year-long calendars, you know, there's been a lot of feedback from um, uh, from from staff um, and uh, you know our educators that uh, that have you know have some concern that the uh, proposed intercession breaks on the current proposed calendar don't align with the the cadence of our school year as it's structured now. Um, and in reading the JLARC study, um, the way that uh, it's proposed now is actually quite different than any of the other year-long schedules that have been implemented across the state. Um, and so I think to, uh, to look at some of those scenarios, perhaps more in line with what um, you know, has been done at Patrick Henry, um, just to, to ensure that, that that cadence and that alignment academically is there. Um, the other piece of the, the motion, in addition to looking at some alternate calendar proposals, um, is related to looking at, you know, at a pilot. I think it's really important that, you know, that we at least consider what a pilot could look like. Um, again, going back to some of the previous scenarios and that um, were uh, included in that JLARC study that we've seen in the state, um, one of the things that I, I, you know, I took note of is that the real big difference between, um, you know, what we've proposed and what's been done before is in the amount of participation in those intercessions. And so, um, you know, as we know, what the report finding was, was that year long school, there was no noticeable difference in academic performance in year-round school um, for these, uh, you know, year-round schools versus traditional schools. That was the main takeaway. However, they did identify that there could be some benefit for African-American students with the year-long calendar. That said, the way that we've structured um, these, this system is very different than those other examples, um, where in those other uh, examples, they would execute year-round at the school, and I and and I, I believe everyone at the school had the option of being able to participate in the intercessions pieces. So um, students were attending the intercession in the same building, likely with many of the same classmates that they had throughout the year, um, which I think could that additional seat time I think could have a lot more benefit if there is that consistency there. And so, um, so the current proposal that's on the table, you know, gives me some pause that, um, you know, that by uh, offering these intercessions to such a small percentage of our students across the entire district may not provide us with, with the results that we're looking for. Um, you know, there's also been very little, uh, you know, in terms of what, happened at the state and looking at these year round programs, um, there's been very little evidence at the high school level and at the middle school level. And so, um, and so I, I personally think it's critical that we consider, we consider that path. And so um, I would like to see, you know, budget options for that. Um, and then finally, you know, uh, you know, there has also been lots of talk about what an expanded summer school program could look like 
you know, what could it look like if we were to offer that opportunity to, um, to many students, to even more students throughout the district? Um, you know, we've got this $14 million that I, I think there is an opportunity to see how we could put that to use, um, you know, not this summer, but next summer where, um, you know, students have gotten back into the swing of things. They've, they've had time in person with their, with their, um, with teachers. And, um, and I think at the end of that school year, then we could really assess, you know, where, where the needs are, um, where the opportunities are, and then um, plan a really robust and enhanced curriculum um, in the summertime to for those students across the board. So, um, so I think you know we um, I attended the, a community session last week. It was um, it was uh, I think insightful, um, and I think we owe the public the opportunity to say like, hey, we heard you. You know, these are some of the things that I, I think that people were asking for. Let's let's put those options on the table and um, and then have that dialogue so that as we move forward, um, you know, we 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 feel confident that we've you know uh, we've we've taken the time to ensure we've got the best option. Madam Chair, may I um, respond? Please, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Gibson. I appreciate the, the clarification. <clears throat> um, my concern is really one of timing. Um, it, it would not be possible. I would not be um, speaking truthfully if I said that we were able to provide all of these uh, various options uh, under the timeline uh, that you have proposed. But I think more importantly than that, um, I don't think our families or our staff um, are going to be able to weigh in effectively on a whole new set of options um, at this point in the year, uh, given that it is already quite frankly, quite late. And given that the board has decided not to take action tonight, we, the earliest we're talking about is essentially the beginning of April, which a number of our stakeholders have indicated is, is quite late. And so as, as we have seen with, with this latest version, we've worked for a month to get about 5,000 survey responses, um, about 500 um, uh, members to participate in the town halls. Um, and these calendars are complicated and they take time to, to really vet. So my concern is chiefly that I just don't think there would be time to vet all those options. And, and so given that, um, here's what I would at this juncture propose. Um, I think if the board wants to move forward with a year round proposal, I think realistically the board would have to move forward with uh, what we have presented at this time, only because it's what has been vetted, the public has been able to weigh in on, it's what the survey has been about. I think we're, we would easily be another to be to be fair to the community another one to two months away from being able to make that decision to give opportunities for for input and and that would put us into may and i i don't think anybody believes that that's a reasonable timeline to make this decision if the board is not prepared to move forward with this calendar um, at this point i would prefer a traditional calendar um, and we just focus on uh, summer school and uh, having a year round calendar kick in the following year. I think really those are our options at this point, at this late date in this year, uh, at this late point in the year. So again, just to, to clarify, I think if the board wants to proceed with year round, um, I think we have a viable option on the table. It is certainly not uh, without fault. Um, there are always compromises that we make in these processes. Um, I think if the board, again, wants to move forward with year round, I would recommend the one we've put forward. Um, if the board is, is concerned about the timeline and, and the other reasons that have been shared, I understand those, um, I completely respect that. Then I would counsel the board to uh, direct us, uh, the administration, to craft a traditional calendar uh, that we would implement for this coming school year um, with a year round commitment for the following year. Um, and then we can um, focus all of our energy, frankly, on the fall and a robust summer program. 
Um, I think two to four to six more weeks of debate uh, about how to move forward is frankly going to um, harm our ability to execute anything. And I think what our families and our teachers at this point most want is just clarity um, so that we can move forward expeditiously. Thank you so very much. Uh, Mr. Young, for discussion, who do we have listed? Yes, ma'am, Ms. Tor, Ms. Page, uh, Dr. Harris Muhammad, Ms. Rizzi. All right, Ms. Doerr. Thank you. Um, I have a couple of questions regarding the year-round calendar proposal as is. So um, I would respectfully ask uh, after this motion is voted on, um, yay or nay, um, I would love to have an additional conversation about the, the calendar in general. Um, so I'll, t I'll um, consolidate my comments just to the motion on the floor, which um, <clears throat> I, um, I would be interested in talking and talking about extended summer school. Um, I think that if, should the calendar not go through um, as proposed um, on March 29th, should we decide to have a meeting then? Um, I do think it's worth looking into a pilot. Um, but I agree with Mr. Cameras's thoughts. It was my thought as well. Um, I appreciate the creativity and the insight um, that Ms. Gibson has provided, but I think adding, I think it's three or four new proposals for the public to vet in two weeks feels like too much. So um, I would agree we should just make a decision whether we want to move forward with the extended year calendar as presented or, um, or not. Thank you, Ms. Dewar and Ms. Page. Yes, Madam Chair, thank you. Um, so I would like to continue the discussion with the existing cal calendar and a timeline for additional meetings for the next two weeks, because I appreciate my colleague bringing this motion forward, but I think it's too late in the game. And we want our parents to have a say so and to be informed as a regard their child's education. And I'll be quite honest, we are not Chesterfield and we are not Henrico County. Um, I don't think that they have half of their kids not reading. So we need to stop. We may have some similar challenges, but again, we are not Henrico and we are not Ch Chesterfield. This is Richmond City, Richmond Public Schools. And we need to address the needs of the students that we serve in Richmond City. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Page. Dr. Harris Muhammad. Yes, ma Madam Chair, um, I'm gonna request for clarity. Did we get a second on this motion or did the motion die? We received a second on the motion. We're okay. still discussing. Ms. Ms. White seconded the motion. Okay, thank you. I think it was Ms. White. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Ms. Rizzi? Thank you, Madam Chair. So frankly, you know, if we're saying that we don't have time to present um, our constituents, our stakeholders with other options when they are clearly asking for them, then um, I think we don't have time to do anything at all. And we may need to table this until a later date or until next year. Um, You know, I just, you know, at this point, I feel like as, you know, the original board, the board that requested this, told the public or at least requested options. What we got once we got on this board is a calendar and we were told here, vote on it. One calendar, one option that I've seen, you know, I know that there was some work previously done, but to the point that I've seen it, there's this calendar, no logistical plan, very few details and we've been told to vote on it. And I feel that that is rushed 
I don't like the feeling of the pressure of this. I don't feel like the community has collaborated enough to come up with what will be best for our children. And um, therefore, you know, if we don't have time for it, if we've got to rush it, if we've got to push this thing before it's all worked out, I would rather not deal with it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rizzi. Ms. Gibson? Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, I, I wholly agree with my colleague, Ms. Rizzi. And, and I'll be frank, I am, I am a bit confused. Um, you know, this, we, early at the beginning of this meeting, we talked about pushing this off to be voted on late, at a later date. I presume that was put on the table to allow more time for discussion, but I'm not sure what's the point of the discussion if we weren't going to entertain what we heard from constituents at those community meetings, right? So, I mean, we had a series of community meetings literally a day before we were scheduled to make a vote on something. And, um, and now we are saying there's no time to be able to react to them. I mean, that's essentially what, that's essentially what we're saying, you know, that, that we had these community discussions and it's too late to do anything with that. And so um, this, doesn't, this, doesn't, this doesn't feel like what community engagement is supposed to look like. Um, so, you know, I, it is true. I, I voted yes to a motion in July that said that the administration would come back with multiple options. We didn't see them. Um, and so I'm, I'm at a loss because I can assure you, I've made the request multiple times to see these other options. These are not, this is nothing new. Um, and I find it uh, somewhat disappointing that, that, I, that I have to put a motion on the table to, um, to get something that we were promised um, last summer. So, um, so yes, I think, uh, if, if the discussion, if we're saying there's not time to react to what we heard yesterday, then, um, then I do say, then let's move forward with looking at those traditional uh, calendar options for next year and let's move on. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Young. We have anyone else before we vote? Yes, ma'am. Ms. White, Dr. Harris Muhammad, then the superintendent. All right, Ms. White. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I'm, I have to echo the sentiments of my uh, colleagues because when someone said that we don't have time, I have spent um, four, came to four community engagements. That's almost 534 people. I've been to three schools, all three of my schools and talked to all of my teachers, 75 of my teachers. I even went to Gilpin Court that is another district that has no one engage the families there. But these are the families that we're saying that we want to be a part of the 5,000 of our students and no one has engaged them. But we don't have time for other options for our families. We have time to listen to two hours worth of letters but we don't have time to have other options. Well, my suggestion, Will, we don't have time. We don't, really don't have time for safety because we haven't done anything in our schools for a whole year. So what I would suggest is that we'll take what the Department of Education has stated when we had the meeting the other day. Why not take the grant or have your grant writers write, write for the grant and help them plan a year round calendar for 2022 because we don't have time for our constituents. And we all sit here and we represent our constituents. This is nothing new. The children learning loss that we're complaining that it just happened during the pandemic. No, this just didn't happen just now. We need to go some years back. But now since we have a fix for it and no one wants to do an option, well, there's no reason to have this calendar. You're gonna change someone's whole life when people are going through emotional exhaustion, mental well-being, and we're not concerned about how they want their students to go to school. I care about my children, so I really want to know 
what we're going to do for fall 2020. What is the safety? What do we have in place for safety? We haven't done anything to our school. You sent and you, you, you gave us a, a board to, to look at that nothing is really done in there. So I'm not, I'm not um, impressed with this calendar at all. So I can say the same thing as my colleagues. We can put this calendar on hold for 2020 if we're not gonna address our constituents and our families and our students and our teachers. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. White. Dr. Harris Muhammad. Yes, ma'am. I, I closed the discussion so we can we have a motion on the floor. Right. We can vote on that motion and um, as as board members see fit, move forward. And then after that, I, I do have a motion, Madam Chair. All right. Uh, Mr. Young, anyone else? Otherwise, we are ready for the vote. We'll have anyone else? Yep. Yes, ma'am. Ms. Page, Ms. Jones, and then the superintendent. All right, Ms. Page, then we'll after the superintendent, we will proceed with the vote. Ms. Um, Page. Ms. Madam Chair, I will yes, let my colleague, Ms. Jones, speak. Please go ahead, Ms. Page. You both can speak. No, I. I you sure? I um, give my. You can't give it to her. Do you, want, do you want to speak? Go ahead. No, I don't have a comment. <laughs> All right. Ms. Jones. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I was just listening and what I heard was not that we didn't have time. What I heard was that the longer we prolong this and the longer we continue to go week after week after week to add on to what we're already discussing is the problem or is going to or a barrier. I personally, I'm not sure. Um, my colleague, Ms. Gibson said that she had been asking for several um, variations of the calendar. And I think as a board, that is something that we have not discussed. I'm not saying that what you requested um, didn't happen, but I also think that we are also not, we, we started with, we don't have enough community engagement. And so we went and we did the, com the conversations and I agree that we did them too soon and we did not have enough time to really kind of evaluate what was said, what was stated. And so to put a motion on the table that, that, that ultimately speaks to information that has just clearly been stated we don't have, how are we making a decision to say, can we talk about, um, this motion and come back with very, we haven't heard the responses of the community yet. So I think it would behoove us to listen to what was said and shared before we actually make a deciding factor on how to move forward. And I keep hearing us say that we don't have time. That's not what I heard. I mean, teachers need time to plan. Teachers need time to know what's happening. And the longer we hold this up, um, even if that is the case, I think we have to come together and decide, do we want to move forward with a traditional calendar? Are we going to work with this uh, proposal that has been presented, um, but it just feels like we all, and I'm gonna hold myself a part of this as well, if we continue to flip flop on where we are, because tonight we were clearly ready to vote and then we all made the deciding factor that we felt like it wasn't time. So now we're gonna go back and come back and say, well, let's do that. Like I'm, I'm confused. So I think it's creating um, a, a level of confusion that does not really look good for us and what we're trying to do here. So uh, I just, that was more of a comment, not necessarily a, a question, but I do think um, we do have to decide which way we want to move because the longer we continue to say, hey, let's go this day, let's go that day, let's, what, what do we want? Do we want community engagement? And if that's what it is, which is what was the original motion Ms. Page put out, and we pretty much were ready to vote on that. And then Ms. Gibson put the motion out that we have discussion. We have not had the discussion yet. And now we on a third thing, moving to a new motion with another motion coming behind it. So how are we going to decide on something when we are not even deciding what we want to do um, on one thing? So that was just my, my, my point that I wanted to share. Thank you so much, Ms. Jones. Thank you. Mr. Cameras. 
I, I'm good, thank you. All right, Mrs. Um, we're ready to vote. There's no one else to speak. Ms. Gibson, would you restate your, your motion, please? I know it's in the chat. Sure. The motion is that the administration present the board with calendar options to include traditional calendars and year round calendars for both August 23rd, 2021 and September 7th, 2021 start dates. The year round calendar versions will align intercession breaks with our nine week calendar. The district will also provide at least two additional budget scenarios, including year round school pilots at an elementary school, middle school, and high school, where all enrolled students at each school have the option of participating in planned intercessions. The second budget will be for an expanded and enhanced summer school program to begin in July 2022. These items will be made public by March 26, 2021, discussed at a special meeting on March 29th, 2021, and voted on at our April 5th, 2021 meeting. And uh, Ms. White second the motion. Ma Madam um, Attorney, we're ready to vote. Yes, Ms. Doerr. No. Ms. White? Yes. Ms. Gibson? Yes. Mr. Young? No. Ms. Rizzi? Yes. Dr. Harris Muhammad? Yes. Ms. Burke? No. Ms. Page? No. Ms. Jones? No. The motion fails, 5-4. Thank you, Ms. Lilly. All right, um, Dr. Muhammad, you stated you had a, another motion to make? Um, yes, before I make that motion, though, I wanna get some clarity. We are, and it's just been a long night, so, so school board colleagues, please forgive me. It's been a long night for all of us. I just wanna get some clarity that we are coming back on March the 29th to um, Ms. Page made a suggestion earlier to come back on March the 29th to, after we gather two weeks of data, then we'll come back on March the 29th to discuss that data and then vote, correct? Correct, but she didn't make it a motion. She made it, a, she, it was a suggestion. Made, excuse me, she made it a motion, but the motion was amended. It was amended. So, okay. so right now that's still out there. So not unless okay. Ms. Page wanted to come back. I don't know if she Make wanted to come motion. back. I, okay, well, so with that, then I would like to make a motion. I move that the administration focuses on traditional calendar with a commitment from this governance team to implement a year round calendar for the FY22-23 school year while creating a robust summer school for the 20 one school summer term. All right, um, Dr. Harris Muhammad, okay. would you repeat that? Because I heard I heard year round calendar and then I heard summer school. I, I'm not, I need clarity yes, as you would say. Yes ma'am, <laughs> yes ma'am. A little bit slower, a little bit slower. Sure, I sure will. Miss Lily, what did you say? Can you please put that in the chat? So I was trying to right. type it fast as you were talking, so. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, I will, I will put it in the chat. I move that the administration focuses on a traditional calendar with a commitment from this governance team to implement a year round calendar for the FY22-23 school year while creating a robust summer school plan. Got it. And I think some, I think, um, okay. thank you, Ms. White second. Now, Ms. are we ready for discussion? Mr. Young, do we have anyone listed? Yes, ma'am. Uh, Ms. Doerr first. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Doerr, the floor is yours. Uh, uh, just a clarification, the FY22 school year is the upcoming school year as in September of 2021, or is it to, could someone speak to that? Y yes. Yes. It, it, we're ending a 2021 school year. Right. And, and June the 30th, July 1st starts a 21, 
2022 school year. Ms. Dora, thank you. Thank you. I was, thank you. I appreciate it. I, I, I needed to hear what you said. The 21, no, excuse me, the 20, yeah, I was right, the 22, 23 school year because the 21, <laughs> the 21, yeah. it's these 21s and 20s. The 21, 22 school year would be the traditional calendar. Right. After such, 20, to 23, we would be committed to implementing a year round calendar. You follow me? Yes, thank you. Okay, absolutely. It's clear. Thank you. It's clear. Thank you. So, right now, we're in the 2021 school year. Absolutely. So, your motion is, as you're writing it in the chat, is that um, we stay for the traditional um, return of school for this year and implement the 20 with a robust summer school session and implement the year round calendar for the 22-23 school year, correct? Yes, ma'am. All right, uh, are we ready? Any more discussion, Mr. Yeah. Ms. Rizzi and then Ms. Gibson. All right, Ms. Rizzi. Okay, so what's kind of interesting is that I made a post on Facebook today from where like Tom Cotton and Merrick Garland were having a discussion and Garland said, um, you know, I don't make commitments unless I know the facts first. And so what I'm asking is that um, perhaps this motion could be amended to say that um, we will commit to either researching, investigating, or studying best options for year-round school with appropriate community engagement or to ensuring that we have appropriate community engagement. I don't necessarily want to commit to that, if, our, if we discover after much study and investigating and looking at research that this may not be the best option for our kids. So I, I just ne don't necessarily want to be committed to anything at this point until we know all the facts and we've had all the community engagement. So, so Madam Chair, may I? I, I, I I'd like to put a formal amendment on the table. I don't know that, I, I think I could, we could just do that. So um, following well, Ms. One, one moment, recommendation. One, one moment, please. One moment, one moment. Ms. Ms. Muhammad, Dr. Muhammad asks for the floor and then we'll, we'll flow with the next person in line. I, I just wanted to, um, Ms. Rizzi, thank you for that. I wanted to make sure that I repeated it, have it worded the way that you're requesting. Mm -hmm. um, I move that the administration focuses on a traditional calendar with a commitment from the governance team to continue the research, mm -hmm. community right. engagements, right. and collect all data to move forward with implementation of a year round school for the calendar FY 22 well, potential move. I, you know, I just don't wanna commit even to the year round necessarily if that's not what we find will be best. That's what I'm saying. And so we could implement, uh, not implement, research, investigate, study perhaps, <laughs> maybe one of those words. Um, year-round school options um, with appropriate community engagement um, and not necessarily commit to that, but commit to implementing it unless we find that it is what's best. So, I, don't know, I mean, I'd like the amendment to reflect that we have the option of doing something else. And, 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 and your suggestion can reflect that it's too many. Yeah, well, I understand. No, 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 no. I was just going to say, I, I think we, we, we have to be willing to, I, I hear you and, and I, I'm open to amending it. Absolutely. But I also want us to be committed to doing the things that we put in. That's why I was wording it a certain way mm -hmm. to be committed to doing the data collection with the administration, continue with the community engagement. Um, whatever that looks like, surveys externally, what, you know. All right. Yeah, so, right now we're getting into the... Yeah, we're getting into the weed, right. Yes, we get, I, I didn't want to say it that way. Weed, right, I think yes, that's yes. the <laughs> Yes, yes, we are. Um, so right now we have an amended motion on the floor from Ms. Rizzi. Ms. Rizzi, would you repeat your amended motion, please, to Mrs. Dr. Muhammad's motion? So has Dr. Muhammad put the motion in the chat? I don't see it. 
I was trying, honey, to put <laughs> to put your um, verbiage into my motion. So let me do that. Let me do that right now. And then we, I don't think we, well, to Ms. Rizzi's motion, then we would need a uh, second. Which then, therefore, it's, it's technically now then Dr. Mrs. Rizzi's motion because she amended Dr. Harris Muhammad's motion. And we have a question from Nicole Jones. Ms. Jones, why are we waiting on that? I think it was a few people before me, but Dr. Harris. Well, I'm Muhammad sorry. I just saw your name pop up. I'm sorry. Forgive me. Ms. Yeah, Mr. I just Young. Want... Oh, sorry. <laughs> my, my fault. Mr. Young, was there someone before Ms. Jones? Yes, ma'am. Uh, the superintendent requested the opportunity to speak, but also Miss uh, Miss Page is uh, is scheduled to speak. Okay, Mr. Cameras, then Miss Page, then Miss Jones, and then we'll vote. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, full transparency, I'm a little bit confused as to where we are right now. So I imagine a lot of families watching are a little bit confused. And the, the, the one theme I feel like I've heard the most from teachers and families is whatever we do, just we need to decide. That folks need clarity, they need to plan their lives, that the lack of clarity and the here and there and is causing immense anxiety on top of the anxiety they are already experiencing with COVID and not knowing, can I do the family reunion in August or I can't do the family reunion or I might be able to make the extra money or I might not be able to make is <laughs> gnawing at everyone. And so uh, in the interests of clarity and just moving us forward, I was prepared to support Dr. Harris Muhammad's original motion of committing to a year round calendar for the 22-23 school year. Details we have to work through and we can iterate and whatnot, but let's put a stake in the ground for 22-23. Let's do a traditional calendar for this coming year with a robust summer school and move on. And the reason I, I do feel passionate about this commitment is the PALS data we just looked at. We have a reading crisis mm -hmm. that is going to impact our students for the rest of their lives unless we deal with it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Given where we are in the year and the many different opinions about how to proceed, honoring that division, I am prepared to set aside my recommendation to move forward with the year-round calendar for next year. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's put all of our energy into summer school and a great 21-22 year, and let's commit now that going into the following year, we will go year round, spend all the time to come up with the year on calendar that makes the most sense for our community. Let's decide that tonight so that our families and our teachers and our kids can plan their lives and we can get to the work of reopening Richmond Public Schools. Thank you, Mr. Cameras. Um, Ms. Page, I think you're next. And then Ms. Jones. Yes. Is that right? um, Madam Chair, um, I'm really disturbed because we are not being clear or concise or we're not making a commitment to no one thing. This is not fair to our families and the staff, the students that we serve, more importantly, the students and the staff. 
we need to make a decision and we need to make a decision tonight and be very clear. We're all over the place. And I'm really at a loss. I'm at a loss for words. Thank you, Ms. Page. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Jones. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to say that um, we're all passionate about this. We all want the same thing. And contrary to popular belief and difference of opinions, I wholeheartedly believe that we all just want to do the right thing for our 25,000 students. Like, how are the children is the question we should be asking. And so I think that now we have had enough. It's 1101. I'm not trying to say who can or can't speak, but I just think that we should maybe take a moment to just kind of breathe and recalibrate and let's move on whatever decision, whichever way we go and, you know, let folks finish their comments so that everyone can feel heard um, and support it, whether we agree or we don't. And let's do what we have to do to Mr. Karens. I couldn't have said it um, more eloquently. Um, I do think that we are, you know, creating a lot of confusion right now. And that's not the intent on anyone's part, but we just are passionate and we want to support folks, but we have to do it in a way that doesn't look like um, we don't know what we talking about. So um, I just want to say that I respect everyone here. I respect everyone's opinions and perspectives. And I know that everyone is just passionate about this matter but we can't hold on to that so strong that is holding us from moving forward. And we're in a stuck pattern of trying to make a decision that is a tough one, but one that we can really make together and do what we need to do. So I just wanted to close on my on that. <laughs> Ms. Jones, if I may, thank you so much. You never point anybody out singly in a negative manner. You always come across to keep us grounded. And we all are passionate about this decision. This is also a big change for us. As one of our constituents stated about Arthur Ashe, um, quote on change. This, this, this is a hard decision to make. And right now we are all over the place and we're getting into the weeds as well. So I'm gonna bring us back if I may. Was there someone else, Mr. Mr. Young, before we go back to the motion? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am, Ms. Rizzi, Ms. Gibson, Madam Chair, you, and then, uh, and then yours truly. Um, Thank you, Ms. Rizzi? Yes, you know, before we took that detour, I felt like we were finally getting somewhere. I mean, I can be dramatic and say, oh my God, you know, we are, you know, I can be dramatic, right? But I'd rather just very um, rationally state the motion. And if it fails, it fails. Now, first of all, I haven't made a motion yet. Don't mess this up for me. <laughs> if it fails, it just fails. But, you know, I, I think that I have a right to make this amendment. And if it doesn't pass, it doesn't pass. I'm not going to take it personally. And I'm not disagreeing with anyone here. I just want to come to the decision that's going to be best for our community. I ran on a platform of prioritizing community voices. And so that is always going to be one of my priorities when I am voting and when I am proposing things and when I am asking questions. So, I mean, if you don't want the public to have a, have a, a, a say in this, which it appears to me, many people, I mean, some of us may not, you know, trust them to make this decision or, or to lead us to where we need to get as a district. Um, then that's fine, but I would like to be able to make my motion. Um, sure. And if it fails, it fails. Absolutely. I'm going to go ahead and call the other persons listed, and then we'll come back. Hopefully, Ms. Muhammad, Dr. Muhammad has placed it in the chat. You asked that, and then we'll come back to you to make the motion again, and we'll move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Ms. Gibson? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so I... I uh, 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 early on, you know, I, 
I had wanted to make a, a, a motion to make an amendment on the motion on the table, which I think I do think it makes sense, you know, that we move forward. And I was I was glad to hear uh, from Mr. Cameras, uh, you know, support in that um, because it is late in the game. And um, and so I'm not sure why, you know, initially we were talking about not even having this conversation at all this evening. So I, know. <laughs> uh, I am glad that that we we had this conversation. Um, and so if Ms. Rizzi is open to it, I think a possible for the uh, revised motion would be to, um, uh, it would say, I move that the administration focuses on a traditional or develop a traditional calendar for the 2021-22 uh, school year. Um, and, and then uh, with the understanding that the board will um, uh, uh, research a possible, po possible pilots for the 22-23 school year. So you're amending Mrs. Rizzi's motion that she hasn't fully made yet? No, I mean, I, I'm not amending her thing because she, I mean, if, if she wants, I'm just kind of throwing that out there. I defer to her on what she wants and I will support yeah, whatever let's, amendment that she makes, please. Let's, um, let's give her an opportunity to make her motion after the next person speaks. I think that's it. And then we'll come back to her. And then if you want to amend her motion, we can do that. Okay. And, um, Who's, is, who's next on the list, Mr. Yeah. Madam Chair, okay. I believe you are to be followed by me and then Dr. Harris Muhammad. All right. All right. Um, colleagues, as we all want to serve and be mindful of our, our districts, the people of which we, we are serving, we want to be a fair across the board. Um, as Ms. Weiss stated as well, I spent time this past week um, at my schools. One of them had an activity on the front yard giving out um, posters, signs for perfect attendance. And it was, I was really had the opportunity to hear from a lot of parents who didn't write in, who may not be tuned in this afternoon, as well as um, faculty and staff that were engaged during that activity. And um, I've received lots of phone calls from retired teachers, some former students who are parents as well. And um, nine out of 10 of the people that I had an opportunity to spend time with were in favor of the year round school. I understand what Ms. Page is saying regarding giving everybody else a chance that may not have had a chance because it's, it's never gonna be 100% of the agreement. We know it's not gonna be 100%. So I do think that we're mindful of each of our districts and each of the needs of, of um, all of the persons of which we represent, as Ms. Jones so eloquently stated, that we're passionate about this decision. So no, it's not personal, this is business and keeping the main thing, the main thing. But whether we, would at, but we function together as a team, as a unit. So I just would like to see us reach consensus but right now there are two or three different things on the table. So I'm gonna go back to what Mr. Young, then someone else was speaking, then back to Ms. Rizzi's motion. Mr. Young. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll be brief given the lateness of the hour. First, as it relates to soliciting public comment, I want to thank all of the thousands of persons who weighed in, uh, who participated in town halls, uh, who submitted public comment, uh, who uh, called or emailed us, uh, the approximately 5,000 families who've participated in the survey. And, uh, and, and I would be remiss to not share and the hundreds, if, if not thousands uh, of persons who I had a conversation with in 2020 at their doorstop uh, pertinent to this very subject. Uh, so let me say that first. Uh, second, uh, I will, uh, be voting no as it relates to the the motion or motions plural on the floor because candidly uh, they uh, they constitute business as usual and uh, I have no intent to support that. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Young. Was there someone after you? Yes, ma'am. Dr. 
Thank you. Dr. Harris Muhammad, the floor is yours. Very quickly, um, Ms. Renzi, I, I believe you might want to look at that year. You have, we're in that year right now. So you want to look at it for the 22-23 school year because the next year is the 21-22 school year. So, and, and the, reason why, the reason why I'm bringing this up is because the way that you put the motion in the chat right now will have to, we, we, couldn't, we couldn't agree with that. You, you know what I'm saying? It will fail based on that year. So we want the correct year in there. Thank you, Dr. You're, Harris you're Muhammad. Right, Dr. Muhammad. Thank you, Dr. Harris Muhammad. Yes, ma'am. So I just wanted to ready? make sure you, knew, you know, you, you knew that with love. That's all I, I wanted. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so very much. Um, Ms. Rizzi, are you ready? Oh, excuse me, Ms. Lilly? I'm sorry, Ms. Ms. Rizzi, were you? I, I just wanted to see if I could, because there was another motion in the chat I wanted to clarify. If Ms. Rizzi is about to make her amendment, I just wanted to make it clear what posture we're in. Ms. Rizzi, you were making an amendment to the motion, right? The original motion, is that correct? Okay. All right, Ms. Rizzi, you ready? And Madam Chair, I'm sorry. Uh, Ms. Page also asked for the opportunity to speak. All right, Ms. Page, then Ms. Rizzi with the motion. Thank you. Um, not to um, belabor the point, yes, we all are passionate. But we've seen the POW scores. And I think more than one of us have stated that um, our children cannot wait. They cannot wait. Because the longer we keep having this discussion, the further and further we push things down the road. Um, I can support Dr. Shonda Harris Muhammad original motion, but again, our children cannot wait. They cannot. And we have to make a clear, concise and informed decision that we can you know, articulate with our families, you know, our communities, all of our communities, not just some communities, but all of our communities. Um, again, our children cannot wait. Thank you, Mrs. Page. Now, Mrs. Rizzi, Ms. are you ready? I'm sorry, is there someone else? And then after that, that's the last person that Ms. Rizzi is gonna make a motion, all right? Who's next, Mr. Yeah? Yes, ma'am, well, now I, now I feel bad. Uh, yours truly just wanted to take a second. <laughs> Go right ahead. Uh, but per perhaps, I, perhaps I shouldn't, and this may be the late hour. I just, uh, I, have to, I have to share, I'm, I'm terribly disappointed. Richmond Public Schools is going to, Richmond Public Schools has said to essentially 23 out of 24,000 of our students uh, for, some understandable reasons, though everyone, uh, everyone in this call knows that I, uh, I voted not once but twice to resume in person for teachers and for for students that uh, that opted in. We have said we've said that no, not even for those persons that want to opt in, that volunteer, that say they want to uh, resume in person. That that's not good enough. Twenty three out of twenty four thousand students. No, we're going to deprive you of the opportunity to have education in person. And now we're unwilling to provide them with the support to play catch up. I'm terribly disappointed. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Young. Ms. Rizzi, are you ready to make your motion? Yes, Bye. and I do want to say I have talked to all but one of my principals about this. I have visited people. I've talked with community members. I, I have talked with young people. Um, there was one young man who called me, you know, and from, he was a high schooler and we had a great conversation about this. And so I just think that there's some other, other ideas and there's possibilities out there that we're not considering. We're boxing ourselves in ourselves into this one thing without considering other possibilities. So I'm going to read the motion now. If it fails, it fails, you know, and I'm proud of myself. I'm going to make a motion. <laughs> All right. So, um, uh, all right, 
right. So I move to amend the original motion to state that the administration focuses on a traditional calendar for the 2021-22 school year with a commitment from the governance team to impl implement a year-round calendar for the 2022-23 school year once appropriate community engagement and research has been conducted while creating a robust summer school plan. Thank you, Ms. Rizzi, with your motion. And who seconds? I think I... I second. All right, Mrs. Gibson second. Are we ready to vote? Mrs. Um, <laughs> Ms. Attorney Clerk? <laughs> I'm sorry. Call yes. the roll. Yes, now this is only on the amendment, whether to amend, and then if, pa if this passes, we'll vote on it as the main motion. So to amend, Ms. Doerr? No. Ms. White? Yes. Ms. Gibson? Yes. Mr. Young? No. Ms. Rizzi? Yes. Dr. Harris Muhammad? No. Ms. Burke? No. Ms. Page? No. Ms. Jones? No. I believe that uh, that motion, uh, the motion fails. I believe that's six, three. One. That's correct. <clears throat> so the original motion is back before you uh, made by Dr. Harris Muhammad, <clears throat> seconded by Ms. White. Ms. Uh, excuse me, Dr. Harris Muhammad moved that the administration focuses on a traditional calendar with a commitment from the governance team to implement a year round calendar for the, uh, for the school year 22-23 while creating a robust summer school plan. Thank you, Ms. Lilly. Are we ready to vote? Was that second? Was seconded by Ms. White. Okay, thank you. All right, is there any discussion? Yes, ma'am. First, Ms. Gibson, then Dr. Harris Muhammad. Ms. Gibson? Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I uh, I'm plan on voting in support of the motion on the table, although I much preferred the revised language that Ms. Lizzie, Rizzi stated. And I'll be frank, I, I do that because, um, you know, we have time to change our mind either way. So, um, you know, I, I do think that before we make a commitment to, uh, to, to the 22-23 school year, we still have more work to do. Um, and I hope that we do consider a, a pilot um, a program for the next year. Um, so, but I, I would like to get some closure this evening. I, I think it would be, uh, uh, you know, in everyone's best interest. And, um, and so I, I, I would be prepared to move forward with this for that reason. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Gibson. Dr. Harris Muhammad. Yes, ma'am, very quickly. Thank you, Madam Chair. The wording in our motions are critically important that we do not sound as if we are digging into the weeds beyond our governance. And so that is why my, my motion is worded the way that it is worded because the commitment does not mean that the, the entire division to, to educate our public that the entire division will be year round. It means that we are making a commitment as a governance team to move forward in this direction, however it looks. And so Ms. Gibson stated that we have time. Um, it, it does not have to look the way that people may think, but I just wanted to share that because certain vocabulary and motions um, that I was hearing tonight was putting us out of our purview of a governance. Right. And I did not want to do that because it is not our responsibility, ladies and gentlemen, to collect the data. It is not our responsibility to do the research. That is why we pay the people that we're paying to do that. And so I didn't want to be held um, to the fire to go get the research when that's not my purview. Mm -hmm. So th that's why I, I just wanted to share that because yeah. some people in the audience may not understand that language, but it's it's a fine language and, and I'm not willing to cross that. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Harris Muhammad. All right, are we ready to, was anyone else, Mr. Um, yeah? Yes, ma'am, Ms. Dort. Ms. Dort, uh, Ms. Dort. Oh, oh, thank you. Um, 
Uh, I uh, plan on supporting this and I think um, the wording does say commitment and I think that um, I would like to see us as a governance board commit to the year round calendar that we're voting on for the 22-23 school year. So I think it's important that uh, we provide clarity to the public that we are remaining, uh, if, if this goes forward, that it's um, year round this year, or sorry, traditional this year, this upcoming school year, and a commitment for a year round alternate schedule for next year. Um, I, I think we are elected to make decisions and give clear guidance. And I just want to be really clear in my intention in supporting this. Thank you, Ms. Doerr. All right, Mrs. Lilly, we're ready to vote. Uh, Madam Chair, I'm sorry, Ms. Rizzi. Oh. oh, I'm sorry, Ms. Rizzi. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just had one other comment. Um, in the motion I stated, I said once appropriate community engagement is, and research has been conducted, um, that did not say that the board would be conducting that research. Um, so I just wanted to make that clarification. Thank you, Ms. For Rizzi. the record. Yes, thank you. Now, Mr. Young, are we ready now? Okay, Mrs. Lilly. Motion made by Dr. Harris Muhammad, seconded by Ms. White. Ms. Doerr? Yes. Ms. White? Yes. Ms. Gibson? Yes. Mr. Young? No. Ms. Rizzi? Yes. Dr. Harris Muhammad? Yes. Ms. Burke? Yes. Ms. Page? Yes. Ms. Jones? Yes. Motion passes 8-1. All right, well, congratulations, everyone. We did, we changed it as an action item, but we ended up making it an action item. So um, just to make sure we're all clear, we're going to have, um, traditional calendar for this school year and then moving to 22, 23 year with added changes for a year round. Okay, before we move forward, colleagues, and because of the hour, I'm gonna move ahead with the other action items. However, I did receive um, thumbs up that it's okay for us to reschedule 6.03, the special advisory committee's report, and also the Head Start governance training that we would reschedule that as well. Madam Chair, right. Ms. Ms. Gibson requests the opportunity to speak. All right. Was there anyone, um, Ms. Gibson, was it pertaining to those two items? No, I just wanted to say, so, I mean, basically we're still leaving the public hanging a bit because we haven't determined what the first day of school is. And so um, I just wanna restate my preference that we proceed we, with two options, either an August 23rd or the September 7th date to, um, to be consistent with what we're seeing um, uh, in, the, in the counties. And I, 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 I think it would be, if we could at least give the community that understanding, I think that would also provide some, some good closure for folks. Well, Ms. Gibson, um, we're not meeting on the 29th as originally suggested. And I believe most of us thought regarding the we go back and look at the numbers that we would not meet the first week of April, which is spring break, that we would have our meeting on April 12th. So that notice needs to go out. So um, Mr. Um, Cameron, so you all would bring back suggestions as to what we're gonna do at that date. Is that too late? April 12th? Do uh, we need? That, that feels late to me. Um, late to me too. Yeah, um, so. I think the board the board should either decide tonight uh, what date they want to start the school year, um, the twenty third or the seventh, or um, or put a a meeting on for the 29th to discuss it. Um, I defer to the board. I just think again, our our families expected a a vote tonight and. They, we got to a vote tonight, so I think that's a great thing. Um, but again, I think clarity around if I have something planned on August 25th, can I go to it or not is, right. is what folks are really hoping. I mean, we heard in 
one of the town halls, one of our teachers had a girl's trip that she had to reschedule from during COVID and it's oh. now August, the last week of August. And she wanted to know, like, do I have to reschedule it again or not? And I, I think okay. everybody's just kind of exhausted. So I think we should kind of decide. Um, and, and what I was imagining was we were gonna start after Labor Day. That's what I heard in terms of traditional. Um, okay. And we just so, yeah. call it and go forward. All right, Ms. Gibson, do you want to make a um, motion for the 7th, the day after Labor Day? Sure, I motion that the 2021-22 uh, school year begin on September 7th, 2021. Dr. Harris Muhammad? I second that motion. Thank you. It's been moved and properly second that the school year for our students will start on September 7th. 2021. Are we ready to vote? Question? Discussion? All right, Mrs. Lilly. Madam Chair, I, 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 I'm oh, sure. I'm sorry. Ms. Page did uh, request an opportunity to speak, but that was that immediately preceded the motion. So I'm unsure if it pertains to this motion or not. No, oh, I'm I don't have anything to say. Thank you, Ms. Ms. Page. All right, Ms. Lilly, we're ready to vote. You, you're Make muted. Sure that I can make sure the motion is correct. Um, Ms. Gibson, what I got, got from that conversation was that school would start for the for the 21, 20, wait a minute, 21, 22 school years would start on September the 7th. Is that for correct? Students. For students. Right. Correct. And it was seconded by Dr. Harris Muhammad. Right. One, nine, seven. All right. Ms. Doerr? Yes. Ms. White? Yes. Ms. Gibson? Yes. Mr. Young? No. Ms. Rizzi? Yes. Dr. Harris Muhammad? Yes. Ms. Burke? Yes. Ms. Page? Yes. Ms. Jones? Yes. Motion passes 8-1. Uh, Thank you, Ms. Lilly. I really appreciate that. Um, Carlise, I didn't hear. Were you in agreement with moving those two um, actions to a later date? I can make a motion. Thank you. Who was that? Dr. Harris Muhammad. All right. Do we need a motion, Ms. Lilly, or just thumbs up, thumbs down? What do we if need? There's, uh, excuse me. If there's general consensus okay. that we need for a motion, if there are any objections, then they can be lodged and we can move forward. Thumbs up or thumbs down would help to move quickly. Okay. Majority of statements. is okay. To, we're going to move. And that's under Dr. Epp's um, department. 8.01 and the um, 6.03. Madam All right, Chair. if we can move on to the next item. Madam, uh, I'm sorry, I missed something. Um, Madam Chair, there's one other piece of unfinished business related to the calendar. Um, we do need to have some clarity on how we're going to be using those CARES Act funds if we are um, not proceeding with the full year calendar this year. And so, um, again, I don't, we don't need to have a discussion, but we do need to figure out how that is going to happen. Yes. Excellent. Uh, so, Mr. Cameras, you want to respond? We haven't gotten the money yet, though, right? No. We haven't even put the uh, application in. We're still working on it. I will, um, I'll bring a proposal to yeah. the board um, at an upcoming meeting. Thank you so much. All right. We're ready to move for, to 5.02. Receive for action change in the agent, deputy agent, Mr. Cameras. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, now that we have a chief operating officer, uh, Ms. Gonzalez, uh, I would like to adjust uh, my agent and deputy agent. So Ms. Gonzalez um, as my agent and then Dr. Epp as my deputy agent and that both would be authorized to sign on my behalf. Excellent, so we need a motion for that. May I get a motion for that please? Dr. Harris Muhammad. 
I move that we accept the recommendation from the superintendent to change his agent and his deputy agent. Do I need to say the names? I don't want to mess up. Ms. Gonzalez. Mm -hmm. So let me let me restate the motion with her name. I move that we accept the superintendent's recommendation to assign Ms. Gonzalez as the agent and Dr. Epps as the deputy agent. Excellent. Thank you so very much. Is and, there a second? Is there a second? And it's critical for um, the paperwork for the DOE that the motion also indicate that they will be able to sign in his state, in his place. Right. I will revise my motion. Thank you. I move that we accept the superintendent's recommendation to make Mrs. Gonzalez the agent and Dr. Epp the deputy agent, therefore allowing them to sign in his absence. Thank you so much. May I get a second, please? Second. All right, Ms. Dura second. Dr. Harris Muhammad made the motion. We're ready to vote, Ms. Lilly. Ms. Doar? Yes. <clears throat> Ms. White? Yes. Ms. Gibson? Yes. Mr. Young? Aye. Ms. Rizzi? Yes. Dr. Harris Muhammad? Yes. Ms. Burt? Yes. Ms. Page? Yes. Ms. Jones? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you so very much. We can now move to the next board action item, 5.03, receive for action to personnel actions. That would be Mrs. Lee. Thank you, Madam Chair. Tonight, the talent office is bringing forth the following personnel actions for your consideration. Uh, the nomination of three employees, the change of contract of five employees, the resignations of seven employees, the furlough of four employees, the returning from leave of one employee, the retirement of four employees, and the name change of three employees. Thank you. All right, um, I need a motion to accept that report from personnel. I see a second, I but I don't a, see the motion. I made a mo. I mean, I put it in the chat. Oh, you did? Okay. Can you I mean, state well, the I can say it. Yeah. Thank you, please. Yes, ma'am. I move that we accept the human resources actions as presented. And I believe Ms. Page, did you second? Yes. All right. It's been moved by Dr. Harris Muhammad and Page, excuse me, and seconded by Ms. Page to accept the personnel actions. Are we ready to vote? Madam, Madam President, I have a motion. Okie dokie. Um, so you want to amend that motion that's on the floor? Yes. All right. Go right ahead, Ms. White. Um, I would like to um, amend the motion on the floor. I move that every termination be consulted and fully discussed with nine members of the school board will fax to why terminations have been recommended. Ms. Lilly, can we, Ms. Lilly, can you expand the, can we, is that um, under our governance? <clears throat> that, I mean, quite, I mean, that's quite honestly a separate, I mean, a separate action from what's presented tonight um, and that's something that as a board and as um, the board becomes familiar with this role with respect to where they are in the termination process, that looks very differently. So I would respectfully request that, you know, we talk about the, pr the process first before we get in involved with um, that because there are certain instances where the board, um, there are no, there are no termination actions on this agenda tonight. So that, you know, the, 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 the motion doesn't fit with the personnel actions, but then outside of that, there are some instances where the board cannot be involved in that process until a certain point in time, which um, you may want to, we need to talk that through before that motion is voted. 
up or down. See, that's another reason why we need to finish up our governance training. Oh. Because all that is explained in that as well, what our role would be. I got a question, uh, Ms. Lilly. So what you're saying is because there's no termination on the uh, <clears throat> the report tonight, then this, this motion doesn't go, but that is still a personnel action. What, so what, what, what I'm suggesting is that Ms. <clears throat> Ms. what I'm stating to be clear is that Ms. Ms. Uh, excuse me, Dr. Harris Muhammad's motion on the floor was to accept the personnel actions as presented. Right. Typically a motion to amend affects the original motion. The termination piece, what I'm suggesting is that there, that is what you're, what you're asking to have the board vote upon may not be in order. First of all, it doesn't have anything to do with the personnel actions that are before the body tonight. Second, the process, process wise, you, the board needs to become familiar with the entire governance process with respect to dismissals before that need before that can be asked because there are certain instances where by law you cannot be involved with the dismissal until it gets to you as that as that step of govern of, excuse me of this the dismissal grievance procedures the administration makes the recommendations for terminations in certain instances. The employee has the opportunity to grieve that and the board doesn't get involved in that until the very end in some, in, in some instances. And so right. what I'm saying is, this why I think you need to finish the motion on the floor. The, yeah. The, 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 right, I understand that part. So we'll take it up in governance. I'll put right. it down when we go to governance. Yeah. This, I'll just, I'll just put June. that down on governance. Yeah, in June, whenever yes. we do it. And we can yeah, talk it was. I need to send that, know that. Yes, thank you so much. about that as well, Ms. White. Okay. okay. About that. Thank you, Ms. White. Mm -hmm. All right, so we are ready to move forward on the motion made by Dr. Harris Muhammad, seconded by Ms. Page to accept the personnel actions as listed. Are we ready to vote? Ms. Lilly. Ms. Dorr. Yes. Ms. White? Yes. Ms. Gibson? Abstain. Ms. Young? Excuse me, Mr. Young? Aye. Ms. Rizzi? Yes. Dr. Harris Muhammad? Yes. Ms. Burt? Yes. Ms. Page? Yes. Ms. Jones? Yes. Motion passes 8-0. All right, thank you so very much. Next item on the um, agenda is 5.04, board travel and district activity requests. I don't think we have any for this evening. Do we, Ms. Lilly? I did not receive any. No, right, thank you so much. Let's move to the next one. Um, we did that 6.01, we've already done that one, the reopening plan. So now we're down to 6.02, receive an update on the SY 2021-22 reopening dashboard. Mr. Cameras. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, given the late hour, I'm, I'm not gonna do a whole presentation. I just really wanted to um, open it up to any questions or feedback. Um, this is certainly draft one and we'll continue to iterate as we move uh, through the next several months as we March towards uh, September 7th now. Um, and so, yeah, I would uh, just open it up to any uh, questions or feedback. Thank you. Thank you so much. I need to pull it back up. Mr. Young, do we have anyone with any questions at this time regarding the dashboard? Ms. White. Ms. White, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you, Madam President. Mr. Cameras, I just have one question. Based on the dashboard, everything that has not been started or completed, it will be finalized by September the 7th, correct? Yes, That's all I have to ask. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. White. Anyone else? Mr. Young, anyone else? No, ma'am. Thank you so very much. And as Mr. Cameron stated, this is a living document, so we will continue to work with that. We have rescheduled 6.03. We will now move to six, excuse me, number seven, budgetary items. Receive the financial statement ending February 28, 2021. Is that Mrs. Hedasco? Uh, yes, I'm happy to take questions from uh, 
anyone if they have them or uh, feel free to email me and, and we'll get answers back to you, but we remain on track financially. If there are no questions at this time, we ask that you do send um, your questions to Ms. Hidasco to answer. Thank you so much. The next item is um, consent agenda. We don't have anything there. Board governance, you know we moved that on. Um, excuse me, not board governance, Head Start governance training. Number nine, consent agenda. There's not anything there. Number 10, um, the MOU received and the report is listed there, Mr. Cameras. And, and I would like to thank so many of you all were able to get on that call. Thank you so very much. I really appreciate that. Those of you that were able, I know your busy work schedules and whatever else, but thank you so much for um, being a part of that meeting. And as you know, we will have another one in the future, but thank you so much for being a part of that, that um, MOU meeting with the BDO, with the um, su superintendent, state superintendent. Mr. Cameras, anything particular to point out? No, I'm good, Madam Chair. All right, if there are any other questions regarding that, please you feel free to um, email him as we move forward. Him as in Mr. Cameras, if you have any other questions or follow up. And subject line item 10.02, joint construction team. That report was, was, if you have any questions regarding that, we're moving along slowly but surely. Mr. Young and myself attend the meetings with Mr. Cameras and Mr. Dasco. No, Mr. Dasco, you're not on that one, okay. With Bobby Hathaway, right, right. And um, with the city um, contractors and all, and we're, we're looking pretty good at our new schools. Henry L. Monster III, River City, and Cardinal Element Elementary. Okay, we're now ready to move on to 10.03. Board members attending committee meetings and conferences. There were no reports attached at this time. And I know some of us have had a chance to attend some great workshops and um, we can send those in, in and it'll just be attached to the agenda to read. Is there any new business? Number 11, new business. Number 12, are there any announce, oops, excuse me, new business announcements? Um, Dr. Harris Muhammad? Yes, ma'am, thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanna take this opportunity to thank the staff and administration of Overby Shepherd and Bellevue. I participated in their READ um, program about a week ago and I really enjoyed it. It was wonderful. Um, I enjoyed the kids. I, and so I just want to publicly thank both schools. I, I'm forgetting the name. So please uh, I, I accept my apology to the administration and the teachers and the teacher assistant. But thank you all so very much for allowing me to be a part of your class and read to your class. Um, I read the book, I Am Enough, that was recommended by the principal at Old Grove Bell Mead, and I love that book. Um, and so I just wanted to say thank you so very much. I really appreciate it, I enjoyed it. And anytime you all would like for me to come and participate in an activity or reading or just be a little goofy with the kids, you can always email me or call me, I would love to do it. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Dr. Harris Muhammad. Mr. Young, is there anyone else? Ms. Rizzi and Ms. Page. Ms. Rizzi? Yes, Dr. Harris Mohammed reminded me that I actually also participated in the read program at Swansboro Elementary. I read Rainbow Fish to a wonderful group of kindergartners and it was so much fun. Um, they were engaging, they asked so many good questions. And I just wanna thank um, uh, Ms. Jones, who is the resource assistant, the library person there um, for inviting me and um, I'd love to do it again. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Ms. Page. Yes, I too participated in the reading program at MLK Pre-K Center. And it was just, it was awesome. Um, it was funny because I read the book, The Ducklings, and, and the teacher had to tell me, 
this page hold up your book because we can't see you but anyway um it was really fun and to see the little dollars man it just warmed my heart and so i just want to say thank you and also i would like to give a big shout out to our eighth and ninth district families and staff and principals that attended our community conversation on last Thursday, which was moderated. Hey, Ms. Berg, sorry, I, I think you guys can come back in. Okay, okay, there you are. What Was this Ali? Yeah, I'm sorry, I was under the weather. So I, I took some medicine Ali. and passed out. Oh my goodness, okay. We're on. Thank you. Okie dokie. You can't Let's see what we got here. Excellent. Thank you all so much. Woo! -hoo! My picture won't come in. Wait a minute. It's I'm the Guess host. Somebody. All right. Huh? We can hear you. We can hear you though. Okay, that's okay. fine. Wait a minute. Hold it. Hold it. Hold it. What? I do. You, did you hit your video? As long as Mariah, are you still there? There you go. Thank you all for your patience. But I thought I saw a different name, but it is Ali. I always write down the name and number. Tonight, I did not. Lesson to be learned for the future. Jonathan, we've got this for the future. I always write down the name and number. So are we ready to resume? Janelle, is she on? She was trying to figure out something as well. Let me let her know we're on. Ms. Berg, you guys have to go back uh, live, right? I'm assuming. Yes, please. We must close out. That sounds good. Thank you, Ali. I need to get your number. Jason, you have it? I bet you we got it now, don't we? <laughs> I have her in the morning on me. Thank you all so much. Nicole, you awake, darling? <laughs> Broccoli. <laughs> I'm dead at o'clock. I'm struggling. I have a full day tomorrow. Full mm. day. Full day. Rich and Public Schools Day. Which we all have something, but I, we covered a lot tonight. So are we all on there? There's John L. Okie dokie. I don't see Mrs. P oh, there's Ms. Pay. I don't see Ms. Gibson. Ms. Gibson, are you there? I don't see Ms. Pay. I just sent her a, I just sent her okay. a text. We've got four of them, right? And then, then we, we do have a to, Yes, and then we need to be back on live, please. Yes, he said he was going to connect us. Okay. Thank you, John L, for trying. Yeah, I was trying to rig up my password. I, I was Thank trying you. to find something. <laughs> well, find it for the future. We never know when this might happen yeah, again. Yeah, I'm going to see what, how, how I can work it from there. But it was it, it is Ali. I thought I saw a different name there. Maybe I saw his whole name written out and didn't recognize it. I don't know. So are we on, um, Ali? Yeah, I'm just setting up. It was Jeff earlier, Ms. Berg. I just came that's back. That's what in. I thought. Jeff, that's what his name was. Okay, dokie. Why did Jeff leave? I will, we'll get take, I, I will take care of that, Mrs. Berg. Oh, okay, okay. I'm sorry. I'm getting into the weeds. Forgive me. Thank um, you. To the weeds. Jeff might have went to bed. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, for real, Jeff might have went to bed. So, I, mean, I don't blame him. <laughs> I'm trying to help Jeff out. I'm trying to help Jeff. I don't leave Jeff alone. Jeff said everybody Jeff locked alone. off. I'm gone. Yeah. See, Jeff, Jeff said it ain't my problem. Yeah, I still up here at two o'clock in the morning. <laughs> good, for, good for Jeff. Right. <laughs> oh my God. Y'all uh -uh. uh, right, silly. <laughs> We're getting into the weeds. Um, We're getting into the weeds. It's Ms. Tuesday. I'm going to try it real quick. I think because we passed uh, the date, I'll just have to reset it. But I'm gonna oh, try yeah. It. Please do. Oh. We're going to do a little test run real quick in uh, five, four, three. 
All right, thank you so very much. We're now are in the, no, not yet. Oh, I thought he said five, four, three. Yeah, we have to wait till we see the. Uh, oh yeah, Miss Burke. I'm, at the yeah, top. I'm gonna have oh, to why, okay. on Facebook. So give me two seconds. Or two Ali, minutes. don't let's wait until we actually see the the live. Yep, gotcha. I think I have to re-enter the stream keys and everything. So give me one second. I think I my favorite. I can favorite, take a little nap too. I'll come back. My favorite part of these Zoom meetings is when Cheryl has to practice her "All right, we're live" <laughs> speech <laughs> three or four times in a row. <laughs> How many times? How many times? And you like you like put your feet, you smile a lot, and you stand up straight, and then we're not live. <laughs> you had me there, pet. <laughs> That's the way the little girl was at Woodville. I was like, whoa, I don't know what her teacher did to prepare her, but it was like her finger and all of it. She was so, so sweet. She was so sweet. She was so sweet. So you never know how people see how children see you. Okay, um, do do do. Look, guys, it's 1233. Mm. And Miss Rizzy's eyes are a little just blinking. Are you ready? I so am I. So am I. <laughs> I am trying not to doze off. Oh my god. <laughs> Can you? We're just waiting for Ali to he has to reprogram everything. Okay. So we we um there was another person on in between. And usually I was telling Jonathan, I usually write the numbers and names down and I didn't this time. So I bet we all will for the next time. Mm. Looking at the chat. And Ali, thank you so much because he's not feeling well. So thank you, Ali. Mm. So what's, okay. Oh, Lord. <laughs> Do you think that many people up still waiting to see where we're going to, how we're going to close out? Of course. <laughs> Okie dokie. John, can I talk about anything right now or we have to stick to it? Can I? Yeah, let's just stick to okay. just waiting to for the live. Okay. It's being this is being recorded, so okay. Let's just stick to waiting. Okay. Just had a suggestion that was offered, but I will keep it to myself till the appropriate time. Oh, look at Liz just laughing. <laughs> That's the night it's snowing. <laughs> what was that? All right, I put every uh, thing back in. I think we should be good. Um, see the live sign, and then I'll manually uh, go live on Facebook. Five, four. We're live. Madam Chair, good, e good. good evening. We are now ready to continue our meeting. Mr. Young, you have the motion. I move that the school board direct its clerk to call for a roll call vote of the board members that to each member's knowledge. One, only public business matters lawfully exempted from open meeting requirements by Virginia law were discussed in the closed meeting to which the certification resolution applies. And two, only such public business matters as were identified in the motion convening the closed session were heard, discussed, or considered by this committee of the Virginia School Board. Second. It's been moved and properly second. Moved by Mr. Young, seconded by Ms. Doerr, that we continue with this meeting and reopen as scheduled. We're now ready for the vote. Ms. Attorney Clerk. Ms. Doerr. Yes. Ms. White. Yes. Ms. Gibson. Yes. Mr. Young. Aye. Ms. Rizzi. Yes. Dr. Harris Muhammad. Yes. Ms. Burke. Yes. Ms. Page. Yes. Ms. Jones. Yes. Um, uh, motion passes, ma'am. Thank you, Ms. Lilly. And thank you again for all that you're doing to help us. You're welcome. All right, John. We're ready for the motion regarding um, our closed session. Dr. Harris Muhammad. 
<clears throat> Thank you. I move that we accept the superintendent's recommendation in employee matter 192005. Second. The move by Dr. Harris Muhammad and seconded by Ms. Page to receive the superintendent's recommendation as listed. Are we ready to vote? Any discussion? Ms. Lilly, we're ready to move forward. Ms. Doerr? Yes. Ms. White? Yes. Ms. Gibson? Yes. Mr. Young? Aye. Ms. Rizzi? Yes. Dr. Harris Muhammad? Yes. Ms. Burke? Yes. Ms. Page? Yes. Ms. Ms. Jones? Yes. Motion passes 9-0. Be there no further business. This meeting is now adjourned. Going